The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, Preface and Dramatis Personae. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae. Narrated by Bob Neufeld. Christian, read by Beth Thomas. Hopeful, read by Levi Throckmorton. Faithful, honest, read by Glorious Job. Talkative, read by Chuck Williamson. Ignorance, the King, read by Ron Altman. The Shining One, read by Marianne Bodorf. Feeble Mind, Porter, read by Tricia G. Piety, Man, read by Kimberly Krauss. Charity, read by Ali Christie. Prudence, Mrs. Inconsiderate, read by Bria Snow. Evangelist, Great Heart, Mr. Sagacity, read by Ben Lindsay Clark. Interpreter, Mr. Holy Man, read by Todd Jenkin. Shepherds, Byens, Sloth, Obstinate, Read by Alan Mapstone. Pliable. Vain confidence. Samuel. Mr. Manason. Read by E. Snow. Mr. Worldly Wiseman. Atheist. Maul. Ill-favoured one. Giant despair. Mr. Standfast. Apollyon. Read by Algy Pug. Help. Gardener. Flatterer. Mr. Savall. Envy. First Juryman, Grim, Men, Hypocrisy, Goodwill, Mr. Despondency, Heedless, Mr. Dare Not Lie, Shepherd, Mrs. Know Nothing, Mr. Skill, read by Christine G. Warrior, Reliever, Mr. Moneylove, Storekeeper, and Juryman Thor, Timorous, Too Bold, Contrite, read by Mary J. Man to Demas, Picksank, Pope, Presumption, Juryman 3, read by K. Hand. George, Simple, Mrs. Lightmind, by Trata. Formalist, Innocent, Messenger, Matthew, read by Piper Reed. Mistrust, Secret, read by Fiddlesticks. Superstition, Discretion, played by Esteban Simonides. Mr. Hold the World, read by Dave Harrell. Diffidence, read by Levina Martin. Christiana, read by Amanda Friday. Mercy, read by Wooly B. James, read by Francis Brown. Mr. Great to Hope, Joseph, read by Gideon Snow. Gaius, read by Vanessa Cooley. Mr. Penitent. Read by Betsy Cooley. Lovesick. Mrs. Timorous. Read by Lydia. Miss Bet's Eyes by Etta Bus. Mr. Brisk. Read by Ivory Ballard. Slaygood the Giant. Read by Rosalind Carlyle. Valiant for Truth. Read by Shakira Searle. Preface. It may seem a very bold undertaking to change even a word of the book which, next to the Bible, has been read by more people, old and young, than any other book in the English language. But it must be remembered that, although The Pilgrim's Progress has come to be a children's book, and is read more often by young people than by those who are older, it was not in the purpose of John Bunyan to write a book for children, or even for the young. The Pilgrim's Progress was a book for men and women, and it was aimed to teach the great truths of the gospel. Hence, while most of it is written in a simple style, as all books should be written, it contains much that a child cannot understand, not often in the story, but in the conversations and discussions between the different persons. Some of these conversations are in reality short sermons on doctrines and teachings which Bunyan believed to be of great importance. But these are beyond the minds of children, and give them great trouble when the book is read. 
They do not like to have them left out of the reading, thinking that they may lose something interesting. Many a young person has stumbled through the dull doctrinal parts of the book without understanding them, and even grown people find them in our time somewhat of a blemish upon the wonderful story, valuable as they were supposed to be in Bunyan's own time. For many years it has been in my mind not to rewrite The Pilgrim's Progress, for that would destroy its greatest charm, but to change the words here and there to simpler ones, and to omit all the conversations and arguments concerning subjects belonging to the field of doctrine. In other words, to place the story of the Pilgrim's Progress in such a form that every child ten years old can understand it. My purpose is to make it plain and interesting to children, leaving the older form of the book to be read by them when they become older. Perhaps a short account of Bunyan's own life may add to the interest of his book. John Bunyan was born in 1628 at Elstow, a small village near Bedford, which is in the heart of England. His father was a poor man, traveling on foot from place to place, mending pots and pans and the simple furniture of country kitchens, and the son followed the same trade, and was known as a tinker. He tells us that he lived a wild life, and was especially known as one of the worst swearers in the region. When the great civil war broke out in England in 1642 between King Charles I and the Parliament, Bunyan became a soldier on the side of the Commonwealth, as the party against the king was called. He served in the army between 1644 and 1646. In 1648, at the age of twenty years, he married a good young woman, who led him to prayer and to a new life. But it was hard for one who had led such a life as his had been to turn to God, and it cost the young man a great struggle. It seemed to him that his past sins were like a load upon his back, just as he afterward wrote of his pilgrim, and it was long before he found peace. He became a member of a little Baptist society, and soon began to preach. Crowds came to hear him, drawn by his earnest spirit and his quaint striking manner. But when Charles the Second became king, no religious services were allowed except those of the Church of England, and all other meetings were forbidden. Bunyan, however, went on preaching, until he was sent to prison in Bedford. In Bedford jail he stayed twelve years. To find a means of living in jail he made lace, and sold it as a support for himself and his blind daughter. If the prison was hard for Bunyan, his sufferings were made a blessing to untold millions, for while in Bedford jail he wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. This story was intended to be a parable, like many of our Saviour's teachings. That is, it put into the form of a story the life of one who turns from sin, finds salvation through Christ, and in the face of many difficulties, makes his way through this world to heaven. Even a child who reads or listens to the book will see this meaning in part, and he will understand it better as he grows older. In 1672 Bunyan was set free, and allowed to begin again his work as a Baptist minister, and he soon became one of the most popular preachers in all England. He died quite suddenly in 1688, when he was sixty years old, and is buried in an old graveyard now near the centre of London called Bunhill Fields Burial Ground. In the same ground is buried another great writer, Daniel Defoe, whose story of Robinson Crusoe ranks next to Pilgrim's Progress in the number of its readers. Also Isaac Watts, the author of many hymns sung in all the churches, and Mrs. Susanna Wesley, the mother of the great John Wesley. Four people who left a deep mark upon the world all lie near together in this small cemetery in London. Every child should read The Pilgrim's Progress as a story, if no more than a story, should read it until he knows it by heart, and the older he grows, the deeper will be the meaning that he will see in it. Jesse Lyman Hurlbut, Editor End of Preface and Dramatis Personae The Pilgrim's Progress, Part 1, Chapter 1 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan Part 1 Chapter 1 
As I walked through the wilderness of this world, I lighted on a certain place where was a den, and laid me down in that place to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed, and behold, I saw a man clothed with rags standing in a certain place, with his face from his own house, a book in his hand, and a great burden upon his back. I looked, and saw him open the book and read therein, and as he read, he wept and trembled, and not being able longer to contain, he brake out with a lamentable cry, saying, What shall I do? In this plight, therefore, he went home, and restrained himself as long as he could, that his wife and children should not perceive his distress. But he could not be silent long, because that his trouble increased. Wherefore, at length, he brake his mind to his wife and children, and thus he began to talk to them. O oh, my dear wife, said he, and you, my sweet children, I, your dear friend, am in myself undone by reason of a burden that lieth hard upon me. Moreover, I am told to a certainty that this our city will be burned with fire from heaven, in which fearful overthrow both myself, with thee, my wife, and you, my sweet babes, shall miserably come to ruin, except some way of escape can be found whereby we may be delivered. At this all his family were sore amazed, not for that they believed that what he had said to them was true, but because they thought some frenzy or madness had got into his head. Therefore, it drawing towards night, and they hoping that sleep might settle his brain, with all haste they got him to bed. But the night was as troublesome to him as the day, wherefore, instead of sleeping, he spent it in sighs and tears. So when the morning was come, they would know how he did. He told them, worse and worse. He also set to talking to them again, but they began to be hardened. They also thought to drive away his madness by harsh and surly treatment of him. Sometimes they would ridicule, sometimes they would chide, and sometimes they would quite neglect him. Wherefore he began to retire himself to his chamber, to pray for and pity them, and also to sorrow over his own misery. He would also walk solitary in the fields, sometimes reading and sometimes praying, and thus for some days he spent his time. Now I saw upon a time, when he was walking in the fields, that he was, as he was wont, reading in his book, and greatly distressed in his mind, and as he read, he burst out as he had done before, crying, What shall I do to be saved? I saw also that he looked this way and that way, as if he would run. Yet he stood still, because, as I perceived, he could not tell which way to go. I looked then, and saw a man named Evangelist coming to him, who asked, Wherefore dost thou cry? He answered, Sir, I read in the book in my hand that I am condemned to die, and after that to come to judgment, and I find that I am not willing to do the first, nor able to do the second. Then said Evangelist, Why not willing to die, since this life is troubled with so many evils? The man answered, Because I fear that this burden that is upon my back will sink me lower than the grave, and I shall fall into Tophet. And, sir, so, if I be not fit to go to prison, I am not fit to go to judgment, and from thence to death, and the thoughts of these things make me cry. Then said the Evangelist, If this be thy condition, why standest thou still? He answered, Because I know not whither to go. Then he gave him a parchment roll, and there was written within, Flee from the wrath to come. The man, therefore, read it, and looking upon Evangelist very carefully, said, Whither must I fly? Then said Evangelist, pointing with his finger over a very wide field, Do you see yonder wicked gate? The man said, No. Then said the other, Do you see yonder shining light? He said, I think I do. Then said Evangelist, Keep that light in your eye, and go up directly thereto, so shalt thou see the gate, at which, when thou knockest, it shall be told thee what thou shalt do. 
So I saw in my dream that the man began to run. Now he had not run far from his own door when his wife and children, perceiving it, began to cry after him to return. But the man put his fingers in his ears and ran on, crying, Life, life, eternal life. So he looked not behind him, but fled towards the middle of the plain. The neighbors also came out to see him run, and as he ran, some mocked, others threatened, and some cried after him to return. And among those that did so, there were two that resolved to fetch him back by force. The name of one was Obstinate, and the name of the other Pliable. Now by this time the man was got a good distance from them, but, however, they were resolved to pursue him, which they did, and in a little time they overtook him. Then said the man, Neighbors, wherefore are ye come? They said, To persuade you to go back with us. But he said, That can by no means be. You dwell, said he, in the city of destruction, the place also where I was born. I see it to be so. And dying there sooner or later, you will sink lower than the grave, into a place that burns with fire and brimstone. Be content, good neighbours, and go along with me. What? said Obstinate. And leave our friends and comforts behind us? Yes, said Christian, for that was his name. Because that all which you forsake is not worthy to be compared with a little of that I am seeking to enjoy. And if you would go along with me and hold it, you shall fare as I myself, for there where I go there is enough and to spare. Come away and prove my words. What are these things you seek, since you leave all the world to find them? I seek a place that can never be destroyed, one that is pure and that fadeth not away, and it is laid up in heaven and safe there to be given at the time appointed to them that seek it with all their heart. Read it so, if you will, in my book. <laughs> said Obstinate. Away with your book. Will you go back with us or no? No, not I, said the other, because I have put my hand to the plough. Come then, neighbour Pliable, let us turn again and go home without him. There is a company of these crazy-headed fools that, when they take a fancy by the end, are wiser in their own eyes than seven men that can render a reason. Then said Pliable, Don't revile. If what the good Christian says is true, the things he looks after are better than ours. My heart inclines to go with my neighbour. What? More fools still? Be ruled by me, and go back. Who knows whither such a brain-sick fellow will lead you? Go back, go back, and be wise. Nay, but do thou come with thy neighbour pliable. There are such things to be had which I spoke of, and many more glories besides. If you believe not me, read here in this book, and for the truth of what is told therein, behold, all is made by the blood of him that made it. Well, neighbour obstinate, said pliable, I begin to come to a point. I intend to go along with this good man, and to cast in my lot with him, but my good companion. Do you know the way to this desired place? I am directed by a man whose name is Evangelist to speed me to a little gate that is before us, where we shall receive directions about the way. Come then, good neighbour, let us be going. Then they went both together. And I will go back to my place, said Obstinate. I will be no companion to such misled, fantastical fellows. Now I saw in my dream that when Obstinate was gone back, Christian and Pliable were talking over the plain, and thus they began. Come, neighbour Pliable, how do you do? I am glad you are persuaded to go along with me. Had even Obstinate himself but felt what I have felt of the powers and terrors of what is yet unseen, he would not thus lightly have given us the back. Come, neighbour Christian, since there are none but us to hear, tell me now further what the things are and how to be enjoyed with we are going. I can better understand them with my mind than speak of them with my tongue, but yet, since you are desirous to know, I will read of them in my book. And do you think the words of your book are certainly true? Yes, verily, for it was made by him that cannot lie. Well said. What things are they? There is an endless kingdom to be enjoyed, and everlasting life to be given us, that we may live in that kingdom for ever. Well said. And what else? There are crowns of glory to be given us, and garments that will make us shine like the sun in the sky. This is very pleasant. And what else? 
There shall be no more crying nor sorrow, for he that is owner of the place will wipe all tears from our eyes. What company shall we have there? There we shall be with seraphims and cherubims, creatures that shall dazzle your eyes to look on them. There also you shall meet with thousands and ten thousands that have gone before us to that place. None of them are hurtful, but all loving and holy, every one walking in the sight of God, and standing in his presence with acceptance for ever. In a word, there we shall see the elders with their golden crowns. There we shall see the holy women with their golden harps. There we shall see men that by the world were cut into pieces, burnt in flames, eaten of beasts, drowned in the seas, for the love they bear to the Lord of the place, all well, and clothed with everlasting life as with a garment. The hearing of this is enough to delight one's heart. Are these things to be enjoyed? How shall we get to be sharers thereof? The Lord, the governor of the country, hath written that in this book, the substance of which is, if we be truly willing to have it, he will bestow it upon us freely. Well, my good companion, glad am I to hear of these things. Come on, let us mend our pace. I cannot go so fast as I would by reason of this burden that is on my back. Now I saw in my dream that just as they had ended this talk, they drew nigh to a very miry slough or swamp that was in the midst of the plain, and they being heedless, did both fall suddenly into the bog. The name of the slough was Despond. Here, therefore, they wallowed for a time, being grievously bedaubed with dirt, and Christian, because of the burden that was on his back, began to sink into the mire. Then said Pliable, Ah, never Christian, where are you now? Truly, said Christian, I do not know. At this Pliable began to be offended, and angrily said to his fellow, Is this the happiness you have told me all this while of? If we have such ill speed at our first setting out, what may we expect between this and our journey's end? May I get out again with my life? You shall possess the brave country alone for me. And with that he gave a desperate struggle or two, and got out of the mire on that side of the swamp, which was next to his own house. So away he went, and Christian saw him no more. Wherefore Christian was left to tumble in the slough of despond alone. But still he tried to struggle to that side of the slough which was farthest from his own house, and next to the wicket gate, the which he did, but could not get out because of the burden that was upon his back. But I beheld in my dream that a man came to him whose name was Help, and asked him what he did there. Sir, said Christian, I was bid to go this way by a man called Evangelist, who directed me also to yonder gate, that I might escape the wrath to come. And as I was going there, I fell in here. But why did you not look for the steps? Fear followed me so hard that I fled the next way and fell in. Then said he, Give me thine hand. So he gave him his hand, and he drew him out, and set him upon solid ground, and bade him go on his way. Then I stepped to him that plucked him out, and said, Sir, wherefore, since over this place is the way from the city of destruction to yonder gate, is it that this place is not mended, that poor travellers might go thither with more safety? And he said unto me, This miry slough is such a place as cannot be mended. It is the hollow wither, the scum and filth that go with the feeling of sin, do continually run, and therefore it is called the slough of despond. For still, as the sinner is awakened by his lost condition, there arise in his soul many fears and doubts and discouraging alarms, which all of them get together and settle in this place. And this is the reason of the badness of the ground. It is not the pleasure of the king that this place should remain so bad. His laborers also have, by the direction of his majesty's surveyors, been for about these sixteen hundred years employed about this patch of ground, if perhaps it might have been mended. Yea, and to my knowledge, said he, here have been swallowed up at least twenty thousand cartloads, yea, millions of wholesome teachings, that have at all seasons been brought from all places of the king's dominions. And they that can tell, say they are the best materials to make good ground of the place. If so be it, might have been mended, but it is the slough of despond still, and so will be, when they have done what they can. 
true there are, by the direction of the lawgiver, certain good and substantial steps, placed even through the very midst of this slough. But at such time as this place doth much spew out its filth, as it doth against change of weather, these steps are hardly seen, or, if there be, men, through the dizziness of their heads, step aside, and then they are bemired to purpose, notwithstanding the steps be there. But the ground is good when they are got in at the gate. Now I saw in my dream that by this time Pliable was got home to his house. So his neighbors came to visit him, and some of them called him wise man for coming back, and some called him a fool for risking himself with Christian. Others again did mock at his cowardliness, saying, Surely, since you began to venture, I would not have been so base as to have given out for a few difficulties. So Pliable sat sneaking among them, but at last he got more confidence, and then they all turned their tails and began to abuse poor Christian behind his back. And thus much concerning Pliable. Now, as Christian was walking solitary by himself, he espied one afar off come crossing over the field to meet him, and their hap was to meet just as they were crossing the way of each other. The gentleman's name that met him was Mr. Worldly Wiseman. He dwelt in the town of Carnal Policy, a very great town, and also hard by from whence Christian came. This man, then, meeting with Christian, and having heard about him, for Christian's setting forth from the city of destruction was much noised abroad, not only in the town where he dwelt, but also it began to be the town talk in some other places. Mr. Worldly Wiseman, therefore, having some guess of him, by beholding his laborious going, by noticing his sighs and groans and the like, began thus to enter into some talk with Christian. How now, good fellow, whither away after this burdened manner? A burdened manner, indeed, as ever I think poor creature had, and whereas you ask me whither away, I tell you, sir, I am going to yonder wicked gate before me, for there, as I am informed, I shall be put into a way to be rid of my heavy burden. Hast thou a wife and a children? Yes, but I am so laden with this burden that I cannot take that pleasure in them as formerly, methinks I am as if I had none. Wilt thou hearken to me, if I give thee counsel? If it be good, I will, for I stand in need of good counsel. I would advise thee, then, that thou, with all speed, get thyself rid of thy burden. For thou wilt never be settled in thy mind till then, nor canst thou enjoy the blessing which God hath bestowed upon thee till then. That is that which I seek for, even to be rid of this heavy burden, but get it off myself I cannot, nor is there any man in our country that can take it off my shoulders. Therefore am I going this way, as I told you, that I may be rid of my burden. Who bid thee go this way to be rid of thy burden? A man that appeared to me to be a very great and honourable person, his name, as I remember, is Evangelist. I curse him for his counsel. There is not a more dangerous and troublesome way in the world than is that into which he hath directed thee, and that thou shalt find if thou wilt be ruled by his advice. Thou hast met with something, as I perceive, already, but I see the dirt of the slough of despond is upon thee. But that slough is the beginning of the sorrows that do attend those that go on in that way. Hear me, I am older than thou. Thou art like to meet with, in the way that thou goest, wearisomeness, painfulness, hunger, perils, nakedness, sword, lions, dragons, darkness, and, in a word, death, uh, and what not. These things are certainly true, having been proved by the words of many people. And why should a man so carelessly cast away himself, by giving heed to a stranger? Why, sir, this burden upon my back is more terrible to me than all these things which you have mentioned. Nay, methinks I care not what I meet with in the way, if so be I can also meet with deliverance from my burden. How camest thou by the burden at first? by reading this book in my hand. 
I thought so. And it has happened unto thee, as to unto other weak men, who, meddling with things too high for them, do suddenly fall into thy crazy thoughts, which thoughts do not only unman men, as thine, I perceive, have done thee, but they run them upon desperate efforts to obtain they know not what. I know what I would obtain. It is ease for my heavy burden. But why wilt thou seek for ease this way, seeing so many dangers attend it? Especially since, hadst thou but patience to hear me, I could direct thee to the getting of what thou desirest, without the dangers that thou in this way wilt run thyself into. Yea, and the remedy is at hand. Besides, I will add that, instead of those dangers, thou shalt meet with much safety, friendship, and content. Sir, I pray, open this secret to me. Why, in yonder village, the village is named Morality, there dwells a gentleman whose name is Legality, a very wise man, and a man of a very good name, that has skill to help men off with such burdens as thine is from their shoulders. Yea, to my knowledge, he hath done a great deal of good this way. Aye, and besides, he hath skill to cure those that are somewhat crazed in their wits with their burdens. To him, as I said, thou mayest go, and be helped presently. His house is not quite a mile from this place. And if he should not be at home himself, he hath a pretty young man as his son, whose name is Civility, that can do it, to speak on, as well as the old gentleman himself. There, I say, thou mayest be eased of thy burden, and if thou art not minded to go back to thy former habitation, as indeed I would not wish thee, thou mayest send for thy wife and children to thee in this village where there are houses now standing empty, one of which thou mayest have at a reasonable rate. Provision is there also cheap and good, and that which will make thy life the more happy is, to be sure, there thou shalt live by honest neighbours, in credit and good fashion. Now was Christian somewhat at a stand, but presently he concluded, if this be true which this gentleman hath said, my wisest course is to take his advice. And with that he thus further spake. Sir, which is my way to this honest man's house? Do you see yonder high hill? Yes, very well. By that hill you must go, and the first house you come at is his. So Christian turned out of his way to go to Mr. Legality's house for help. But behold, when he was got now hard by the hill, it seemed so high, and also that side of it that was next to the wayside did hang so much over, that Christian was afraid to venture farther, lest the hill should fall on his head. Wherefore there he stood still, and knew not what to do. Also his burden now seemed heavier to him than while he was in his way. There came also flashes of fire out of the hill, that made Christian afraid that he should be burnt. Here, therefore, he sweat, and did quake for fear. And now he began to be sorry that he had taken Mr. Worldly Wiseman's counsel. And with that he saw Evangelist coming to meet him, at the sight also of whom he began to blush for shame. So Evangelist drew nearer and nearer, and coming up to him, he looked upon him with a severe and dreadful countenance, and thus began to reason with Christian. What dost thou hear, Christian? said he, at which words Christian knew not what to answer, wherefore at present he stood speechless before him. Then said Evangelist further, Art thou not the man that I found crying without the walls of the city of destruction? Yes, dear sir, I am the man. Did not I direct thee the way to the little wicked gate? Yes, dear sir, said Christian. How is it then that thou art so quickly turned aside, for thou art now out of the way? 
I met with a gentleman as soon as I had got over the slough of despond, who persuaded me that I might, in the village before me, find a man that could take off my burden. What was he? He looked like a gentleman, and he talked much to me, and got me at last to yield. So I came hither, but when I beheld this hill and how it hangs over the way, I suddenly made a stand, lest it should fall on my head. What said that gentleman to you? Why, he asked me whither I was going, and I told him. And what said he then? He asked me if I had a family, and I told him. But, said I, I am so laden with the burden that is on my back, that I cannot take pleasure in them as formerly. And what said he then? He bid me with speed get rid of my burden, and I told him it was ease that I sought. And, said I, I am therefore going to yonder gate to receive further direction how I may get to the place of deliverance. So he said that he would show me a better way and short, not so hard as the way said that you sent me in, which way, said he, will direct you to a gentleman's house that hath skill to take off these burdens. So I believed him, and turned out of that way into this, if haply I might soon be eased of my burden. But when I came to this place, and beheld things as they are, I stopped for fear, as I said, of danger. But I know now not what to do. Then the said evangelist, Stand still a little, that I may show thee the words of God. So he stood trembling. Then said the evangelist, God says in his book, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. He said moreover, now the righteous man shall live by faith in God. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. He also did thus apply them. Thou art the man that art running into misery. Thou hast begun to reject the counsel of the Most High, and to draw back thy foot from the way of peace, even almost to the danger of thy everlasting ruin. Then the Christian fell down at his feet as dead, crying, Woe is me, for I am undone! At the sight of which Evangelist caught him by the right hand, saying, All manner of sin and evil words shall be forgiven unto man. Be not faithless, but believe in. Then did Christian again a little revive, and stood up trembling, as at first before Evangelist. Then Evangelist proceeded, saying, Give more earnest heed to the things that I shall tell thee of. I will now show thee who it was that led thee astray, and who it was also to whom he sent thee. That man that met thee is one worldly wise man, and rightly he is so called, partly because he seeks only for the things of this world. Therefore he always goes to the town of morality, to church." and partly because he loveth that way best, for it saveth him from the cross, and because he is of this evil temper, therefore he seeketh to turn you from my way, though it is the right way. He to whom thou wast sent for ease, being by name legality, is not able to set thee free from thy burden. No man was as yet ever rid of his burden by him, no, nor ever is like to be. Ye cannot be set right by any such plan. Therefore, Mr. Wordly Wise Man is an enemy, and Mr. Legality is a cheat. And for his son's civility, notwithstanding his simpering looks, he is but a fraud and cannot help thee. Believe me, there is nothing in all this noise that thou hast heard of these wicked men, but a design to rob thee of thy salvation by turning thee from the way in which I had set thee. After this, Evangelist called aloud to the heavens for proof of what he had said, and with that there came words and fire out of the mountain under which poor Christian stood, which made the hair of his flesh stand up. The words were thus spoken, As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Now Christian looked for nothing but death, and began to cry out lamentably, even cursing the time in which he met with Mr. Worldly Wiseman, still calling himself a thousand fools for listening to his counsel.
He also was greatly ashamed to think that this gentleman's arguments should have the power with him so far as to cause him to forsake the right way. This done, he spoke again to Evangelist, in words and sense, as follows. Sir, what think you? Is there any hope? May I now go back and go up to the wicket gate? Shall I not be abandoned for this and sent back from thence ashamed? I am sorry I have hearkened to this man's counsel, but may my sins be forgiven? Then said Evangelist to him, Thy sin is very great, for by it thou hast committed two evils. Thou hast forsaken the way that is good, to tread in forbidden paths. Yet will the man at the gate receive thee, for he has good will for men only. Said he, Take heed that thou not turn aside again, lest thou perish from the way, when his anger is kindled but a little. End of Part 1, Chapter 1《The Pilgrim's Progress》Part One, Chapter Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. *The Pilgrim's Progress* by John Bunyan, Part One, Chapter Two. Then did Christian begin to go back to the right road, and Evangelist, after he had kissed him, gave him one smile and bid him Godspeed. So he went on with haste. Neither spake he to any man by the way nor, if any asked him, would he give them an answer. He went like one that was all the while treading on forbidden ground, and could by no means think himself safe, till again he was got in the way which he had left to follow Mr. Worldly Wiseman's counsel. So, after a time, Christian got up to the gate. Now, over the gate there was written, Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. He knocked, therefore, more than once or twice, saying, May I now enter here? Will he within open to sorry me, though I have been an undeserving rebel? Then shall I not fail to sing his lasting praise on high. At last there came a grave person to the gate named Goodwill, who asked who was there, and whence he came, and what he would have. Here is a poor burdened sinner. I come from the city of destruction, but I am going to Mount Zion, that I may be set free from the wrath to come. I would, therefore, sir, since I am told that by this gate is the way thither, know if you are willing to let me in. I am willing with all my heart, said he, and with that he opened the gate. So, when Christian was stepping in, the other gave him a pull. Then said Christian, What means that? The other told him, A little distance from this gate there is erected a strong castle, of which Beelzebub, the evil one is the captain. From once both he and they that are with him shoot arrows at those that come up to this gate. If haply they may die before they can enter in. Then said Christian, I rejoice and tremble. So when he was got in, the man at the gate asked him who directed him thither. Evangelist bid me come hither and knock, as I did, and he said that you, sir, would tell me what I must do. An open door is set before thee, and no man can shut it. Now I begin to reap the benefit of the trouble which I have taken. But how is it that you came alone? Because none of my neighbours saw their danger, as I saw mine. Did any of them know you were coming? Yes, my wife and children saw me at the first, and called after me to turn again. Also some of my neighbours stood crying and calling after me to return, but I put my fingers in my ears, and so came on my way. But did none of them follow you, to persuade you to go back? Yes, both obstinate and pliable. But when they saw that they could not prevail, obstinate went railing back. But pliable came with me a little way. But why did he not come through? We indeed came both together, until we came to the slough of despond, into which we also suddenly fell. And then was my neighbour pliable discouraged, and he would not venture further. Wherefore, getting out again on the side next his own house, he told me I should win the brave country alone for him. So he went on his way, and I came mine, he after obstinate and I to this gate. Then said Goodwill, Alas, poor man, is the heavenly glory of so little worth with him, that he counteth it not worth running the risk of a few difficulties to obtain it. 
Truly, said Christian, I have said the truth of Pliable, and if I should also say the truth of myself, it will appear there is not betterment twixt him and myself. Tis true he went on back to his own house, but I also turned aside to go into the way of death, being persuaded thereto by the words of one Mr. Worldly Wiseman. Oh, do they light upon you? What? He would have had you seek for ease at the hands of Mr. Legality. They are both of them a very cheat. But did you take his counsel? Yes, as far as I durst. I went to find out Mr. Legality, until I thought that the mountain that stands by his house would have fallen upon my head, wherefore there I was forced to stop. That mountain has been the death of many, and will be the death of many more. It is one who escaped being by it dashed in pieces. Why, truly, I do not know what had become of me there had not Evangelist happily met me again, as I was musing in the midst of my dumps. But it was God's mercy that he came to me again, for else I had never come hither. But now I am come, such a one as I am, more fit indeed for death by that mountain, than thus to stand talking with my Lord. But oh, what a favour this is to me, that yet I am to enter here. We make no objections against any, notwithstanding all that they have done before they come hither. They in no wise are cast out. And therefore, good Christian, come a little with me, and I will teach thee about the way thou must go. Look before thee, dost thou see this narrow way? That is the way thou must go. It was cast up by the men of old, prophets, Christ, and his apostles, and it is as straight as a rule can make it. This is the way thou must go. But said Christian. Are there no turnings nor windings by which a stranger may lose his way? Yes, there are many ways but down upon this, and they are crooked and wide. But thus thou mayst distinguish the right from the wrong, the right only being straight and narrow. Then I saw in my dream that Christian asked him further if he could not help him off with his burden that was upon his back for as yet he had not got rid thereof, nor could he by any means get it off without help. He told him, As to thy burden, be content to bear it until thou comest to the place of deliverance, for there it will fall from thy back of itself. Then Christian began to gird up his loins, and to turn again to his journey. So the other told him that as soon as he was gone some distance from the gate, he would come at the house of the interpreter, at whose door he should knock, and he would show him excellent things. Then Christian took his leave of his friend, and again bid him Godspeed. Then he went on, till he came to the house of the interpreter, where he knocked over and over. At last one came to the door and asked who was there. Sir, here is a traveller who was bid by a friend of the good man of this house to call here for his benefit. I would therefore speak with the master of the house. So he called for the master of the house, who, after a little time, came to Christian, and asked him what he would have. Sir, said Christian, I am a man that am come from the city of destruction, and am going to Mount Zion, and I was told by the man that stands at the gate at the head of this way, that if I called here, you would show me excellent things, such as would be helpful to me on my journey. Then said the interpreter, Come in. I will show thee that which will be profitable to thee. So he commanded his man to light the candle, and bid Christian follow him. So he led him into a private room, and bid his man open a door. The which, when he had done, Christian saw the picture of a very grave person hung up against the wall, and this was the fashion of it. It had eyes lifted up to heaven, the best of books in its hand, the law of truth was written upon its lips, the world was behind its back. It stood as if it pleaded with men, and a crown of gold did hang over his head. Then said Christian, What meaneth this? The man whose picture this is, is one of a thousand. He can say, in the words of the Apostle Paul, Though ye have ten thousand teachers in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have been your father through the gospel. And whereas thou seest him with his eyes lifted up to heaven, the best of books in his hand, and the law of truth writ on his lips, it is to show thee that his work is to know and unfold dark things to sinners.
even as also thou seest him stand as if he pleaded with men. And whereas thou seest the world is cast behind him, and that a crown hangs over his head, that is to show thee that, slighting and despising the things that are in the world, for the love that he hath for his master's service, he is sure in the world that comes next to have glory for his reward. Now, said the interpreter, I have shown thee this picture first, because the man whose picture this is, is the only man whom the Lord of the place, whither thou art going, hath chosen to be thy guide, in all difficult places thou mayest meet with in thy way. Wherefore take good heed to what I have shown thee, and bear well in thy mind what thou hast seen, lest in thy journey thou meet with some that pretend to lead thee right, but their way goes down to death. Then he took him by the hand, and led him into a very large parlour, that was full of dust, because never swept. The which, after he had looked at it a little while, the interpreter called for a man to sweep. Now, when he began to sweep, the dust began so abundantly to fly about, the Christian had almost therewith been choked. Then said the interpreter to a girl that stood by, Bring hither water, and sprinkle the room. The which, when she had done, it was swept and cleansed with ease. Then said Christian, What means this? The interpreter answered, This parlor is the heart of a man that was never made pure by the grace of the gospel. The dust is his sin, and the inward evils that have defiled the whole man. He that began to sweep at first is the law, but she that brought water and did sprinkle it is the gospel. Now whereas thou sawest that, as soon as the first began to sweep, the dust did fly up so about that the room could not by him be cleansed, but that thou wast almost choked therewith, this is to show thee that the law, instead of cleansing the heart by its working from sin, doth revive, put strength into, and increase it in the soul, even as it doth discover and forbid it, for it doth not give power to overcome. Again, as thou sawest the girl, sprinkle the room with water, upon which it was cleansed with ease. This is to show thee that when the gospel comes, in the sweet and gracious power thereof, to the heart, then I say, even as thou sawest the maiden lay the dust by sprinkling the floor with water, so is sin vanquished and subdued, and the soul made clean through the faith of it, and consequently fit for the King of glory to dwell in. I saw, moreover, in my dream, that the interpreter took him by the hand, and led him into a little room, where sat two little children, each one in his own chair. The name of the eldest was Passion, and the name of the other, Patience. Passion seemed to be much discontented, but Patience was very quiet. The Christian asked, What is the reason for the discontent of Passion? The interpreter answered, the governor of them would have him stay for his best things till the beginning of next year, but he will have all now. Patience is willing to wait. Then I saw that one came to Passion and brought him a bag of treasure, and poured it down at his feet, the which he took up and rejoiced therein, and withal laughed Patience to scorn. But I beheld but a while, and he had wasted all away, and had nothing left him but rags. Then said Christian to the interpreter, Explain this matter more fully to me. So he said, These two lads are pictures, passion of the men of this world, and patience of the men of that which is to come. For as here thou seest, passion will have all now, this year, that is to say in this world, so are the men of this world. They must have all their good things now. They cannot stay till the next year that is, until the next world, for their portion of good. That proverb, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, is of more weight with them than all the words of the Bible of the good of the world to come. But as thou sawest that he had quickly wasted all away, and had presently left him nothing but rags, so it will be with all such men at the end of this world. Then said Christian, now I see that patience has the best wisdom, and that upon many accounts. One, because he stays for the best things. Two, and also because he will have the glory of his when the other has nothing but rags. Nay, you may add another. This, 
The glory of the next world will never wear out, but these are suddenly gone. Therefore passion had not much reason to laugh at patience, because he had his good things at first, as patience will have to laugh at passion, because he had his best things last. For first must give place to last, because last must have his time to come, but last gives place to nothing, for there is not another to succeed. He, therefore, that hath his portion first, must needs have a time to spend it, but he that hath his portion last, must have it lastingly. Then I see it is not best to covet things that are now, but to wait for things to come. You say truth, for the things that are seen soon pass away, but the things that are not seen endure forever. Then I saw in my dream that the interpreter took Christian by the hand, and led him into a place where was a fire burning against the wall, and one standing by it, always casting much water upon it to quench it. Yet did the fire burn higher and hotter. Then said Christian, What means this? The interpreter answered, This fire is the work of God that is wrought in the heart. He that casts water upon it to extinguish and put it out is the devil. But in that thou seest the fire notwithstanding burn higher and hotter, thou shalt also see the reason of that. So then he led him about to the other side of the wall, for he saw a man with a vessel of oil in his hand, of the which he did also continually cast, but secretly, into the fire. Then said Christian, What means this? The interpreter answered, This is the Christ, who continually, with the oil of his grace, helps the work already begun in the heart, by the means of which notwithstanding what the devil can do, the souls of his people prove gracious still. And in that thou sawest that the man stood behind the wall to keep up the fire, this is to teach thee that it is hard for the tempted to see how this work of grace is kept alive in the soul. I saw also that the interpreter took him again by the hand and led him into a pleasant place, where was built a stately palace, beautiful to behold, at the sight of which Christian was greatly delighted. He saw also upon the top thereof certain persons walking, who were clothed all in gold. Then said Christian, May we go in thither? Then the interpreter took him and led him up toward the door of the palace, and behold, at the door stood a great company of men, as desirous to go in, but durst not. There also sat a man at a little distance from the door, at a table-side, with a book and his inkhorn before him, to take the name of him that should enter therein. He saw also that in the doorway stood many men in armor to keep it, being resolved to do to the men that would enter what hurt and mischief they could. Now was Christian somewhat in amaze. At last, when every man started back for fear of the armed men, Christian saw a man of a very stout countenance come up to the man that sat there to write, saying, Set down my name, sir. The which, when he had done, he saw the man draw his sword, and put a helmet upon his head, and rush toward the door upon the armed men, who laid upon him with deadly force. But the man, not at all discouraged, fell to cutting and hacking most fiercely so that after he had received and given many wounds to those that attempted to keep him out, he cut his way through them all, and pressed forward into the palace, at which there was a pleasant voice heard from those that were within, even of those that walked upon the top of the palace, saying, Come in, come in, eternal glory thou shalt win. So he went in, and was clothed in such garments as they. Then the Christian smiled, and said, I think verily I know the meaning of this. Now, said Christian, let me go hence. Nay, stay, said the interpreter, until I have showed thee a little more, and after that thou shalt go on thy way. So he took him by the hand again, and led him into a very dark room, where there sat a man in an iron cage. Now the man, to look on, seemed very sad. He sat with his eyes looking down to the ground, his hands folded together, and he sighed as if he would break his heart. Then said Christian, What means this? At which the interpreter bid him talk with the man. Then said Christian to the man, 
What art thou? The man answered, I am what I was not once. What wast thou once? The man said, I was once a fair and flourishing Christian, both in mine own eyes and also in the eyes of others. I was once, as I thought, fair for the celestial city, and had even joy the thoughts that I should get thither. Well, but what art thou now? I am now a man of despair, and I am shut up in it, as in this iron cage. I cannot get out. Oh, now I cannot. But how camest thou in this condition? I left off to watch and be sober. I gave free reins to sin. I sinned against the light of the word and the goodness of God. I have grieved the spirit, and he is gone. I tempted the devil, and he has come to me. I have provoked God to anger, and he has left me. I have so hardened my heart that I cannot turn. Then said Christian to the interpreter, But are there no hopes for such a man as this? Ask him, said the interpreter. Then said Christian, Is there no hope, but you must be kept in the iron cage of despair? No, none at all. Why, the Son of the Blessed is very pitiful. I have crucified him to myself afresh. I have despised his person. I have despised his holiness. I have counted his blood an unholy thing. I have shown contempt to the spirit of mercy. Therefore I have shut myself out of all the promises of God. And there now remains to me nothing but threatenings, dreadful threatenings, fearful threatenings of certain judgment and fiery anger, which shall devour me as an enemy. For what did you bring yourself into this condition? For the desires, pleasures, and gains of this world, in the enjoyment of which I did then promise myself much delight, but now every one of those things also bite me and gnaw me like a burning worm. But canst thou not now turn again to God? God no longer invites me to come to him. His word gives me no encouragement to believe. Yea, himself hath shut me up in this iron cage, nor can all the men in the world let me out. O oh, eternity, eternity, how shall I grapple with the misery that I must meet with in eternity? Then said the interpreter to Christian, Let this man's misery be remembered by thee, and be an everlasting caution to thee. Well, said Christian. This is fearful. God help me to watch and be sober, and to pray that I may shun the cause of this man's misery. Sir, is it not time for me to go on my way now? Tarry till I show thee one thing more, and then thou shalt go on thy way. So he took Christian by the hand again, and led him into a chamber, where there was one rising out of bed. And, as he put on his clothing, he shook and trembled, then said Christian, Why doth this man thus tremble? The interpreter then bid him tell to Christian the reason of his so doing. So he began, and said, This night, as I was in my sleep, I dreamed, and behold, the heavens grew exceeding black. Also it thundered and lightened in most fearful manner, that it put me into an agony. So I looked up in my dream, and saw the clouds rack at an unusual rate, upon which I heard a great sound of a trumpet, and also saw a man sitting upon a cloud, attended with the thousands of heaven. They were all in flaming fire. Also the heavens were in a burning flame. I heard then a great voice saying, Arise, ye dead, and come to judgment. And with that the rocks rent, the graves opened, and the dead that were therein came forth. Some of them were exceeding glad, and looked upward, and some thought to hide themselves under the mountains. Then I saw the man that sat upon the cloud open the book, and bid the world draw near. Yet there was, by reason of a fierce flame that issued out and came before him, a certain distance betwixt him and them, as betwixt the judge and the prisoners at the bar. I heard it also called out to them that stood around on the man that sat on a cloud, Gather together the tares, the chaff, and stubble, and cast them into the burning lake. And with that the bottomless pit opened, just whereabout I stood, out of the mouth of which there came, in an abundant manner, smoke and coals of fire with hideous noises. 
It was also said to the same persons, Gather my wheat into the garner. And with that I saw many catched up and carried away into the clouds, but I was left behind. I also sought to hide myself, but I could not. For the man that sat upon the clouds still kept his eye upon me. My sins also came into my mind, and my conscience did accuse me on every side. Upon this I awakened from my sleep. But what was it that made you so afraid of this sight? Why, I thought that the day of judgment was come, and that I was not ready for it. But this affrighted me most, that the angels gathered up several, and left me behind. Also the pit of hell opened her mouth just where I stood. My conscience, too, troubled me, and, as I thought, the judge had always his eye upon me, showing his anger in his countenance. Then said the interpreter to Christian, Hast thou considered these things? Yes, and they put me in hope and fear. Well, keep all things so in thy mind, that they may be as a goad in thy sides, to prick thee forward in the way that thou must go. Then the Christian began to gird up his loins, and to address himself to his journey. Then said the interpreter, The Comforter be always with thee, good Christian, to guide thee into the way that leads to the city. So Christian went on his way, saying, Here I have seen things rare and profitable, things pleasant, dreadful, things to make me stable, in what I have begun to take in hand. Then let me think on them and understand, wherefore they showed me where, and let me be thankful, O good interpreter, to thee. End of Part 1, Chapter 2《The Pilgrim's Progress》Part 1 Chapter 3 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Pilgrim's Progress》by John Bunyan Part 1 Chapter 3 Now I saw in my dream that the highway up which Christian was to go was fenced on either side with a wall that was called Salvation. Up this way, therefore, did burdened Christian run but not without great difficulty, because of the load on his back. He ran thus till he came to a place somewhat ascending, and upon that place stood a cross, and a little below, in the bottom, a tomb. So I saw in my dream that, just as Christian came up with the cross, his burden loosed from his shoulders, and fell from off his back, and began to tumble, and so continued to do till it came to the mouth of the tomb, where it fell in, and I saw it no more. Then was Christian glad and lightsome, and said with a merry heart, He hath given me rest by his sorrow, and life by his death. Then he stood still a while to look and wonder, for it was very surprising to him that the sight of the cross should thus ease him of his burden. He looked, therefore, and looked again even till the springs that were in his head sent the water down his cheeks. Now, as he stood looking and weeping, behold, three shining ones came to him and saluted him with, Peace be to thee. So the first said to him, Thy sins be forgiven thee. The second stripped him of his rags and clothed him with a change of garments. The third also set a mark on his forehead and gave him a roll with a seal upon it which he bade him look on as he ran, and that he should give it in at the heavenly gate. So they went their way. Then the Christian gave three leaps for joy, and went on, singing, Thus far did I come, laden with my sin, nor could aught ease the grief that I was in, till I came hither. What a place is this? Must here be the beginnings of my bliss? Must here the burden fall from off my back? Must here the strings that bound it to me crack? Blessed cross, blessed sepulchre, blessed rather be, the man that was there put to shame for me. I saw then in my dream that he went on thus, even until he came to the bottom, where he saw, a little out of the way, three men fast asleep, with fetters upon their heels. The name of one was Simple, of another Sloth, and of the third Presumption. Christian, then, seeing them lie in this case, went to them, if perhaps he might awake them, and cried, You are like them that sleep on top of a mast, for the deep sea is under you, a gulf that hath no bottom. Awake, therefore, and come away. Be willing also, and I will help you off with your irons. He also told them, 
If he that goeth about like a roaring lion comes by, you will certainly become a prey to his teeth. With that they looked upon him, and began to reply in this sort. Simple said, I see no danger. Sloth said, Ah, oh, yet a little more sleep. And Presumption said, Every tub must stand upon its own bottom. And so they lay down to sleep again, and Christian went on his way. Yet was he troubled to think that men in that danger should so little care for the kindness of him that so offered to help them, both by awakening of them, advising them, and offering to help them off with their irons. And as he was troubled thereabout, he espied two men come tumbling over the wall on the left hand of the narrow way, and they made up a pace to him. The name of one was Formalist, and the name of the other was Hypocrisy. So, as I said, they drew up unto him, who thus began talking with them. Gentlemen, whence came you, and whither go you? We were born in the land of vainglory, and were going for praise to Mount Zion. Why came you not in at the gate, which standeth at the beginning of the way? Know ye not that it is written, He that cometh not in by the door, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber? They said that to go to the gate for entrance was, by all their countrymen, counted too far about, and that, therefore, their usual way was to make a short cut of it, and to climb over the wall, as they had done. But will it not be counted a trespass against the lord of the city whither we are bound, thus to disobey his will? They told him that as for that he needed not trouble his head thereabout. For what they did they had custom for, and could show, if need were, testimony that could prove it for more than a thousand years. But, said Christian, will it stand a trial at law? They told him that custom it being of so long standing as above a thousand years, would doubtless now be admitted as a thing according to law by a fair judge. And besides, said they, if we get into the way, what matter is it which way we may get in? If we are in, we are in. Thou art but in the way, who, as we perceive, came in at the gate. And we are also in the way that came tumbling over the wall, wherein now is thy condition better than ours. I walk by the rule of my master. You walk by the rude working of your fancies. You are counted thieves already by the lord of the way. Therefore I doubt you will not be found true men at the end of the way. You come in by yourselves without his word, and shall go out by yourselves without his mercy. To this they made him but little answer, only they bid him look to himself. Then I saw that they went on every man in his way, without much talking one with another save that these two men told Christian that, as to law and rules, they doubted not but that they should as carefully do them as he. Therefore, said they, we see not wherein thou differest from us, but by the coat which is on thy back, which was, as we believe, given thee by some of thy neighbors to hide the shame of thy nakedness. By laws and rules you will not be saved, since you came not in by the door. And as for this coat that is on my back, it was given to me by the lord of the place whither I go, and that, as you say, to cover my nakedness with. And I take it as a token of his kindness to me, for I had nothing but rags before. And besides, thus I comfort myself as I go. Surely, think I, when I come to the gate of the city, the lord thereof will know me for good, since I have his coat on my back, a coat that he gave me freely in the day that he stripped me of my rags. I have, moreover, a mark in my forehead, of which perhaps you have taken no notice, which one of my lord's most intimate friends fixed there the day that my burden fell off my shoulders. I will tell you, moreover, that I had then given me a roll sealed to comfort me by reading as I go in the way. I was also bid to give it in at the heavenly gate, in token of my certain going in after it, all which things I doubt you want, and want them because you came not in at the gate. To these things they gave him no answer, only they looked upon each other and laughed. Then I saw that they went on all, save that Christian kept before, who had no more talk but with himself, and sometimes sighingly, and sometimes comfortably. Also he would be often reading in the roll that one of the shining ones gave him, by which he was refreshed. I beheld then that they all went on till they came to the foot of the hill Difficulty, at the bottom of which was a spring. 
There were also in the same place two other ways, besides that which came straight from the gate. One turned to the left hand, and the other to the right, at the bottom of the hill. But the narrow way lay right up the hill, and the name of that going up the side of the hill is called Difficulty. Christian now went to the spring, and drank thereof to refresh himself, and then began to go up the hill, saying, The hill though high I covet to ascend, the difficulty will not me offend, for I perceive the way to life lies here. Come pluck up heart, let's neither faint nor fear, better though difficult the right way to go, than wrong though easy where the end is woe. The other two also came to the foot of the hill, but when they saw that the hill was steep and high, and that there were two other ways to go, and supposing also that these two ways might meet again with that up which Christian went, on the other side of the hill, therefore they were resolved to go in those ways. Now the name of one of those ways was Danger, and the name of the other Destruction. So the one took the way which is called Danger, which led him into a great wood, and the other took directly up the way to Destruction which led him into a wide field full of dark mountains, where he stumbled and fell, and rose no more. I looked then after Christian, to see him go up the hill, where I perceived he fell from running to going, and from going to clambering upon his hands and his knees, because of the steepness of the place. Now, about the midway to the top of the hill was a pleasant arbor, made by the lord of the hill for the refreshment of weary travellers. Thither, therefore, a Christian got, where also he sat down to rest him. Then he pulled his roll out of his bosom, and read therein to his comfort. He also now began afresh to take a review of the coat or garment that was given him as he stood by the cross. Thus, pleasing himself a while, he at last fell into a slumber, and thence into a fast sleep, which detained him in that place until it was almost night. And in his sleep, his roll fell out of his hand. Now, as he was sleeping, there came one to him, and awakened him, saying, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways, and be wise. And with that Christian suddenly started up, and sped on his way, and went apace, till he came to the top of the hill. Now, when he was got up to the top of the hill, there came two men running amain, the name of one was Timorous, and of the other Mistrust, to whom Christian said, Sirs, what's the matter? You run the wrong way. Timorous answered that they were going to the city of Zion, and had got up that difficult place. But, said he, the farther we go, the more danger we meet with. Wherefore we turned and are going back again. Yes, said Mistrust. For just before us lie a couple of lions in the way, whether sleeping or waking we know not, and we could not think, if we came within reach, but they would presently pull us in pieces. Then said Christian, You make me afraid, but whither shall I fly to be safe? If I go back to my own country, that is prepared for fire and brimstone, and I shall certainly perish there. If I can get to the celestial city, I am sure to be in safety there. I must venture. To go back is nothing but death. To go forward is fear of death, and everlasting life beyond it. I will yet go forward. So Mistrust and Timorous ran down the hill, and Christian went on his way. But thinking again of what he heard from the men, he felt in his bosom for his roll, and found it not. Then was Christian in great distress, and knew not what to do. For he wanted that which used to comfort him, and that which should have been his pass into the celestial city. Here, therefore, he began to be greatly troubled, and knew not what to do. At last he bethought himself that he had slept in the arbor that is on the side of the hill, and falling down upon his knees, he asked God's forgiveness for that his foolish act, and then went back to look for his role. But all the way he went back, who can sufficiently set forth the sorrow of Christian's heart? Sometimes he sighed, sometimes he wept and oftentimes he blamed himself for being so foolish to fall asleep in that place, which was erected only for a little refreshment from his weariness. Thus, therefore, he went back, carefully looking on this side and on that, all the way as he went, if happily he might find his role that had been his comfort so many times in his journey. 
He went thus till he came again within sight of the arbor where he sat and slept. But that sight renewed his sorrow the more, by bringing again, even afresh, his evil of sleeping into his mind. Thus, therefore, he now went on, bewailing his sinful sleep, saying, O wretched man that I am, that I should sleep in the daytime, that I should sleep in the midst of difficulty, that I should so indulge myself as to use that rest for ease to my flesh, when the Lord of the hill hath builded only for the relief of the spirits of pilgrims. How many steps have I taken in vain? Thus it happened to Israel. For their sin they were sent back again by the way of the Red Sea. And I am made to tread those steps with sorrow, which I might have trod with delight, had it not been for this sinful sleep. How far might I have been on my way by this time? I am made to tread those steps thrice over, which I needed not to have trod but once. Yea, also, now I am like to be benighted, for the day is almost spent. Oh, that I had not slept! Now by this time he was come to the arbor again, where for a while he sat down and wept. But at last, as Providence would have it, looking sorrowfully down under the settle, there he espied his roll, the which he, with trembling and haste, caught up, and put it into his bosom. But who can tell how joyful this man was when he got his roll again? For this roll was the assurance of his life, an acceptance at the desired haven. Therefore he laid it up in his bosom, giving thanks to God for directing his eye to the place where it lay, and with joy and tears betook himself again to his journey. But, oh, how nimbly now did he go up the rest of the hill! Yet before he got up the sun went down upon Christian, and this made him again recall the folly of his sleeping to his remembrance, and thus he began again to condole with himself. O oh, thou sinful sleep, how for thy sake am I like to be benighted in my journey? I must walk without the sun. Darkness must cover the path of my feet, and I must hear the noise of the doleful creatures because of my sinful sleep. Now also he remembered the story that mistrust and timorous told him of how they were frighted with the sight of the lions. Then said Christian to himself again, These beasts range in the night for their prey, and if they should meet with me in the dark, how should I avoid them? How should I escape being torn in pieces? Thus he went on his way, but while he was thus bewailing his unhappy mistake, he lifted up his eyes, and behold, there was a very stately palace before him, the name of which was Beautiful, and it stood just by the highway side. So I saw in my dream that he made haste and went forward, that, if possible, he might get lodging there. Now, before he had gone far, he entered into a very narrow passage, which was about a furlong off the porter's lodge, and looking very narrowly before him as he went, he espied two lions in the way. Now, thought he, I see the dangers by which mistrust and timorous were driven back. The lions were chained, but he saw not the chains. Then he was afraid, and thought also himself to go back after them for he thought nothing but death was before him. But the porter at the lodge, whose name is Watchful, perceiving that Christian made a halt as if he would go back, cried out unto him, saying, Is thy strength so small? Fear not the lions, for they are chained, and are placed there for the trial of faith where it is, and for the finding out of those that have none. Keep in the midst of the path, and no hurt shall come unto thee. Then I saw that he went on trembling for fear of the lions, but taking good heed to the words of the porter, he heard them roar, but they did no harm. Then he clapped his hands, and went on till he came and stood before the gate where the porter was. Then said Christian to the porter, Sir, what house is this, and may I lodge here tonight? The porter answered, This house was built by the Lord of the Hill, and he built it for the relief and security of pilgrims. The porter also asked whence he was and whither he was going. I am come from the city of destruction, and am going to Mount Zion, but because the sun is now set, I desire, if I may, to lodge here tonight. What is your name? My name now is Christian, but my name at the first was Graceless. But how doth it happen that you come so late? The sun is set. I had been here sooner, 
but that, wretched man that I am, I slept in the arbour that stands on the hillside. Nay, I had notwithstanding that been here much sooner, but that in my sleep I lost my roll, and came without it to the brow of the hill. And then, feeling for it, and finding it not, I was forced with sorrow of heart to go back to the place where I slept my sleep, where I found it, and now I am come. Well, I will call out one of the women of this place, who will, if she likes your talk, bring you into the rest of the family according to the rules of the house. So watchful the porter rang a bell, at the sound of which came out of the door of the house a grave and beautiful young woman, named Discretion, and asked why she was called. The porter answered, This man is on a journey from the city of destruction to Mount Zion, but, being weary and benighted, he asked me if he might lodge here tonight. So I told him I would call for thee, who, after speaking with him, mayest do as seemeth thee good, even according to the law of the house. Then she asked him whence he was, and whither he was going, and he told her. She asked him also how he got into the way, and he told her. Then she asked him what he had seen and met with on the way, and he told her. And at last she asked his name. So he said, It is Christian, and I have so much the more a desire to lodge here tonight, because, by what I perceive, this place was built by the Lord of the Hill for the relief and safety of pilgrims. So she smiled, but the water stood in her eyes, and after a little pause she said, I will call forth two or three of my family. So she ran to the door and called out Prudence, Piety, and Charity, who, after a little more discourse with him, brought him into the family, and many of them, meeting him at the threshold of the house, said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. This house was built by the Lord of the Hill, on purpose to entertain such pilgrims in. Then he bowed his head and followed them into the house. So when he was come in and sat down, they gave him something to drink, and agreed together that, until supper was ready, some of them should talk with Christian, for the best use of the time, and they appointed piety, prudence, and charity to talk with them, and thus they began. Come, good Christian, since we have been so loving to you to receive you into our house this night, let us, if perhaps we may better ourselves thereby, talk with you of all things that have happened to you in your pilgrimage. With a very good will, and I am glad that you are so well disposed. What moved you at first to betake yourself to a pilgrim's life? I was driven out of my native country by a dreadful sound that was in mine ears, to wit, that certain destruction did await me if I abode in that place where I was. But how did it happen that you came out of your country this way? It was as God would have it, for when I was under the fears of destruction I did not know whither to go. But by chance there came a man even to me as I was trembling and weeping, whose name is Evangelist, and he directed me to the wicked gate, which else I should never have found, and so set me in the way that had led me directly to this house. But did you not come by the house of the interpreter? Yes, and did see such things there, the remembrance of which will stick by me as long as I live, especially three things, to wit, how Christ, in the despite of Satan, the evil one, maintains his work of grace in the heart, how the man had sinned himself quite out of hopes of God's mercy, and also the dream of him that thought in his sleep the day of judgment was come. Why did you hear him tell his dream? Yes, and a dreadful one it was. I thought it made my heart ache as he was telling of it, but yet I am glad I heard of it. Was that all you saw at the house of the interpreter? No, he took me and had me where he showed me a stately palace, and how the people were clad in gold that were in it and how there came a venturous man and cut his way through the armed men that stood in the door to keep him out, and how he was bid to come in and win eternal glory. Methought those things did delight my heart. I would have stayed at that good man's house a twelvemonth, but that I knew I had further to go. And what saw you else in the way? Saw? Why, I went but a little further, and I saw one, as I thought in my mind, hang bleeding upon a tree, and the very sight of him made my burden fall off my back for I groaned under a very heavy burden, and then it fell down from off me. It was a strange thing to me, for I never saw such a thing before. Yea, and while I stood looking up, for then I could not forbear looking, three shining ones came to me. One of them told me that my sins were forgiven me, 
Another stripped me of my rags and gave me this broidered coat which you see, and the third set the mark which you see in my forehead and gave me this sealed roll. And with that he plucked it out of his bosom. But you saw more than this, did you not? The things that I have told you were the best, yet some other matters I saw, as namely I saw three men, simple, sloth, and presumption, lie asleep a little out of the way as I came, with irons upon their heels, but do you think I could wake them? I saw also formalist and hypocrisy come tumbling over the wall, to go as they pretended to Zion, but they were quickly lost, even as I myself did tell them, but they would not believe. But above all I found it hard work to get up this hill, and it's hard to come by the lion's mouth, and truly, if it had not been for the good man the porter that stands at the gate, I do not know but that after all I might have gone back again. But now I thank God I am here, and I thank you for receiving of me. Then Prudence thought good to ask him a few questions, and desired his answer to them. Do you think sometimes of the country from whence you came? Yes, but with much shame and detestation. Truly, if I had been mindful of that country from whence I came out, I might have had an opportunity to have returned, but now I desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Do you not yet bear away with you in your thoughts some of the things that you did in the former time? Yes, but greatly against my will, especially my inward and sinful thoughts with which all my countrymen as well as myself were delighted. But now all those things are my grief, and might I but choose mine own things, I would choose never to think of those things more. But when I would be doing that which is best, that which is worst is with me. Do you not find sometimes as if those things were overcome which at other times are your trouble? Yes, but that is but seldom. But they are to me golden hours in which such things happen to me. Can you remember by what means you find your annoyances at times as if they were overcome? Yes, when I think what I saw at the cross, that will do it. And when I look upon my broidered coat, that will do it. Also when I look into the roll that I carry in my bosom, that will do it. And when my thoughts wax warm about whither I am going, that will do it. And what makes you so desirous to go to Mount Zion? Why, there I hope to see him alive that did hang dead on the cross. And there I hope to be rid of all these things that to this day are in me an annoyance to me. There they say there is no death. And there I shall dwell with such company as I like best. For to tell you the truth, I love him because I was by him eased of my burden. And I am weary of my inward sickness. I would fain be where I shall die no more and with the company that shall continually cry, Holy, Holy, Holy. Then said Charity to Christian, Have you a family? Are you a married man? I have a wife and four small children. And why did you not bring them along with you? Then Christian wept and said, Oh, how willingly I would have done it, but they were all of them utterly against my going on pilgrimage. But you should have talked to them and endeavoured to have shown them the danger of staying behind. So I did, and told them also what God had shown to me of the destruction of our city. But I seemed to them as one that mocked, and they believed me not. And did you pray to God that he would bless your words to them? Yes, and that with much affection, for you must think that my wife and poor children are very dear unto me. But did you tell them of your own sorrow and fear of destruction? For I suppose that you could see your destruction before you. Yes, over and over and over. They might also see my fears in my countenance, in my tears, and also in my trembling under the fear of the judgment that did hang over our heads. But all was not enough to prevail with them to come with me. But what could they say for themselves why they came not? Why, my wife was afraid of losing this world, and my children were given to the foolish delights of youth. So, what by one thing and what by another, they left me to wander in this manner alone. But did you not, with your vain life, hinder all that you by words used by way of persuasion to bring them away with you? Indeed, I cannot commend my life, for I am conscious to myself of many failings therein. I know also that a man, by his actions, may sooner overthrow what, by proofs or persuasion, he doth labour to fasten upon others for their good. Yet this I can say. I was very wary of giving them occasion by any unseemly action to make them averse to going on pilgrimage. Yea, for this very thing they would tell me I was too precise, and that I denied myself of things for their sakes in which they saw no evil. Nay, I think I may say that if what they saw in me did hinder them, it was my great tenderness in sinning against God or of doing any wrong to my neighbour. 
Indeed, Cain hated his brother because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. And if thy wife and children have been offended with thee for this, they thereby show themselves to be resolutely opposed to good. Thou hast freed thy soul from their blood. Now I saw in my dream that thus they sat talking together till supper was ready. So when they had made ready, they sat down to meat. Now the table was furnished with fat things, and wine that was well refined, and all their talk at the table was about the Lord of the hill, as, namely, about what he had done, and wherefore he did what he did, and, and why he had builded that house. And by what they said, I perceived that he had been a great warrior, and had fought with and slain him that had the power of death, but not without great danger to himself, which made me love him the more. For, as they said, and as I believe, said Christian, he did it with the loss of much blood, but that which puts the glory of grace into all he did was that he did it out of pure love to his country. And besides, there were some of them of the household that said they had seen and spoken with him since he did die on the cross, and they have declared that they had it from his own lips that he is such a lover of poor pilgrims that the like is not to be found from the east to the west. They, moreover, gave an instance of what they affirmed, and that was, he had stripped himself of his glory, that he might do this for the poor, and that they had heard him say, and affirm, that he would not dwell in the mountains of Zion alone. They said, moreover, that he had made many pilgrims princes, though by nature they were beggars born, and their home had been the dunghill. Thus they talked together till late at night, and after they had committed themselves to their Lord for protection, they betook themselves to rest. The pilgrim they laid in a large upper chamber, whose window opened towards the sun-rising. The name of the chamber was Peace, where he slept till break of day, and then he awoke, and sang, Where am I now? Is this the love and care of Jesus for the men that pilgrims are? thus to provide that I should be forgiven, and dwell already the next door to heaven. So in the morning they all got up, and after some more talking together, they told him that he should not depart till they had shown him the rarities of that place. And first they took him into the study, where they showed him records of the greatest age, in which, as I remember in my dream, they showed him first the history of the Lord of the Hill, that he was the son of the Ancient of Days, and had lived from the beginning. Here also were more fully written the acts that he had done, and the names of many hundreds that he had taken into his service, and how he had placed them in such houses that could neither by length of days nor decays of nature be destroyed. Then they read to him some of the worthy acts that some of his servants had done, as how they had conquered kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, and turned in flight the armies of the enemies. They then read again in another part of the records of the house, where it was shown how willing their Lord was to receive into his favor any, even any, though they in time past had done great wrongs to his person and rule. Here also were several other histories of many other famous things, of all which Christian had a view. As of things both ancient and modern, together with prophecies and foretellings of things that surely come to pass, both to the dread and wonder of enemies, and the comfort and happiness of pilgrims. The next day they took him and led him into the armory, where they showed him all manner of weapons which the Lord had provided for pilgrims, as sword, shield, helmet, breastplate, all prayer, and shoes that would not wear out. And there was here enough of this to harness out as many men for the service of the Lord as there be stars in the heaven for multitude. They also showed him some of the things with which some of his servants had done wonderful things. They showed him Moses' rod, the hammer and nail with which Jael slew Sisera, the pitchers, trumpets, and lamps too with which Gideon put to flight the armies of Midian. Then they showed him the ox's goad wherewith Shamgar slew six hundred men. They showed him also the jawbone with which Samson did such mighty feats. 
They showed him, moreover, the sling and stone with which David slew Goliath of Gath, and the sword also with which their Lord will kill the man of sin in the day that he shall rise up to the battle. They showed him, besides, many excellent things, with which Christian was much delighted. This done, they went to their rest again. Then I saw in my dream that on the morrow he got up to go forward, but they desired him to stay till the next day also. And then, said they, we will, if the day be clear, show you the delectable mountains. Which they said would yet further add to his comfort, because they were nearer the desired haven than the place where at present he was. So he consented and stayed. When the morning was up, they led him to the top of the house, and bid him look south. So he did, and, behold, at a great distance he saw a most pleasant mountainous country, beautified with woods, vineyards, fruits of all sorts, flowers also, with springs and fountains, very lovely to behold. Then he asked the name of the country. They said it was Emmanuel's land. And it is as common, said they as this hill is, to and for all the pilgrims. And when thou comest there, from thence thou mayest see to the gate of the celestial city, as the shepherds that live there will make appear. Now he bethought himself of setting forward, and they were willing he should. But first, said they, let us go again into the armory. So they did. And when he came there, they dressed him from head to foot with armor of proof, lest perhaps he should meet with assaults in the way. He, being therefore thus armed, walked out with his friends to the gate, and there he asked the porter if he saw any pilgrim pass by. Then the porter answered, Yes. Pray, did you know him? said he. I asked his name, and he told me it was Faithful. Oh said Christian. I know him. He is my townsman, my near neighbor. He comes from the place where I was born. How far do you think he may be before? He has got by this time below the hill. Well, said Christian, good porter, the Lord be with thee, and add to all thy blessings much increase for the kindness thou hast shown to me. Then he began to go forward, but discretion, piety, charity, and prudence would accompany him down to the foot of the hill. So they went on together, repeating their former discourses, till they came to go down the hill. Then said Christian, As it was difficult coming up, so far so as I can see it is dangerous going down. Yes, said Prudence. So it is, for it is a hard matter for a man to go down the valley of humiliation, as thou art now, and to catch no slip by the way. Therefore, said they, are we come out to accompany thee down the hill? So he began to go down, but very warily, yet he caught a slip or two. Then I saw in my dream that these good companions, when Christian was gone down to the bottom of the hill, gave him a loaf of bread, a bottle of wine, and a cluster of raisins. And then he went his way. End of Part 1, Chapter 3《The Pilgrim's Progress》Part 1 Chapter 4 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Pilgrim's Progress》by John Bunyan Part 1 Chapter 4 But now, in this valley of humiliation, poor Christian was hard put to it, for he had gone but a little way before he espied a foul fiend coming over the field to meet him. His name is Apollyon. Then did Christian begin to be afraid, and to cast in his mind whether to go back or to stand his ground. But he considered again that he had no armor for his back, and therefore thought that to turn the back to him might give him greater advantage with ease to pierce him with darts. Therefore he resolved to venture and stand his ground, for, thought he, had I no more in mine eye than the saving of my life, it would be the best way to stand. So he went on, and Apollyon met him. Now the monster was hideous to behold, 
He was clothed with scales like a fish, and they are his pride. He had wings like a dragon, and feet like a bear, and out of his belly came fire and smoke, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. When he was come up to Christian, he beheld him with a disdainful countenance, and thus began to question with him. Whence come you, and whither are ye bound? I am come from the city of destruction, which is the place of all evil, and I am going to the city of Zion. By this I perceive that there are one of my subjects, for all that country is mine, and I am the prince and god of it. How is it then that thou hast run away from thy king? Were it not that I hope that thou mayest do me more service, I would strike thee now at one blow to the ground. I was indeed born in your kingdom, but your service was hard, and your wages such as a man could not live on, for the wages of sin is death. Therefore, when I was come to years, I did as other thoughtful persons do, look out if perhaps I might mend myself. There is no prince that will thus lightly lose his subjects, neither will I as yet lose thee. But since thou complainest to thy service and wages, be content to go back. And what your country will afford, I do here promise to give thee. But I have let myself to another, even to the king of princes, and how can I with fairness go back with thee? Thou hast done in this according to the proverb, changed a bad for a worse. But it is common for those that have called themselves his servants, after a while to give him the slip and return again to me. Do thou so too, and all shall be well. I have given him my faith, and sworn my service to him. How then can I go back from this, and not be hanged as a traitor? Thou didst the same to me, and yet I am willing to pass by all, if now thou wilt turn again, and go back. What I promised thee was in my youth, and besides, I count that the prince under whose banner I now stand is able to set me free, yea, and to pardon also what I did as to my service with thee. And besides, O thou destroying Apollyon, to speak the truth, I like his service, his wages, his servants, his government, his company, and country better than thine. Therefore leave off to persuade me further. I am his servant, and I will follow him. Consider again what thou art in cold blood what thou art likely to meet with in the way that thou goest. Thou knowest that, for the most part, his servants come to an ill end, because they are disobedient against me and my ways. How many of them have been put to shameful deaths? And, besides, thou countest his service better than mine. Whereas he never came yet from the place where he is to deliver any that served him out of their hands. But as for me, how many times, as all the world very well knows, have I delivered, either by power or fraud, those that have faithfully served me from him and his, though taken by them. And so I will deliver thee. His forbearing at present to deliver them is on purpose to try their love, whether they will cleave to him in the end. And as for the ill end thou sayest they come to, that is most glorious in their account. For the present deliverance they do not much expect it, for they stay for their glory, and then they shall have it when their prince comes in his and the glory of angels. Thou hast already been unfaithful in thy service to him, and how dost thou think to receive wages of him? Wherein, O Apollyon, have I been unfaithful to him? Thou didst faint at first setting out, when thou wast almost choked in the gulf of despond. Thou didst attempt wrong ways to be rid of thy burden, whereas thou should have stayed till thy prince had taken it off. Thou didst sinfully sleep and lose thy choice things. Thou wast almost persuaded to go back at the sight of the lions. And when thou talkest of thy journey, and of what thou hast seen and heard, thou art inwardly desirous of glory to thyself in all that thou sayest or doest. All this is true, and much more which thou hast left out. But the prince whom I serve and honour is merciful and ready to forgive. 
But besides, these infirmities possessed me in thy own country, for there I sucked them in, and I have groaned under them, been sorry for them, and have obtained pardon from my prince. Then Apollyon broke out into a grievous rage, saying, Oh, I am an enemy to this prince. I hate his person, his laws and people. I am come here on purpose to withstand thee. Apollyon, beware what you do, for I am in the king's highway, the way of holiness. Therefore take heed to yourself. Then Apollyon straddled quite over the whole breadth of the way, and said, <sighs> I am void of fear in this matter. Prepare thyself to die, for I swear by my infernal den that thou shalt go no farther. Here will I spill thy soul. And with that he threw a flaming dart at his breast, but Christian held a shield in his hand, with which he caught, and so prevented the danger of that. Then did Christian draw, for he saw it was time to bestir him, and Apollyon as fast made at him, throwing darts as thick as hail, by the which, notwithstanding all that Christian could do to avoid it, Apollyon wounded him in his head, his hand, and foot. This made Christian give a little back. Apollyon, therefore, followed his work amain, and Christian again took courage, and resisted as manfully as he could. This sore combat lasted for above half a day, even till Christian was almost quite spent. For you must know that Christian, by reason of his wounds, must needs grow weaker and weaker. Then Apollyon, espying his opportunity, began to gather up close to Christian, and wrestling with him, gave him a dreadful fall. And with that, Christian's sword flew out of his hand. Then said Apollyon, <laughs> I am sure of thee now. And with that, he had almost pressed him to death, so that Christian began to despair of life. But as God would have it, while Apollyon was fetching his last blow, thereby to make a full end of this good man, Christian nimbly reached out his hand for his sword, and caught it, saying, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, for when I fall I shall arise. And with that gave him a deadly thrust, which made him give back, as one that had received his mortal wound. Christian, perceiving that, made at him again, saying, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And with that Apollyon spread forth his dragon's wings, and sped him away, that Christian for a season saw him no more. In this combat no man can imagine, unless he had seen and heard as I did, what yelling and hideous roaring Apollyon made all the time of the fight. He spake like a dragon, and on the other side what sighs and groans burst from Christian's heart. I never saw him all the while give so much as one pleasant look, till he perceived he had wounded Apollyon with his two-edged sword. Then, indeed, he did smile and look upward, but it was the dreadfulest sight that ever I saw. So, when the battle was over, Christian said, I will here give thanks to him that hath delivered me out of the mouth of the lion, to him that did help me against Apollyon. And so he did, saying, Great Satan, the captain of this fiend, designed my ruin, therefore to this end. He sent him harnessed out, and he with rage, that hellish was, did fiercely me engage. But blessed angels helped me, and I, by dint of sword, did quickly make him fly. Therefore to God let me give lasting praise, and thank and bless his holy name always. Then there came to him a hand, with some of the leaves of the tree of life, the which Christian took, and laid upon the wounds that he had received in the battle, and was healed immediately. He also sat down in that place to eat bread, and to drink of the bottle that was given to him a little before. So, being refreshed, he went forth on his journey, with his sword drawn in his hand. For, he said, I know not, but some other enemy may be at hand. But he met with no other harm from Apollyon quite through this valley. Now, at the end of this valley was another, called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And Christian must needs go through it, because the way to the celestial city lay through the midst of it. Now this valley is a very solitary place, 
The prophet Jeremiah thus describes it, a wilderness, a land of deserts and pits, a land of drought, and of the shadow of death, a land that no man but a Christian passeth through, and where no man dwelt. Now here Christian was worse put to it than in his fight with Apollyon, as in the story you shall see. I saw then in my dream that when Christian was got to the borders of the shadow of death, there met him two men, children of them that brought up an evil report of the good land, making haste to go back, to whom Christian spake as follows. Whither are you going? They said, Back, back, and we would have you to do so too, if either life or peace is priced by you. Why, what's the matter? said Christian. Matter, said they. We were going that way as you were going, and went as far as we durst, and indeed we were almost past coming back. For had we gone a little farther, we had not been here to bring the news to thee. But what have you met with? said Christian. Why, we were almost in the valley of the shadow of death, but that but good hap we looked before us, and saw the danger before we came to it. But what have you seen? said Christian. Seen by the valley itself, which is as dark as pitch. We also saw there the hobgoblins, satyrs, and dragons of the pit. We heard also in the valley a continual howling and yelling, as of a people under unutterable misery, who were there sat bound in affliction and irons, and over that hung the discouraging clouds of confusion. Death also does always spread his wings over it. In a word, it is every whit dreadful, being utterly without order. Then said Christian, I perceive not yet, by what you have said, but that this is my way to the desired haven. Be it thy way, we will not choose it for ours. So they parted, and Christian went on his way, but still with his sword drawn in his hand, for fear lest he should be attacked. I saw then in my dream, as far as this valley reached, there was on the right hand a very deep ditch. That ditch is it into which the blind have led the blind in all ages, and have both there miserably perished. Again, behold, on the left hand there was a very dangerous quag, or marsh, into which, if even a good man falls, he finds no bottom for his foot to stand on. Into that quag King David once did fall, and had no doubt there been smothered had not he that is able plucked him out. The pathway was here also exceedingly narrow, and therefore good Christian was the more put to it, for when he sought in the dark to shun the ditch, on the other hand he was ready to tip over into the mire on the other. Also when he sought to escape the mire, without great carefulness he would be ready to fall into the ditch. Thus he went on, and I heard him here sigh bitterly, for besides the danger mentioned above, the pathway was here so dark that oft-times, when he lifted up his foot to go forward, he knew not where or upon what he should set it next. About the midst of this valley I perceived the mouth of hell to be, and it stood also hard by the wayside. Now, thought Christian, what shall I do? And ever and anon the flame and smoke would come out in such abundance with sparks and hideous noises, things that cared not for Christian's sword, as did Apollyon before, that he was forced to put up his sword and betake himself to another weapon, called All Prayer. So he cried in my hearing, O oh Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Thus he went on a great while, yet still the flames would be reaching towards him. Also he heard doleful voices and rushings to and fro, so that sometimes he thought he should be torn in pieces, or trodden down like mire in the streets. This frightful sight was seen, and those dreadful noises were heard by him, for several miles together, and coming to a place where he thought he heard a company of fiends coming forward to meet him, he stopped, and began to muse what he had best to do. Sometimes he had half a thought to go back, then again he thought he might be halfway through the valley. He remembered also how he had already vanquished many a danger, and that the danger of going back might be much more than going forward. So he resolved to go on, yet the fiends seemed to come nearer and nearer. 
but when they were come even almost at him, he cried out with a most vehement voice, I will walk in the strength of the Lord God. So they gave back, and came no farther. One thing I would not let slip. I took notice that now poor Christian was so confounded that he did not know his own voice, and thus I perceived it. Just when he was come over against the mouth of the burning pit, one of the wicked ones got behind him, and stepped up softly to him, and whisperingly suggested many wicked words to him, which he verily thought had proceeded from his own mind. This put Christian more to it than anything he had met with before, even to think that he should now speak evil of him that he had so much loved before. Yet, if he could have helped it, he would not have done it. But he had not the wisdom either to stop his ears, or to know from whence those wicked words came. When Christian had travelled in this sorrowful condition some considerable time, he thought he heard the voice of a man, as going before him, saying, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Then he was glad, and that for these reasons. First, because he gathered from thence that some who feared God were in this valley as well as himself. Secondly, for that he perceived God was with them, though in that dark and dismal state. And why not, thought he, with me, though by reason of the kindness that attends this place, I cannot perceive it. Thirdly, for that he hoped, could he overtake them, to have company by and by. So he went on, and called to him that was before, but he knew not what to answer, for that he also thought himself to be alone. And by and by the day broke. Then said Christian, He hath turned the shadow of death into the morning. Now, morning being come, he looked back, not out of desire to return, but to see, by the light of day, what dangers he had gone through in the dark. So he saw more perfectly the ditch that was on the one hand, and the quag that was on the other. Also, how narrow the way which led betwixt them both. Also, now he saw the hobgoblins and satyrs and dragons of the pit, but all afar off, for after break of day they came not nigh. Yet they were shown to him according to that which is written, He showeth deep things out of darkness, and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. Now was Christian much affected with his deliverance from all the dangers of his solitary way, which dangers, though he feared them much before, yet he saw them more clearly now, because the light of day made them plain to him. And about this time the sun was rising, and this was another mercy to Christian, for you must note that, though the first part of the valley of the shadow of death was dangerous, yet this second part, which he was yet to go, was, if possible, far more dangerous. For from the place where he now stood, even to the end of the valley, the way was all along set so full of snares, traps, gins, and nets here, and so full of pits, pitfalls, deep holes, and shelvings down there, that had it now been dark, as it was when he came the first part of the way, had he had a thousand souls, they had in reason been cast away. But, as I said, just now the sun was rising. Then said he, His candle shineth on my head, and by his light I go through darkness. In this light, therefore, he came to the end of the valley. Now I saw in my dream that at the end of the valley lay blood, bones, ashes, and mangled bodies of men, even of pilgrims that had gone this way formerly. And, while I was musing what should be the reason, I espied a little before me a cave, whose two giants, Pope and Pagan, dwelt in old time, by whose power and tyranny the men whose bones, blood, ashes, etc. lay there, were cruelly put to death. But by this place Christian went without danger, whereat I somewhat wondered. But I have learnt since that Pagan has been dead many a day, and as for the other, Though he be yet alive, he is, by reason of age, also of the many shrewd brushes that he met with in his younger days, grown so crazy and stiff in his joints, that he can now do little more than sit in his cave's mouth, grinning at pilgrims as they go by, 
and biting his nails, because he cannot come to them. So I saw that Christian went on his way, yet at the sight of the old man that sat at the mouth of the cave he could not tell what to think, especially because he spoke to him, though he could not go after him, saying, You will never mend till more of you be burned. But he held his peace, and set a good face on it, and so went by, and caught no hurt. Then sang Christian, O world of wonders, I can say no less, that I should be preserved in that distress that I have met with here, O blessed be, the hand that from it hath delivered me. Dangers in darkness, devils, hell, and sin, did compass me while I this veil was in, yet snares and pits and traps and nets did lie, my path about that worthless silly eye might have been catched, entangled, and cast down. But since I live, let Jesus wear the crown. End of Part 1, Chapter 4《The Pilgrim's Progress》Part 1, Chapter 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, Part 1, Chapter 5. Now, as Christian went on his way, he came to a little ascent which was cast up on purpose that pilgrims might see before them. Up there, therefore, Christian went, and looking forward, he saw faithful before him upon his journey. Then said Christian aloud, Ho, ho, so ho, stay, and I'll be your companion. At that Faithful looked behind him, to whom Christian cried, Stay, stay, till I come up to you. But Faithful answered, No, I am upon my life, and the avenger of blood is behind me. At this Christian was somewhat moved, and putting to all his strength, he quickly got up with Faithful, and did also overrun him, so the last was first. Then did Christian boastfully smile, because he had gotten the start of his brother, but not taking good heed to his feet, he suddenly stumbled and fell, and could not rise again until Faithful came up to help him. Then I saw in my dream they went very lovingly on together, and had sweet talk together of all things that had happened to them in their pilgrimage. And thus Christian began, My honoured and well-beloved brother Faithful, I am glad that I have overtaken you, and that God has so tempered our spirits that we can walk as companions in this so pleasant a path. I had thought, dear friend, to have had your company quite from our town, but you did get the start of me, wherefore I was forced to come thus much of the way alone. How long did you stay in the city of destruction before you set out after me on your pilgrimage? till I could stay no longer, for there was great talk, presently after you were gone out, that our city would, in a short time, with fire from heaven, be burned down to the ground. What? Did your neighbors talk so? Yes, it was for a while in everybody's mouth. What? And did no more of them but you come out to escape the danger? Though there was, as I said, a great talk thereabout, yet I do not think they did firmly believe it. For, in the heat of the talking, I heard some of them deridingly speak of you, and of your desperate journey, for so they called this your pilgrimage. But I did believe, and do still, that the end of our city will be with fire and brimstone from above, and therefore I have made my escape. Did you hear no talk of neighbor Pliable? Yes, Christian. I heard that he followed you till he came to the slough of despond, where, as some said, he fell in. But he would not be known to have so done, but I am sure he was soundly bedabbled with that kind of dirt. And what said the neighbors to him? He had, since his going back, been held greatly in derision, and that among all sorts of people. Some do mock and despise him, and scarce any will set him on work. He is now seven times worse than if he had never gone out of the city. But why should they be so set against him, since they also despise the way that he forsook? Oh, they say, hang him, he is a turncoat, he was not true to his profession. I think God has stirred up even his enemies to hiss at him and laugh at him, because he hath forsaken the way. Had you no talk with him before you came out? I met him once in the streets, but he leered away on the other side, 
as one ashamed of what he had done, so I spake not to him. Well, at my first setting out I had hopes of that man, but now I fear he will perish in the overthrow of the city, for it has happened to him according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. These are my fears of him too, but who can hinder that which will be? Well, neighbor faithful, said Christian, let us leave him and talk of things that more immediately concern ourselves. Tell me now what you have met with in the way as you came, for I know that you have met with some things, or else it may be writ for a wonder. I escaped the slough that I perceive you fell into, and got up to the gate without that danger. Only I met with one whose name is Wanton, that had liked to have done me a mischief. It was well you escaped her net. Joseph was hard put to it by her, and he escaped her as you did, but it had liked to have cost him his life. But what did she do to you? You cannot think, but that you know something. What a flattering tongue she had. She lay at me hard to turn aside with her, promising me all manner of enjoyment. Nay, she did not promise you the enjoyment of a good conscience. You know what I mean. Not the enjoyment of the soul, but of the body. Thank God you have escaped her. The abode of the Lord shall fall into her ditch. Nay, I do not know whether I did wholly escape her or no. Why, I suppose you did not consent to her desires? No, not to defile myself, for I remembered an old writing that I had seen which saith, Her steps take hold of hell. So I shut mine eyes, because I would not be bewitched with her looks. Then she railed on me, and I went my way. Did you meet with no other assault as you came? When I came to the foot of the hill called Difficulty, I met with a very aged man, who asked me what I was and whither bound. I told him that I was a pilgrim, going to the celestial city. Then said the old man, Thou lookest like an honest fellow. Wilt thou be content to dwell with me, for the wages that I shall give thee? Then I asked him his name, and where he dwelt. He said his name was Adam the First, and that he dwelt in the town of Deceit. I asked him then what was his work, and what the wages that he would give. He told me that his work was many delights, and his wages, that I should be his heir at last. I further asked him what house he kept, and what other servants he had. So he told me that his house was filled with all the dainties of the world, and that his servants were his own children. Then I asked him how many children he had. He said that he had but three daughters the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and that I should marry them if I would. Then I asked how long time he would have me live with him, and he told me, as long as he lived himself. Well, and what conclusion came the old man and you to at the last? Why, at first I found myself somewhat inclinable to go with the man, for I thought he spake very fair, but looking in his forehead, as I talked with him, I saw there written, Put off the old man with his deeds. And how then? Then it came burning hot into my mind, whatever he said and however he flattered, when he got home to his house, he would sell me for a slave. So I bid him forbear, for I would not come near the door of his house. Then he reviled me, and told me that he would send such a one after me that should make my way bitter to my soul. So I turned to go away from him, but... Just as I turned myself to go thence, I felt him take hold of my flesh and give me such a deadly twitch back that I thought he had pulled part of me after himself. This made me cry, O oh, wretched man! So I went up on my way up the hill. Now, when I had got about halfway up, I looked behind me and saw one coming after me, swift as the wind, so he overtook me just about the place where the settle stands. Just there, said Christian, did I sit down to rest me, but being overcome with sleep, I there lost this roll out of my bosom. But, good brother, hear me out. So soon as the man overtook me, he was but a word and a blow, for down he knocked me and laid me for dead. But when I was a little come to myself again, I asked him wherefore he served me so. He said, because of my secret inclining to Adam the first. And with that, he struck me another deadly blow on the breast and beat me down backwards, 
so I lay at his feet as dead as before. So when I came to myself again, I cried him mercy, but he said, I know not how to show mercy. And with that he knocked me down again. He had doubtless made an end of me, but that one came by and bid him forbear. Who was that that bid him forbear? I did not know him at first, but as he went by, I perceived the holes in his hands and his side. Then I concluded that he was our Lord, so I went up the hill. That man that overtook you was Moses. He spareth none, neither knoweth he how to show mercy to those that disobey his law. I know it very well. It was not the first time that he has met with me. It was he that came to me when I dwelt securely at home, and that told me he would burn my house over my head if I stayed there. But did you not see the house that stood there, on the top of the hill, on the side of which Moses met you? Yes, and the lions too, before I came at it. But for the lions, I think they were asleep, for it was about noon, and because I had so much of the day before me, I passed by the porter, and came down the hill. He told me indeed that he saw you go by, but I wished you had called at the house, for they would have showed you so many rarities that you would scarce have forgotten them to the day of your death. But pray, tell me, did you meet nobody in the Valley of Humility? Yes, I met with one discontent, who would willingly have persuaded me to go back again with him. His reason was, for that the valley was altogether without honor. He told me, moreover, that there to go was the way to disoblige all my friends, as pride, arrogancy, self-conceit, worldly glory, with others who he knew, as he said, would be very much offended if I had made such a fool of myself as to wade through this valley. Well, and how did you answer him? I told him that, although all these that he named might claim kindred of me, and that rightly, for indeed they were my relations according to the flesh, yet, since I became a pilgrim, they have disowned me, as I also have rejected them, and therefore they were to me now no more than if they had never been of my lineage. I told him, moreover, that as to this valley, he had quite misrepresented the thing, for before honor is humility, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Therefore, said I, I had rather go through this valley to the honor that was so accounted by the wisest, than choose that which he esteemed most worthy of our affections. Met you with nothing else in that valley? Yes, I met with shame, but of all the men that I met with in my pilgrimage, he, I think, bears the wrong name. The others would take no for an answer, at least after some words of denial. But this bold-faced shame would never have done. Why, what does he say to you? What? Why, he objected against religion itself. He said it was pitiful, low, sneaking business for a man to mind religion. He said that a tender conscience was an unmanly thing, and that for a man to watch over his words and ways, so as to tie himself from that liberty that the brave spirits of the times accustomed themselves unto, would make him the ridicule of all the people in our time. He objected also, that but a few of the mighty, rich or wise, were ever of my opinion, nor any of them neither, before they were persuaded to be fools, to venture the loss of all for nobody else knows what. He, moreover, objected the base and low estate and condition of those that were chiefly the pilgrims of the times in which they had lived, also their ignorance and want of understanding and all worldly knowledge. Yea, he did hold me to it at that rate also, about a great many more things than here I relate, as that it was a shame to sit whining and mourning under a sermon, and a shame to come sighing and groaning home, that it was a shame to ask my neighbor forgiveness for petty faults, or to give back what I had taken from any. He said also that religion made a man grow strange to the great, because of a few vices, which he called by finer names, and because religion made him own and respect the base, who were of the same religious company. And is not this, said he, a shame? And what did you say to him? Say, I could not tell what to say at first. Yea, he put me so to it that my blood came up in my face. Even this shame fetched it up, and had almost beat me quite off. But at last I began to consider that that which is highly esteemed among men 
is had in an abomination with God. And I thought again, this shame tells me what men are, but it tells me nothing what God or the word of God is. And I thought, moreover, that at the day of doom we shall not be doomed to death or life according to the spirits of the world, but according to the wisdom and law of the highest. Therefore, thought I, what God says is best, is best, though all the men in the world are against it. Seeing then that God prefers his religion, seeing God prefers a tender conscience, seeing that they make themselves fools for the kingdom of heaven are wisest, and that the poor man that loveth Christ is richer than the greatest man in the world that hates him. Shame, depart, thou art an enemy to my salvation. Shall I listen to thee against my sovereign Lord? How then shall I look at him in the face at his coming? Should I now be ashamed of his way and servants, how can I expect a blessing? But indeed, this shame was a bold villain. I could scarce shake him out of my company. Yea, he would be haunting of me, and continually whispering me in the ear with some one or other of the weak things that attend religion. But at last I told him it was in vain to attempt further in this business. For those things that he despised, in those did I see most glory. And so at last I got past this persistent one. And when I had shaken him off, then I began to sing. The trials that those men do meet withal, that are obedient to the heavenly call, are manifold and suited to the flesh, and come and come and come again afresh, that now or sometime else we by them may be taken, overcome, and cast away. Oh, let the pilgrims, let the pilgrims then be vigilant and quit themselves like men. I am glad, my brother, that thou didst withstand this villain so bravely, for of all, as thou sayest, I think he has the wrong name, for he is so bold as to follow us in the streets and to attempt to put us to shame before all men, that is, to make us ashamed of that which is good. But if he was not himself bold, he would never attempt to do as he does. But let us still resist him, for notwithstanding all his bold words, he promoteth the fool and none else. The wise shall inherit glory, said Solomon, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. I think we must cry to him for help against shame, who would have us to be valiant for truth upon the earth. You say true, but did you meet nobody else in that valley? No, not I. For I had sunshine all the rest of the way through that, and also through the valley of the shadow of death. It was well for you. I am sure it fared far otherwise with me. I had for a long season, as soon almost as I entered into that valley, a dreadful combat with that foul fiend Apollyon. Yea, I thought verily he would have killed me, especially when he got me down and crushed me under him, as if he would have crushed me to pieces. For as he threw me, my sword flew out of my hand. Nay, he told me he was sure of me, and I cried to God, and he heard me, and delivered me out of all my troubles. Then I entered into the valley of the shadow of death, and had no light for almost half the way through it. I thought I should have been killed there over and over, but at last day broke, and the sun rose, and I went through that which was behind with far more ease and quiet. Moreover, I saw in my dream that, as they went on, Faithful, as he chanced to look on one side, saw a man, whose name is Talkative, walking at a distance beside them. For in this place there was room enough for them all to walk. He was a tall man, and something better looking at a distance than near at hand. To this man Faithful spoke himself in this manner. Friend, whither away? Are you going to the heavenly country? I am going to that same place. That is well. Then I hope we may have your good company. With a very good will, will I be your companion? Come on, then, and let us go together and let us spend our time in talking of things that are profitable. To talk of things that are good to me is very acceptable, with you or with any other, and I am glad that I have met with those that incline to so good a work. For, to speak the truth, there are but few who care thus to spend their time as they are in their travels, but choose much rather to be speaking of things to no profit, and this has been a trouble to me. That is indeed a thing to be lamented, 
For what things so worthy of the use of the tongue and mouth of men on earth, as are the things of the God of heaven? I like you wonderfully well, for your saying is full of the truth. And I will add, what thing is so pleasant, and what so profitable, as to talk of the things of God? What thing so pleasant? That is, if a man hath any delight in things that are wonderful, for instance, if a man doth delight to talk of the history or the mystery of things, or if a man doth love to talk of miracles, wonders, or signs, where shall he find things written so delightful or so sweetly penned as in the Holy Scripture? That's true, but to be profited by such things in our talk should be that which we design. That is it that I said, for to talk of such things is most profitable. For by doing so a man may get knowledge of many things, as of the folly of earthly things and the benefit of things above. Besides, by this a man may learn what it is to turn from sin, to believe, to pray, to suffer, or the like. By this also a man may learn what are the great promises and comforts of the gospel to his own enjoyment. Further, by this a man may learn to answer false opinions, to prove the truth, and also to teach the ignorant. All this is true, and glad am I to hear these things from you. Alas, the want of this is the cause that so few understand the need of faith, and the necessity of a work of grace in their soul, in order to eternal life. But by your leave, heavenly knowledge of these is the gift of God. No man attaineth to them by human working, or only by the talk of them. All that I know very well, for a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. I could give you a hundred scriptures for the confirmation of this. Well then, said Faithful, what is that one thing that we shall at this time found our talk upon? What you will, I will talk of things heavenly or things earthly, things in life or things in the gospel, things sacred or things worldly, things past or things to come, things foreign or things at home, things necessary or things accidental, provided that all be done to our profit. Now did Faithful begin to wonder, and stepping to Christian, for he walked all this while by himself, he said to him, but softly, What a brave companion have we got! Surely this man will make a very excellent pilgrim. At this Christian modestly smiled, and said, This man with whom you are so taken will deceive with this tongue of his twenty of them that know him not. Do you know him, then? Know him, yes, better than he knows himself. Pray, what is he? His name is Talkative. He dwelleth in our town. I wonder that you should be a stranger to him, only I consider that our town is large. Whose son is he, and whereabout doth he dwell? He is the son of one Saywell. He dwelt in Prating Row, and is known to all that are acquainted with him by the name of Talkative of Prating Row, and notwithstanding his fine tongue, he is but a sorry fellow. Well, he seems to be a very pretty man. That is, to them that have not a thorough acquaintance with him, for he is best abroad. Near home he is ugly enough. Your saying that he is a pretty man brings to my mind what I have observed in the work of the painter, whose pictures show best at a distance, but very near more unpleasing. But I am ready to think you do but jest, because you smiled. God forbid that I should jest, though I smiled in this matter, or that I should accuse any falsely. I will give you a further discovery of him. This man is for any company and for any talk. As he talketh now with you, so will he talk when he is on the ale-bench, and the more drink he hath in his crown, the more of these things he hath in his mouth. Religion hath no place in his heart, or house, or conversation. All that he hath lieth in his tongue, and his religion is to make a noise therewith. Say you so? Then am I in this man greatly deceived? Deceived, you may be sure of it. Remember the proverb, they say and do not. 
But the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. He talketh of prayer, of turning to God, of faith, and of the new birth, but he knows but only to talk of them. I have been in his family, and have seen him both at home and abroad, and I know what I say of him is the truth. His house is as empty of religion as the white of an egg is of savour. There is there neither prayer nor sign of turning from sin, yea, the brute in his kind serves God far better than he. He is the very stain, reproach, and shame of religion to all that know him. It can hardly have a good word in all that end of the town where he dwells through him. Thus say the common people that know him, a saint abroad and a devil at home. His poor family finds it so. He is such a fault-finder, such a railer at, and so unreasonable with his servants, that they neither know how to do for or to speak to him. Men that have any dealings with him say it is better to deal with a Turk than with him, for fairer dealing they shall have at their hands. This talkative, if it be possible, will go beyond them, cheat, beguile, and overreach them. Besides, he brings up his sons to follow his steps. And if he findeth in any of them a foolish timorousness, for so he calls the first appearance of a tender conscience, he calls them fools and blockheads, and by no means will employ them in much, or speak to their commendation before others. For my part, I am of the opinion that he has, by his wicked life, caused many to stumble and fall, and will be, if God prevent it not, the ruin of many more. Well, my brother, I am bound to believe you, not only because you say you know him, but also because like a Christian you make your reports of men. For I cannot think you speak these things of ill will, but because it is even so as you say. Had I known him no more than you, I might perhaps have thought of him as at first you did. Yea, had he received this report only from those that are enemies to religion, I should have thought it had been a slander, a lot that often falls from bad men's mouths upon good men's names and professions. But all these things, yea, and a great many more as bad of my own knowledge, I can prove him guilty of. Besides, good men are ashamed of him. They can neither call him brother nor friend. The very naming of him among them makes them blush if they know him. Well, I see that saying and doing are two things, and hereafter I shall better observe the difference between them. They are two things indeed, and are as diverse as are the soul and the body. For as the body without the soul is but a dead carcass, so saying, if it be alone, is but a dead carcass also. The soul of religion is the practical part. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. This talkative is not aware of. He thinks that hearing and saying will make a good Christian, and thus he deceiveth his own soul. Hearing is but as the sowing of the seed. Talking is not sufficient to prove that fruit is indeed in the heart and life. Let us assure ourselves that at the day of doom men shall be judged according to their fruits. Well, I was not so fond of his company at first, but I am as sick of it now. What shall we do to be rid of him? Take my advice and do as I bid you, and you shall find that he will soon be sick of your company too, except God shall touch his heart and turn it. What would you have me to do? Why, go to him and enter into some serious conversation about the power of religion and ask him plainly, when he has approved of it, for that he will, whether this thing be set up in his heart, house, or conduct. Then the faithful stepped forward again and said to Talkative, Come, what cheer? How is it now? Thank you well. I thought we should have had a great deal of talk by this time. Well, if you will, we will fall to it now, and since you left it with me to state the question, let it be this, how doth the saving grace of God show itself when it is in the heart of man? I perceive, then, that our talk must be about the powers of things. Well, it is a very good question, and I shall be willing to answer you, and take my answer in brief thus. First... Where the grace of God is in the heart, it causeth there a great outcry against sin. Secondly, Nay, hold, let us consider of one at once. I think you should rather say, it shows itself by inclining the soul to hate its sin. Why, what difference is there between crying out against and hating sin? Oh, a great deal. A man may cry out against sin in order to appear good but he cannot hate it except by a real dislike for it. I have heard many cry out against sin in the pulpit, who yet can abide it well enough in the heart, house, and life. Some cry out against sin, 
even as the mother cries out against her child in her lap, when she calleth it a naughty girl, and then falls to hugging it and kissing it. You are trying to catch me, I perceive. No, not I. I am only for setting things right. But what is the second thing whereby you would prove a discovery of a work of God in the heart? Great knowledge of hard things in the Bible. This sign should have been first, but first or last it is also false. For knowledge, great knowledge, may be obtained in the mysteries of the gospel, and yet no work of grace in the soul. Yea, if a man have all knowledge, he may yet be nothing, and so consequently be no child of God. When Christ said, Do ye know all these things? And the disciples had answered, Yes, he added, Blessed are ye if ye do them. He doth not lay the blessing in the knowledge of them, but in the doing of them. For there is a knowledge that is not attended with doing. He that knoweth his master's will, and doeth it not. A man may know like an angel, and yet be no Christian. Therefore your sign of it is not true. Indeed, to know is a thing that pleaseth talkers and boasters, but to do is that which pleaseth God. You are trying to catch me again. This is not profitable. Well, if you please, name another sign of how this work of grace showeth itself where it is. Nor I, for I see we shall not agree. Well, if you will not, will you give me leave to do it? You may say what you please. God's work in the soul showeth itself either to him that hath it or to standers by. To him that has it, it is shown by making him see and feel his own sins. To others who are standing by it is shown by his life, a life of doing right in the sight of God. And now, sir, as to this brief account of the work of grace, and also the showing of it, if you have aught to object, object. If not, then give me leave to ask you a second question. Nay, my part is not now to object, but to hear. Let me, therefore, have your second question. It is this. Have you felt your own sins, and have you turned from them? And do your life and conduct show it the same? Or is your religion in word or in tongue, and not in deed and truth? Pray, if you incline to answer me in this, and say no more than you know the God above will say amen to and also nothing but what your conscience can approve you in. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Besides, to say I am thus and thus, when my conduct and all my neighbors tell me I lie, is great wickedness. Then Talkative at first began to blush, but recovering himself, thus he replied, The kind of discourse I did not expect. Nor am I disposed to give an answer to such questions, because I count not myself bound thereto, unless you take upon you to be a questioner. And though you should do so, yet I may refuse to make you my judge. But I pray, will you tell me why you ask me such questions? Because I saw you forward to talk, and because I knew not that you had aught else but notion. Besides, to tell you all the truth, I have heard of you that you are a man whose religion lies in talk, and that your life gives this your mouth profession to lie. They say you are a spot among Christians, and that religion fareth the worse for your ungodly conduct, that some have already stumbled at your wicked ways, and that more are in danger of being destroyed thereby. Your religion and an alehouse, and greed for gain, and uncleanness, and swearing, and lying, and vain company-keeping, etc., will stand together. You are ashamed to all who are members of the church. Since you are ready to take up reports, and to judge so rashly as you do, I cannot but conclude you are some peevish or cross man, not fit to be talked with, and so adieu. Then up came Christian, and said to his brother, I told you how it would happen. Your words in his heart could not agree. He had rather leave your company than reform his life. But he is gone, as I said. Let him go. The loss is no man's but his own. He has saved us the trouble of going from him, for he, continuing as I suppose he will do, as he is, he would have been but a blot on our company. Besides, the apostle says, 
From such withdraw thyself. But I am glad we had this little talk with him. It may happen that he will think of it again. However, I have dealt plainly with him, and so am clear of his blood if he perisheth. You did well to talk so plainly to him as you did. There is but little of this faithful dealing with men nowadays, and that makes religion to be despised by so many, for they are these talkative fools whose religion is only in word and are vile and vain in their life, that being so much admitted into the fellowship of the godly, do puzzle the world, blemish Christianity, and grieve the sincere. I wish that all men would deal with such as you have done. Then should they either be made more suitable to religion, or the company of saints would be too hot for them. Then did faithful say, How talkative at first lifts up his plumes! How bravely doth he speak, how he presumes, To drive down all before him but so soon, As faithful talks of hard work like the moon, That's past the full into the wane he goes, And so will all but he who'd hard work knows. Thus they went on, talking of what they had seen by the way, and so made that way easy, which would otherwise, no doubt, have been tedious to them. For now they went through a wilderness. End of Part 1, Chapter 5《The Pilgrim's Progress》Part One, Chapter Six. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, Part One, Chapter Six. Now, when they were got almost quite out of this wilderness, Faithful chanced to cast his eye back and espied one coming after him, and he knew him. Oh, said Faithful to his brother, what comes yonder? Then Christian looked, and said, It is my good friend Evangelist. Aye, and my good friend too, said Faithful, for it was he that set me the way to the gate. Now was Evangelist come up unto them, and thus saluted them. Peace be with you, dearly beloved, and peace be to your helpers. Welcome, welcome, my good evangelist. The sight of thy face brings to my thought thy former kindness, and unwearied labouring for my eternal good. And a thousand times welcome, said good and faithful. Thy company, O sweet evangelist, how desirable it is to us poor pilgrims. Then said evangelist, How hath it fared with you, my friends, since the time of our last parting? What have you met with? And how have you behaved yourselves? Then Christian and Faithful told him of all things that had happened to them in the way, and how and with what difficulty they had arrived to that place. Right glad am I, said Evangelist, not that you met with trials, but that you have been victors, and for that you have, notwithstanding many weaknesses, continued in the way to this very day. I say, Right glad am I of this thing, and that for my own sake and yours. I have sowed, and you have reaped, and the day is coming when both he that sowed and they that reaped shall rejoice together. That is, if you faint not. The crown is before you, and it is an incorruptible one, so run that you may obtain it. Some there be that set out for this crown, and, after they have gone far for it, another comes in and takes it from them. Hold fast, therefore, that you have. Let no man take your crown. Then Christian thanked him for his words, but told him withal that they would have him speak further to them, for their help the rest of the way, and the rather, for that they well knew that he was a prophet, and could tell them of things that might happen unto them, and also how they might resist and overcome them. To which request Faithful also consented. So Evangelist began as followeth. My sons, you have heard in the words of the truth of the gospel that you must, through many trials, enter into the kingdom of heaven, and again, that in every city bonds and afflictions await you, and therefore you cannot expect that you should go long on your pilgrimage without them in some sort or other. 
you have found something of the truth of these words upon you already, and more will immediately follow. For now, as you see, you are almost out of this wilderness, and therefore you will soon come into a town that you will by and by see before you. And in that town you will be hardly beset with enemies who will strain hard, but they will kill you. And be you sure that one or both of you must seal the truth which you hold with blood. But be you faithful unto death, and the king will give you a crown of life. He that shall die there, though his death will be unnatural, and his pain perhaps great, he will yet have the better of his fellow, not only because he will be arrived at the celestial city soonest, but because he will escape many miseries that the other will meet with in the rest of his journey. But when you are come to the town, and shall find fulfilled what I have here related, then remember your friend, and quit yourselves like men and commit the keeping of your souls to God in well-doing, as unto a faithful Creator. Then I saw in my dream that when they were got out of the wilderness, they presently saw a town before them, and the name of that town is Vanity, and at that town there is a fair kept, called Vanity Fair. It is kept all the year long. It beareth the name of Vanity Fair, because the town where it is kept is lighter than vanity and also because all that is there sold, or that cometh thither, is vanity, as is the saying of the wise, All that cometh is vanity. This is no newly begun business, but a thing of ancient standing. I will show you the original of it. Almost five thousand years ago there were pilgrims walking to the celestial city as these two honest persons are, and Beelzebub, Apollyon, and Legion, with their companions, perceiving by the path of the pilgrims made that their way to the city lay through this town of vanity, they contrived here to set up a fair, a fair wherein should be sold all sorts of vanity, and that it should last all the year long. Therefore at this fair are all such things sold as houses, lands, trades, places, honors, preferments, titles, countries, kingdoms, lusts, pleasures, and delights of all sorts, as wives, husbands, children, masters, servants, lives, blood, bodies, souls, silver, gold, pearls, precious stones, and what not. And, moreover, at this fair there are at all times to be seen jugglings, cheats, games, plays, fools, apes, knaves, and rogues, and that of every kind. Here are to be seen, too, and that for nothing, thefts, murders, false swearers, and that of a blood-red color. And, as in other fairs of less moments, there are several rows and streets under their proper names, where such and such wares are vended. So here, likewise, you have the proper places, rows, streets, namely countries and kingdoms, where the wares of this fair are soonest to be found. Here are the Britain row, the French row, the Italian row, the Spanish row, the German row, where several sorts of vanities are to be sold. But, as in other fairs, some one commodity is as the chief of all the fair. So the wear of Rome and her goods are greatly promoted in this fair. Only our English nation, with some others, have taken dislike thereat. Now, as I said, the way to the celestial city lies just through this town where this lusty fair is kept, and he that would go to the city and yet not go through this town must needs go out of the world. The prince of princes himself, when here, went through this town to his own country, and that upon a fair day, too. Yea, and as I think, it was Beelzebub, the chief lord of this fair, that invited him to buy of his vanities. Yea, would have made him lord of the fair, would thee but have done him reverence as he went through the town. Yea, because he was such a person of honor, Beelzebub had him from street to street, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a little time, that he might, if possible, allure that blessed one to ask for and buy some of his vanities. But he had no mind to the merchandise and therefore left the town without laying out so much as one farthing upon these vanities. 
This fair, therefore, is an ancient thing of long standing, and a very great fair. Now, these pilgrims, as I said, must needs go through this fair. Well, so they did. But, behold, even as they entered into the fair, all the people in the fair were moved, and the town itself, as it were, in a hubbub about them, and that for several reasons. First, the pilgrims were clothed with such kind of garments as were different from the raiment of any that traded in that fair. The people, therefore, of the fair made a great gazing upon them. Some said they were fools, some they were bedlams, and some they were outlandish men. Secondly, and as they wondered at their apparel, so they did likewise at their speech, for few could understand what they said. They naturally spoke the language of Canaan, but they that kept the fair were men of this world, so that from one end of the fair to the other they seemed barbarians each to the other. Thirdly, but that which did not a little amuse the storekeepers was that these pilgrims set very light by all their wares. They cared not so much as to look upon them, and if they called upon them to buy, they would put their fingers in their ears and cry, Turn, Turn away mine eyes, eyes from beholding vanity, and look upwards, signifying that their trade and traffic were in heaven. One chanced, mockingly, beholding the actions of the men, to say unto them, What will you buy? But they, looking gravely upon him, said, We, we buy the, the truth. truth. At that there was an occasion taken to despise the men the more, some mocking, some taunting, some speaking reproachfully, and some calling on others to smite them. At last things came to a hubbub and great stir in the fair, insomuch that all order was confounded. Now was the word presently brought to the great one of the fair, who quickly came down and deputed some of his most trusty friends to take these men for trial, about whom the fair was almost overturned. So the men were brought to trial, and they that sat upon them asked them whence they came, whither they went, and what they did there in such unusual garb. The men told them that they were pilgrims and strangers in the world, and that they were going to their own country, which was the heavenly Jerusalem and that they had given no occasion to the men of the town, nor yet to the merchants, thus to abuse them, and to hinder them in their journey, except it was for that, when one asked them what they would buy, they said they would buy the truth. But they that were appointed to examine them did not believe them to be any other than crazy people and mad, or else such as came to put all things into a confusion in the fair. Therefore they took them and beat them, and besmeared them with dirt, and then put them into the cage, that they might be made a spectacle to all the men of the fair. There, therefore, they lay for some time, and were made the objects of any man's sport, or malice, or revenge, the great one of the fair laughing still at all that befell them. But the men being patient, and not rendering railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, and giving good words for bad, and kindness for injuries done, some men in the fair that were more observing and less opposed than the rest began to check and blame the baser sort for their continual abuses done by them to the men. They, therefore, in an angry manner, let fly at them again, counting them as bad as the men in the cage, and telling them that they seemed to be in league with them, and should be made partakers of their misfortunes. The others replied that, for aught they could see, the men were quiet and sober, and intended nobody any harm, and that there were many that traded in their fair that were more worthy to be put into the cage, yea, and pillory too, than were the men that they had abused. Thus, after diverse words had passed on both sides, the men behaving themselves all the while very wisely and soberly before them, they fell to some blows and did harm to one another. Then were these two poor men brought before the court again, and there charged as being guilty of the late hubbub that had been in the fair. So they beat them pitifully, and hanged irons upon them, and led them in chains up and down the fair, for an example and terror to others, lest any should speak in their behalf, or join themselves unto them. But Christian and the faithful behaved themselves yet more wisely, 
and received the wrongs and shame that were cast upon them with so much meekness and patience that it won to their side, though but few in comparison of the rest, several of the men in the fair. This put the other party in yet a greater rage, insomuch that they resolved upon the death of these two men. Wherefore they threatened that neither cage nor irons should serve their turn, but that they should die for the abuse they had done, and for deceiving the men of the fair. Then they were remanded to the cage again, until further order should be taken with them. So they put them in, and made their feet fast in the stocks. Here, therefore, they called again to mind what they had heard from their faithful friend Evangelist, and were more confirmed in their way and sufferings by what he told them would happen to them. They also now comforted each other that whose lot it was to suffer, even he should have the best of it. Therefore each man secretly wished he might have that privilege. But committing themselves to the all-wise disposal of him that ruleth all things, with much content they abode in the condition in which they were, until they should be otherwise disposed of. Then, a convenient time being appointed, they brought them forth to their trial, in order to their being condemned. When the time was come, they were brought before their enemies, and placed on trial. The judge's name was Lord Hategood. The charges against both were one and the same in substance, though somewhat varying in form. The contents whereof were this. That they were enemies to and disturbers of their trade, that they had made riots and divisions in the town, and had won a party to their own most dangerous opinions, in contempt of the law of their prince. Then Faithful began to answer, that he had only set himself against that which had set itself against him that is higher than the highest. And, said he, as for disturbances, I make none, being myself a man of peace. The parties that were won to us were won by beholding our truth and innocence, and they are only turned from the worst to the better. And as to the king you talk of, since he is Beelzebub, the enemy of our Lord, I defy him and all his angels. Then it was made known that they that had aught to say for their lord the king against the prisoner at the bar should forthwith appear and give in their evidence. So there came in three witnesses, to wit, envy, superstition, and pick-thank. They were then asked if they knew the prisoner at the bar, and what they had to say for their lord the king against him. Then stood forth envy, and said, to this effect, My lord, I have known this man a long time, and will attest upon my oath before this honourable bench that he is hold. Give him his oath. So they swear him. Then said he, My lord, this man, notwithstanding his name, faithful is one of the vilest men in our country. He cares for neither prince nor people, law nor custom, but doth all that he can to possess all men with certain of his disloyal notions, which he in the general calls principles of faith and holiness. And in particular, I heard him once myself affirm that Christianity and the customs of our town of vanity were opposites, and could not be reconciled, by which saying, my lord, he doth at once not only condemn all our laudable doings, but us in the doing of them. Then did the judge say to him, Hast thou any more to say? My lord, I could say much more, only I would not be tiresome to the court. Yet, if need be, when the other gentlemen have given in their evidence, rather than anything shall be wanting, that I will dispatch him, I will have more to speak against him. So he was bid stand by. Then they called superstition, and bade him look upon the prisoner. They also asked what he could say for their lord the king against him. Then they swear him. So he began, My lord, I have no great acquaintance with this man, nor do I desire to have further knowledge of him. However, this I know, that he is a very pestilent fellow, from some discourse the other day that I had with him in his town. For then, talking with him, I heard him say that our religion was marked, and such by which a man could by no means please God. Which saying of his, my lord, your lordship very well knows what necessarily thence will follow. To wit, that we still do wish in vain, are yet in our sins, and finally shall be destroyed. And is that what I have to say? 
Then was Pickthank sworn, and bid say what he knew, in behalf of their lord the king, against the prisoner at the bar. My lord, and you gentlemen all, this fellow I have known a long time, and have heard him speak things that ought not to be spoken, for he hath railed on our noble prince Beelzebub, and hath spoken contemptuously of his honorable friends, whose names are the Lord Old Man, the Lord Carnal Delight, the Lord Luxurious, the Lord Desire of Vainglory, my old Lord Lust, Sir Having Greedy, with all the rest of our nobility, and he hath said, moreover, that if all men were of his mind, if possible, there is not one of these noblemen should have any longer a being in this town. Besides, he has not been afraid to rail on you, my lord, who are now appointed to be his judge, calling you an ungodly villain, with many other such like abusive terms, with which he hath bespattered most of the gentry out of our town. When this Pickthank had told his tale, the judge directed his speech to the prisoner at the bar, saying, Thou renegade, heretic, and traitor, hast thou heard what these honest gentlemen have witnessed against thee? May I speak a few words in my own defense? Sirrah, sirrah, thou deservest to live no longer, but to be slain immediately upon the place. Yet, that all men may see our gentleness towards thee, let us hear what thou, vile renegade, hast to say. I say then, in answer to what Mr. Envy hath spoken, I have never said aught but this, that what rule, or laws, or custom, or people were flat against the word of God, are opposite to Christianity. If I have said amiss of this, convince me of my error, and I am ready here before you to take back my words. As to the second, to wit, Mr. Superstition and his charge against me, I said only this, that in the worship of God there is required true faith. But there can be no true faith without a knowledge of the will of God. Therefore, whatever is thrust into the worship of God that is not agreeable to the word of God will not profit to eternal life. As to what Mr. Pickthank hath said, I say, avoiding terms, as that I am said to rail, and the like, that the prince of this town, with all the rabblement his attendants, by this gentleman named, are more fit for being in hell than in this town and country. And so the Lord have mercy upon me. Then the judge called to the jury, who all this while stood by to hear and observe, Gentlemen of the jury, you see this man about whom so great an uproar hath been made in this town. You have also heard what these worthy gentlemen have witnessed against him. Also you have heard his reply in confession. It lieth now in your breast to hang him or to save his life, but yet I think me to instruct you into our law. There was an act made in the days of Pharaoh, the great servant to our prince, that, lest those of a contrary religion should multiply and go too strong for him, their males should be thrown into the river. There was also an act made in the days of Nebuchadnezzar the Great, another of his servants, that whoever would not fall down and worship his golden image should be thrown into a fiery furnace. There was also an act made in the days of Darius, that whoso for some time called upon any god but him should be cast into the lion's den. No, the substance of these laws this rebel has spoken, not only in thought, which is not to be borne, but also in word and deed, which must, therefore, needs be intolerable. You see he disputeth against our religion, and for the reason that he hath confessed he deserveth to die the death. Then went the jury out whose names were Mr. Blind Man, Mr. No Good, Mr. Malice, Mr. Love Lust, Mr. Live Loose, Mr. Heady, Mr. High Mind, Mr. Enmity, Mr. Liar, Mr. Cruelty, Mr. Hate Light, and Mr. Implacable, who every one gave in his private voice against him among themselves, and afterwards unanimously concluded to bring him in guilty before the judge. And first among themselves, Mr. Blindman, the foreman, said, I see clearly that this man is a heretic. Then said Mr. No Good, Away with such a fellow from the earth. Aye, said Mr. Malice, For I hate the very look of him. Then said Mr. Lovelust, I could never endure him. Nor I, said Mr. Livloose, For he would always be condemning my way. Hang him, hang him, said Mr. Heady. A sorry scrub, said Mr. Highmind. My heart riseth against him, said Mr. Enmity. 
He is a rogue, said Mr. Lyre. Hanging is too good for him, said Mr. Cruelty. Let us dispatch him out of the way, said Mr. Hatelight. Then said Mr. Implacable, Might I have all the world given to me, I could not be reconciled to him. Therefore let us forthwith bring him in guilty of death. And so they did. Therefore he was presently condemned to be had from the place where he was to the place from whence he came, and there to be put to the most cruel death that could be invented. They therefore brought him out to do with him according to their law, and first they scourged him, then they buffeted him, then they lanced his flesh with knives. After that they stoned him with stones, then pricked him with their swords, and last of all, they burned him to ashes at the stake. Thus came Faithful to his end. Now I saw that there stood behind the multitude a chariot and a couple of horses waiting for Faithful, who, so soon as his enemies had slain him, was taken up into it, and straightway was carried up through the clouds, with sound of trumpets, the nearest way to the celestial gate. But as for Christian, he had some delay, and was sent back to prison. So he there remained for a space. But he who overrules all things, having the power of their rage in his own hand, so wrought it about that Christian for that time escaped them, and went his way. And as he went he sang, saying, Well, faithful, thou hast faithfully professed unto thy Lord with whom thou shalt be blessed, when faithless ones with their vain delights are crying out under their hellish plights, Sing, faithful, sing, and let thy name survive, for though they killed thee, thou art yet alive. End of Part 1, Chapter 6《The Pilgrim's Progress》Part One, Chapter Seven. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Pilgrim's Progress》by John Bunyan, Part One, Chapter Seven. Now I saw in my dream that Christian went forth not alone, for there was one whose name was Hopeful, being so made by looking upon Christian and Faithful in their words and behaviour in their sufferings at the fair who joined himself unto him, and, entering into a brotherly pledge, told him that he would be his companion. Thus one died to show faithfulness to the truth, and another rises out of his ashes to be a companion with Christian in his pilgrimage. This hopeful also told Christian that there were many more of the men in the fair that would take their time and follow after. So I saw that quickly after they got out of the fair, they overtook one that was going before them, whose name was By Ends. So they said to him, What countryman, sir? And how far go you this way? He told them that he came from the town of Fair Speech, and he was going to the celestial city, but told them not his name. From Fair Speech? Are there any that be good live there? Yes, said By Ends. I hope. Pray, sir, what may I call you? I am a stranger to you, and you to me. If you be going this way, I shall be glad of your company. If not, I must be content. This town of fair speech, I have heard of it, and, as I remember, they say it's a wealthy place. Yes, I will assure you that it is, and I have very many rich kindred there. Pray, who are your kindred there, if a man may be so bold? almost the whole town, but in particular my lord Turnabout, my lord Time Server, my lord Fair Speech, from whose ancestors that town first took its name, also Mr. Smooth Man, Mr. Facing Both Ways, Mr. Anything, and the parson of our parish, Mr. Two Tongues, was my mother's own brother by father's side, and to tell you the truth, I am become a gentleman of good quality, yet my great-grandfather was but a waterman, looking one way and rowing another, and I got most of my estate by the same occupation. Are you a married man? Yes, and my wife is a very virtuous woman, 
the daughter of a virtuous woman. She was my lady Feigning's daughter. Therefore she came of a very honourable family, and is arrived to such a pitch of breeding that she knows how to carry it all, even to prince and peasant. Tis true we somewhat differ in religion from those of the stricter sort, yet but in two small points. First, we never strive against wind and tide. Secondly, we are always most zealous when religion is well dressed and goes in his silver slippers. We love much to walk with him in the street if the sun shines and the people praise him. Then Christian stepped a little aside to his fellow, hopeful, saying, It runs in my mind that this is one by ends of fair speech, and if it be he, we have as very a knave in our company as dwelleth in all these parts. Then said Hopeful, Ask him, methinks he should not be ashamed of his name. So Christian came up with him again, and said, Sir, you talk as if you knew something more than all the world doth, and if I take not my mark amiss, I deem I have half a guess of you. Is not your name Mr. Byens of Fair Speech? This is not my name, but, indeed, it is a nickname that is given me by some that cannot abide me and I must be content to bear it as a reproach, as other good men have borne theirs before me. But did you never give an occasion to men to call you by this name? Never, never. The worst that ever I did to give them an occasion to give me this name was that I had always the luck to jump in my judgment with the present way of the times, whatever it was, and my chance was to gain thereby. But if things are thus cast upon me, let me count them a blessing. But let not the malicious load me therefore with reproach. I thought indeed that you were the man that I heard of, and to tell you what I think, I fear this name belongs to you more properly than you are willing we should think it doth. Well, if you will thus imagine, I cannot help it. You shall find me a fair company keeper, if you still admit me your companion. If you will go with us, you must go against wind and tide, the which I perceive is against your opinion. You must also own religion in his rags, as well as when in his silver slippers, and stand by him too when bound in irons, as well as when he walketh the streets with applause. You must not impose or lord it over my faith. Leave it to my liberty, and let me go with you. Not a step further, unless you will do in what I declare as we do. Then said by ends, I never desert my old principles, since they are harmless and profitable. If I may not go with you, I must do as I did before you overtook me, even go by myself, until some overtake me that will be glad of my company. Now I saw in my dream that Christian and Hopeful forsook him, and kept their distance before him. But one of them, looking back, saw three men following Mr. By-Ends, and behold, as they came up with him, he made them a very low bow, and they also gave him a compliment. The men's names were Mr. Hold the World, Mr. Money Love, and Mr. Save All, men that Mr. By-Ends had been formerly acquainted with for in their boyhood they were schoolfellows, and taught by one Mr. Gripeman, a schoolmaster in Love Gain, which is a market town in the county of Coveting, in the north. This schoolmaster taught them the art of getting, either by violence, cheating, flattery, lying, or by putting on a pretense of religion, and these four gentlemen had learned much of the art of their master, so that they could each of them have kept such a school themselves. Well, when they had, as I said, thus saluted each other, Mr. Moneylove said to Mr. By-Ends, Who are they upon the road before us? For Christian and Hopeful were yet within view. They are a couple of far countrymen that, after their mode, are going on pilgrimage. Alas, why did they not stay that we might have had their good company? For they, and we, and you, sir, I hope, are all going on pilgrimage. We are so, indeed. But the men before us are so rigid 
and love so much their own notions, and do also so lightly esteem the opinions of others, that, let a man be ever so godly, yet, if he agrees not with them in all things, they thrust him quite out of their company. That is bad. But we read of some that are righteous overmuch, and such men's rigidness makes them judge and condemn all but themselves. But I pray, what and how many were the things wherein you differed? Why they, after their headstrong manner, conclude that it is their duty to rush on their journey all weathers, and I am for waiting for wind and tide. They are for taking the risk of all for God at a clap. I am for taking all advantages to secure my life and property. They are for holding their notions, though all other men be against them. But I am for religion in what and so far as the times and my safety will bear it. They are for religion when in rags and contempt. But I am for him when he walks in his golden slippers, in the sunshine, and with applause. Ay, and hold you there still, good Mr. Byens, for, for my part, I can count him but a fool, that, having the liberty to keep what he has, shall be so unwise as to lose it. Let us be wise as serpents. It is still best to make hay while the sun shines. You see how the bee lieth still all winter, and bestirs her only when she can have profit and pleasure. God sends sometimes rain, and sometimes sunshine. If they be such fools to go through the rain, yet let us be content to take fair weather along with us. For my part, I like that religion best that will stand with the safety of God's good blessings unto us. For who can imagine that is ruled by his reason, since God has bestowed upon us the good things of this life, but that he would have us keep them for his sake? Abraham and Solomon grew rich in religion, and Job says that a good man should lay up gold as dust, but he must not be such as the man before us, if they be as you have described them. I think, sir, we are all agreed in this matter, and therefore there needs no more words about it. No, there needs no more words about this matter indeed, for he that believes neither scripture nor reason, and you see we have both on our side, neither knows his own liberty nor seeks his own safety. And so these four men, Mr. Byens, Mr. Moneylove, Mr. Saveall, and old Mr. Hold the World, walked on together, while Christian and Hopeful were far in advance. Then Christian and Hopeful went on till they came to a delicate plain, called Ease, where they went with much content. But that plain was but narrow, so they were quickly got over it. Now at the farther side of that plain was a little hill, called Lucre, and in that hill a silver mine, which some of them that had formerly gone that way, because of the rarity of it, had turned aside to see. But going too near the brink of the pit, the ground, being deceitful under them, broke, and they were slain. Some also had been maimed there, and could not to their dying day be their own men again. Then I saw in my dream that a little off the road, over against the silver mine, stood Damas, gentlemanlike, to call to passengers to come and see, who said to Christian and his fellow, Ho, oh, turn aside hither, and I will show you a thing. What thing so deserving as to turn us out of the way? Here is a silver mine, and some digging in it for treasure. If you will come with a little pains, you may richly provide for yourselves. Then said Hopeful, Let us go see. Not I, said Christian. I have heard of this place before now, and how many have there been slain, and besides, that treasure is a snare to those who seek it, for it hindereth them in their pilgrimage. Then Christian called to Damas, saying, Is not the place dangerous? Hath it not hindered many in their pilgrimage? Not very dangerous, except to those that are careless. But withal he blushed as he spake. Then said Christian to Hopeful, Let us not stir a step, but still keep on our way. I will warrant you when Byens comes up, 
If he hath the same invitation as we, he will turn in thither to see. No doubt thereof, for his principles lead him in that way, and a hundred to one, but he dies there. Then Damus called out again, saying, But will you not come over and see? Then Christian roundly answered, saying, Demas, thou art an enemy to the right ways of the Lord of this way, and hast been already condemned for thine own turning aside by one of his majesty's judges. And why seekest thou to have us condemned also? Besides, if we at all turn aside, our Lord the King will certainly hear thereof, and will there put us to shame, where we should stand with boldness before him. Damus cried again that he also was one of their company, a pilgrim like themselves, and that, if they would tarry a little, he also himself would walk with them. What is thy name? Is it not the same by the which I have called thee? Yes, my name is Demas. I am the son of Abraham. I know you. Gehazi was your great-grandfather, and Judas your father, and you have trod in their steps. It is but a devilish prank that thou usest. Thy father was hanged for a traitor, and thou deservest no better reward. Assure thyself that when we come to the king, we will tell him of this thy behaviour. Thus they went their way, but by this time Byans and his companions were come again within sight, and they at the first beck went over to Damas. Now whether they fell into the pit by looking over the brink thereof, or whether they went down to dig, or whether they were smothered in the bottom by the damps that commonly arise, of these things I am not certain. But this I observed, that they were never seen again in the way. Then sang Christian, by ends and silver Demas both agree. One calls the other runs that he may be, a sharer of this lucre, so these two take up in this world, and no further go. Now I saw that just on the other side of the plain the pilgrims came to a place where stood an old monument hard by the highway side, at the sight of which they were both concerned, because of the strangeness of the form thereof for it seemed to them as if it had been a woman changed into the shape of a pillar. Here, therefore, they stood looking and looking upon it, but could not for a time tell what they should make thereof. At last Hopeful espied, written above, upon the head thereof, a writing in an unusual hand. But he, being no scholar, called to Christian, for he was learned, to see if he could pick out the meaning. So he came, and after a little laying of letters together, he found the same to be this, Remember Lot's wife. So he read to his fellow, after which they both concluded that that was the pillar of salt to which Lot's wife was turned, for her looking back with a covetous heart when she was going from Sodom, which sudden and amazing sight gave them occasion for speaking thus. Ah, oh, my brother, this is a seasonable sight. It came just in time to us after the invitation which Demas gave us to come over to view the hill Lucre, and had we gone over as he desired us, and as thou wast inclining to do, my brother, we had, for aught I know, been made ourselves like this woman, a spectacle for those who shall come after to behold. I am sorry that I was so foolish, and am made to wonder that I am not now as Lot's wife, for wherein was the difference betwixt her sin and mine? She only looked back, and I had a desire to go see. Let God's goodness be praised, and let me be ashamed that ever such a thing should be in mine heart. Let us take notice of what we see here, for our help for time to come. This woman escaped one judgment, for she fell not by the destruction of Sodom. Yet she was destroyed by another, as we see. She is turned into a pillar of salt. What a mercy is it that neither thou, but especially I, am not made myself this example. This gives reason to us to thank God, to fear before him, and always to remember Lot's wife. I saw then that they went on their way to a pleasant river, which David the king called the river of God, but John the river of the water of life. Now their way lay just upon the bank of this river. Here, therefore, Christian and his companion walked with great delight. They drank also the water of the river, which was pleasant and enlivening to their weary spirits. Besides, on the banks of this river, on either side, were green trees that bore all manner of fruit, and the leaves of the trees were good for medicine. With the fruit of these trees they were also much delighted, and the leaves they ate to prevent illness, especially such diseases that come to those that heat their blood by travels. 
On either side of the river was also a meadow, curiously beautified with lilies, and it was green all the year long. In this meadow they lay down and slept, for here they might lie down safely. When they awoke, they gathered again of the fruit of the trees, and drank again of the water of the river, and they lay down again to sleep. This they did several days and nights. Then they sang, Behold ye how these crystal streams do glide, to comfort pilgrims by the highway side. The meadows green, besides their fragrant smell, yield dainties for them, and he who can tell. What pleasant fruit, yea, leaves, these trees do yield. We'll soon sell all, that he may buy this field. So when they were disposed to go on, for they were not as yet at their journey's end, they ate and drank and departed. Now I beheld in my dream that they had not journeyed far, but the river and the way for a time parted, at which they were not a little sorry, yet they durst not go out of the way. Now the way from the river was rough, and their feet tender by reason of their travels, so the souls of the pilgrims were much discouraged because of the way. Wherefore, still as they went on, they wished for a better way. Now a little before them there was, on the left hand of the road, a meadow, and a stile to go over into it, and that meadow was called Bypath Meadow. Then said Christian to his fellow, If this meadow lieth along by our wayside, let's go over it. Then he went to the stile to see, and, behold, a path lay along by the way on the other side of the fence. It is according to my wish, said Christian. Here is the easiest going. Come, good hopeful, and let us go over. But how if this path should lead us out of the way? That is not likely, said the other. Look, doth it not go along by the wayside? So hopeful, being persuaded by his fellow, went after him over the stile. When they were gone over, and were got into the path, they found it very easy to their feet, and withal they, looking before them, espied a man walking as they did, and his name was Vain Confidence. So they called after him, and asked him whither that way led. He said, To the celestial gate. Look, said Christian, did I not tell you so? By this you may see we are right. So they followed, and he went before them. But, behold, the night came on, and it grew very dark, so that they that were behind lost sight of him that went before. He, therefore, that went before, vain confidence by name, not seeing the way before him, fell into a deep pit, which was on purpose there made by the prince of those grounds to catch careless fools, withal, and was dashed in pieces with his fall. Now Christian and his fellow heard him fall, so they called to know the matter, but there was none to answer, only they heard a groaning. Then said Hopeful, Where are we now? Then was his fellow silent, as mistrusting that he had led him out of the way, and now it began to rain and thunder and lighten in a most dreadful manner, and the water rose again. Then Hopeful groaned in himself, saying, Oh, that I had kept on my way! Who could have thought that this path should have led us out of the way? I was afraid on it at the very first, and therefore gave you that gentle caution. I would have spoken plainer, but that you are older than I. Good brother, be not offended. I am very sorry I have brought thee out of the way, and that I have put thee into such great danger. Pray, my brother, forgive me. I did not do it of any evil intent. Be comforted, my brother, for I forgive thee and believe, too, that this shall be for our good. I am glad I have with me a merciful brother, but we must not stand still. Let us try to go back again. But, good brother, let me go before. No, if you please, let me go first, that if there be any danger I may be first therein, because by my means we are both gone out of the way. No, you shall not go first, for your mind being troubled may lead you out of the way again. Then, for their encouragement, they heard the voice of one saying, Let thine heart be towards the highway, even the way that thou wentest, turn again. But by this time the waters were greatly risen, by reason of which the way of going back was very dangerous. Then I thought that it is easier going out of the way when we are in, 
than going in when we are out. Yet they undertook to go back, but it was so dark and the flood so high that, in their going back, they had liked to have been drowned nine or ten times. Neither could they, with all the skill they had, get again to the stile that night. Wherefore, at last, lighting under a little shelter, they sat down there until daybreak, but being weary, they fell asleep. Now there was, not far from the place where they lay, a castle, called Doubting Castle, the owner whereof was Giant Despair, and it was in his grounds they now were sleeping. Wherefore he, getting up in the morning early, and walking up and down in his fields, caught Christian and Hopeful asleep in his grounds. Then, with a grim and surly voice, he bid them awake, and asked them whence they were, and what they did in his grounds. They told him they were pilgrims, and that they had lost their way. Then said the giant, You have this night trespassed on me, by trampling in and lying on my grounds, and therefore you must go along with me. So they were forced to go, because he was stronger than they. They had also but little to say, for they knew themselves in fault. The giant, therefore, drove them before him, and put them into his castle, into a very dark dungeon, nasty and smelling vilely to the spirits of those two men. Here, then, they lay from Wednesday morning till Saturday night, without one bit of bread or drop of drink or light or any to ask how they did. They were, therefore, here in evil case, and were far from friends and people whom they knew. Now, in this place Christian had double sorrow, because it was through his thoughtless haste that they were brought into this distress. Now, Giant Despair had a wife, and her name was Diffidence. So, when he was gone to bed, he told his wife what he had done, to wit, that he had taken a couple of prisoners and cast them into his dungeon for trespassing on his grounds. Then he asked her also what he had best to do further to them. So she asked them what they were, whence they came, and whither they were bound, and he told her. Then she advised him that when he arose in the morning he should beat them without any mercy. So when he arose he getteth him a grievous crab-tree cudgel, and goes down into the dungeon to them, and there first fell to abusing them as if they were dogs, although they never gave him a word of distaste. Then he falls upon them and beats them fearfully, in such sort that they were not able to help themselves or to turn them upon the floor. This done, he withdraws and leaves them there to sorrow over their misery and to mourn under their distress. So all that day they spent their time in nothing but sighs and bitter grief. The next night she, talking with her husband about them further, and understanding that they were yet alive, did advise him to tell them to make away with themselves. So, when morning was come, he goes to them in a surly manner, as before, and perceiving them to be very sore with the stripes that he had given them the day before, he told them that since they were never like to come out of that place, their only way would be forthwith to make an end of themselves, either with knife, halter, or poison. For why? said he. Should you choose life, seeing he is attended with so much bitterness? But they desired him to let them go. With that he looked ugly upon them, and rushing to them had doubtless made an end of them himself, but that he fell into one of his fits, for he sometimes in sunshiny weather fell into fits, and lost for a time the use of his hands, wherefore he withdrew and left them as before to consider what to do. Then did the prisoners consult between themselves whether it was best to take his advice or no, and thus they began to discourse. Brother, said Christian, what shall we do? The life we now live is miserable. For my part I know not whether it is best to live thus or to die out of hand. My soul chooseth strangling rather than life, and the grave is more easy for me than this dungeon. Shall we be ruled by the giant? Indeed. Our present condition is dreadful, and death would be far more welcome to me than thus forever to abide. But yet, let us think. The lord of the country to which we are going hath said, Thou shalt do no murder. No, not to another man's person. 
much more then are we forbidden to take his advice to kill ourselves. Besides, he that kills another can but commit murder upon his body, but for one to kill himself is to kill body and soul at once. And moreover, my brother, thou talkest of ease in the grave, but hast thou forgotten the hell, whither for certain the murderers go? For no murderer hath eternal life. And let us consider again, that all the law is not in the hand of giant despair. Others, so far as I can understand, have been taken by him as well as we, and yet have escaped out of his hand. Who knows but that God, who made the world, may cause that giant despair may die, or that, at some time or other, he may forget to lock us in, or that he may, in a short time, have another of his fits before us, and he may lose the use of his limbs. And, if ever that should come to pass again, for my part, I am resolved to pluck up the heart of a man, and try to my utmost to get from under his hand. I was a fool that I did not try to do it before. But however, my brother, let us be patient and endure a while. The time may come that may give us a happy release, but let us not be our own murderers. With these words, Hopeful at present did calm the mind of his brother. So they continued together in the dark that day, in their sad and doleful condition. Well, towards evening, the giant goes down into the dungeon again to see if his prisoners had taken his counsel. But when he came there, he found them alive, and truly alive was all. For now, what for want of bread and water, and by reason of the wounds they received when he beat them, they could do little but breathe. But, I say, he found them alive at which he fell into a grievous rage, and told them that, seeing they had disobeyed his counsel, it should be worse with them than if they had never been born. At this they trembled greatly, and I think that Christian fell into a swoon. But coming a little to himself again, they renewed their discourse about the giant's advice, and whether yet they had best to take it or no. Now Christian again seemed for doing it, but Hopeful made his second reply as followeth. My brother, said he, rememberest thou not how valiant thou hast been heretofore? Apollyon could not crush thee, nor could all that thou didst hear, or see, or feel in the valley of the shadow of death. What hardship, terror, and amazement hast thou already gone through, and art thou now nothing but fear? Thou seest that I am in the dungeon with thee, a far weaker man by nature than thou art. Also, this giant has wounded me as well as thee, and hath also cut off the bread and water from my mouth. And with thee I mourn without the light. But let us have a little more patience. Remember how thou showest thyself the man at Vanity Fair, and wast neither afraid of the chain, nor cage, nor yet of bloody death. Wherefore, let us, at least to avoid the shame that it becomes not a Christian to be found in, bear up with patience as well as we can. Now, night being come again, and the giant and his wife being in bed, she asked him concerning the prisoners, and if they had taken his advice, to which he replied, They are sturdy rogues. They choose rather to bear all hardship than to make away with themselves. Then said she, Take them under the castle yard tomorrow, and show them the bones and skulls of those that thou hast already killed, and make them believe, ere a week comes to an end, thou wilt tear them also in pieces, as thou hast done their fellows before them. So when the morning was come, the giant goes to them again, and takes them into the castle yard, and shows them as his wife had bidden them. These, said he, were pilgrims, as you are. Once, and they trespassed in my grounds, as you have done. And when I thought fit, I tore them in pieces, and so within ten days I will do you. Go, get down to your den again. And with that he beat them all the way thither. They lay, therefore, all day on Saturday in a lamentable case as before. Now, when night was come, and when Mrs. Diffidence and her husband, the giant, were got to bed, they began to renew their talking of their prisoners, and withal the old giant wondered that he could neither by his blows nor counsel bring them to an end, and with that his wife replied, 
I fear, said she, that they live in hope that some will come to relieve them, or that they have picklocks about them, by the means of which they hope to escape. And sayest thou so, my dear, said the giant, I will therefore search them in the morning. Well, on Saturday, about midnight, they began to pray, and continued in prayer till almost break of day. Now, a little before it was day, good Christian, as one half amazed, break out into this earnest speech. What a fool, quoth he, am I to lie in a foul-smelling dungeon when I may as well walk at liberty? I have a key in my bosom called Promise that will, I am sure, open any lock in Doubting Castle. Then said Hopeful, That is good news, good brother. Pluck it out of thy bosom and try. Then Christian pulled it out of his bosom, and began to try at the dungeon door, whose bolt, as he turned the key, gave back, and the door flew open with ease, and Christian and Hopeful both came out. Then he went to the outward door that leads into the castle yard, and with his key opened that door also. After he went to the iron gate, for that must be opened too, but that lock went exceedingly hard, yet the key did open it. Then they thrust open the gate to make their escape with speed, but that gate, as it opened, made such a creaking that it waked giant despair, who, hastily rising to pursue his prisoners, felt his limbs to fail, for his fits took him again, so that he could by no means go after them. Then they went on, and came to the king's highway again, and so were safe, because they were out of giant despair's rule. Now, when they were gone over the stile, they began to contrive with themselves what they should do at that stile to prevent those that should come after from falling into the hands of giant despair. So they agreed to build there a pillar, and to engrave upon the side thereof this sentence. Over this stile is the way to Doubting Castle, which is kept by giant despair, who despises the king of the celestial country, and seeks to destroy his holy pilgrims. Many, therefore, that followed after, read what was written, and escaped the danger. This done, they sang as follows. Out of the way we went, and then we found what twas to tread upon forbidden ground, and let them that come after have a care, lest heedlessness make them as we to fare. Lest they for trespassing his prisoners are, whose castles doubting, and whose names despair. End of Part 1, Chapter 7《The Pilgrim's Progress》Part 1, Chapter 8 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Pilgrim's Progress》by John Bunyan Part 1, Chapter 8 They went then till they came to the delectable mountains, which mountains belong to the lord of that hill of which we have spoken before. So they went up to the mountains to behold the gardens and orchards, the vineyards and fountains of water, where they also drank and washed themselves, and did freely eat of the vineyards. Now there were on the tops of these mountains shepherds feeding their flocks, and they stood by the highway side. The pilgrims therefore went to them, and leaning upon their staves, as is common with weary pilgrims when they stand to talk with any by the way, they asked, Whose delightful mountains are these, and whose be the sheep that feed upon them? These mountains are Emmanuel's land, and they are within sight of his city. And the sheep also are his, and he laid down his life for them. Is this the way to the celestial city? You are just in your way. How far is it thither? Too far for any but those who shall get thither indeed. Is the way safe or dangerous? Safe for those for whom it is to be safe, but sinners shall fall therein. Is there in this place any relief for pilgrims that are weary and faint in the way? 
The Lord of these mountains hath given us a charge not to be forgetful to care for strangers. Therefore the good of the place is before you. I saw also in my dream that when the shepherds perceived that they were wayfaring men, they also put questions to them, to which they made answer, as in other places, as, Whence came you? And, How got you into the way? And, By what means have you so persevered therein? For but few of them that begin to come hither do show their faces on these mountains. But when the shepherds heard their answers, being pleased therewith, they looked very lovingly upon them, and said, Welcome to the delectable mountains. The shepherds, I say, whose names are knowledge, experience, watchful, and sincere, took them by the hand, and took them to their tents, and made them partake of what was ready at present. They said, moreover, We would that you should stay here a while, to be acquainted with us, and yet more to cheer yourselves with the good of these delectable mountains. They then told them that they were content to stay, so they went to rest that night, because it was very late. Then I saw in my dream that in the morning the shepherds called up Christian and Hopeful to walk with them upon the mountains. So they went forth with them and walked a while, having a pleasant prospect on every side. Then said the shepherds one to another, Shall we show these pilgrims some wonders? So when they had concluded to do it, they had them first to the top of the hill called Error, which was very steep on the farthest side and bid them look down to the bottom. So Christian and Hopeful looked down, and saw at the bottom several men dashed all to pieces by a fall they had had from the top. Then said Christian, What meaneth this? Then the shepherds answered, Have you not heard of them that were made to err, by hearkening to Himenius and Philetus, as concerning the faith of the rising from the dead? They answered, Yes. Then said the shepherds, Those you see lie dashed to pieces at the bottom of this mountain are they, and they have continued to this day unburied, as you see, for an example to others to take heed how they clamber too high or how they come too near the brink of this mountain. Then I saw that they had them to the top of another mountain, and the name of that is Caution, and bid them look afar off. And when they did, they perceived, as they thought, several men walking up and down among the tombs that were there. And they perceived that the men were blind, because they stumbled sometimes upon the tombs, and because they could not get out from among them. Then said Christian, What means this? The shepherds then answered, did you not see a little below these mountains a stile that led into a meadow on the left-hand side of this way? They answered, Yes. Then said the shepherds, From that stile there goes a path that leads directly to Doubting Castle, which is kept by giant despair. And these men, pointing to them among the tombs, came once on pilgrimage, as you do now, even until they came to that same style. And because the right way was rough in that place, they chose to go out of it into that meadow, and there were taken by giant despair, and cast into Doubting Castle, where, after they had been kept a while in the dungeon, he at last did put out their eyes, and led them among those tombs, where he has left them to wander to this very day, that the saying of the wise man might be fulfilled. He that wandereth out of the way of knowledge shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Then the Christian and Hopeful looked upon one another with tears gushing out, but yet said nothing to the shepherds. 
Then I saw in my dream that the shepherds had them to another place in the bottom, where was a door on the side of a hill, and they opened the door and bid them look in. They looked in, therefore, and saw that within it was very dark and smoky. They also thought that they heard there a rumbling noise, as of fire, and a cry of some tormented, and then they smelt the scent of brimstone. Then said Christian, What means this? The shepherds told them, This is a byway to hell, a way that hypocrites go in at namely, such as sell their birthright with Esau, such as sell their master with Judas, such as blaspheme the gospel with Alexander, and that lie and deceive with Ananias and Sapphira his wife. Then said Hopeful to the shepherds, I perceive that these had on them even every one a show of pilgrimage as we have now, had they not? Yes, and held it a long time, too. How far might they go on in pilgrimage in their day, since they, notwithstanding, were thus miserably cast away? Some farther, and some not so far as these mountains. Then said the pilgrims one to another, We, we have need, need to cry to the strong, strong for strength. strength. Aye and you will have need to use it when you have it, too. By this time the pilgrims had a desire to go forward, and the shepherds a desire they should. So they walked together towards the end of the mountains. Then said the shepherds one to another, Let us here show to the pilgrims the gate of the celestial city, if they have the skill to look through our perspective glass. The pilgrims then lovingly accepted the motion. So they had them to the top of a high hill called Clear, and gave them their glass to look. Then they tried to look, but the remembrance of that last thing that the shepherds had showed them made their hands shake, by means of which hindrance they could not look steadily through the glass. Yet they thought they saw something like the gate, and also some of the glory of the place. Thus they went away and sang this song. Thus by the shepherds secrets are revealed, which from all other men are kept concealed. Come to the shepherds then, if you would see, things deep, things hid, and that mysterious be. When they were about to depart, one of the shepherds gave them a note of the way, another of them bid them beware of the flatterer, the third bid them take heed that they slept not upon the enchanted ground, and the fourth bid them God speed. So I awoke from my dream. End of Part 1, Chapter 8《The Pilgrim's Progress, Part 1, Chapter 9. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, Part 1, Chapter 9. And I slept and dreamed again and saw the same two pilgrims going down the mountains along the highway towards the city. Now a little below these mountains, on the left hand, lieth the country of conceit, from which country there comes into the way in which the pilgrims walked a little crooked lane. Here, therefore, they met with a very brisk lad that came out of that country, and his name was Ignorance. So Christian asked him from what parts he came, and whither he was going. Sir, I was born in the country that lieth off there a little on the left hand, and I am going to the celestial city. But how do you think to get in at the gate, for you may find some difficulty there? As other people do. But what have you to show at the gate, that may cause that the gate should be open to you? I know my Lord's will, and have been a good liver. I pay every man his own, I pray, fast, pay money to the church, and give to the poor, and have left my country for whither I am going. 
But thou camest not in at the wicket gate that is at the head of this way. Thou camest in hither through that same crooked lane, and therefore I fear, however thou mayest think of thyself, when the reckoning day shall come, thou wilt have laid to thy charge that thou art a thief and a robber, instead of getting admittance into the city. Gentlemen, ye be utter strangers to me. I know you not be content to follow the custom of your country, and I will follow the custom of mine. I hope all will be well, and as for the gate that you talk of, all the world knows that that is a great way off of our country. I cannot think that any man in all our parts doth so much as know the way to it, nor need they matter whether they do or no, since we have, as you see, a fine, pleasant green lane that comes down from our country the next way into the way. When Christian saw that the man was wise in his own opinion, he said to Hopeful, whisperingly, There is more hope of a fool than of him, and said, Moreover, When he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to every one that he is a fool. What, shall we talk further with him, or outgo him at present, and so leave him to think of what he hath heard already, and then stop again for him afterwards, and see if by degrees we can do any good for him? Then said Hopeful, Let ignorance a little while now muse on what is said, and let him not refuse good counsel to embrace, lest he remain still ignorant of what's the chiefest gain. God saith, Those that no understanding have, although he made them, them he will not save. He further added, It is not good, I think, to say all to him at once. Let us pass him by, if you will, and talk to him by and by, even as he is able to bear it. So they both went on, and ignorance he came after. Now when they had passed him a little way, they entered into a very dark lane, where they met a man whom seven devils had bound with seven strong cords, and were carrying of him back to the door that they saw on the side of the hill. Now good Christian began to tremble, and so did Hopeful his companion. Yet, as the devils led away the man, Christian looked to see if he knew him, and he thought it might be one turnaway that dwelt in the town of apostasy. But he did not perfectly see his face, for he did hang his head like a thief that is found. But being gone past, Hopeful looked after him, and espied on his back a paper with this inscription. One who was wicked while claiming to be good, and turned away from God. Then said Christian to his fellow, Now I call to remembrance that which was told of a thing that happened to a good man hereabout. The name of that man was Little Faith, but a good man, and dwelt in the town of Sincere. The thing was this, at the entering in at this passage there comes down from Broadway Gate a lane called Dead Man's Lane, so called because of the murders that are commonly done there. And this little faith, going on pilgrimage as we do now, chanced to sit down there and slept. Now there happened at that time to come down that lane from Broadway Gate three sturdy rogues, and their names were Faint Heart, Mistrust, and Guilt, three brothers, and they, espying little faith where he was, came galloping up with speed. Now the good man was just awaked from his sleep, and was getting up to go on his journey. So they came up all to him, and with threatening language bid him stand. At this little Faith looked as white as a sheet, and had neither power to fight nor fly. Then said Faint Heart, Deliver thy purse. But he making no haste to do it, for he was loath to lose his money, Mistrust ran up to him, and thrusting his hand into his pocket, pulled out thence a bag of silver. Then he cried out, Thieves! Thieves! With that, Guilt, with a great club that was in his hand, struck Little Faith on the head, and with that blow felled him flat to the ground, where he lay bleeding as one that would bleed to death. All this while the thieves stood by, but at last, they hearing that some were upon the road, and fearing lest it should be one great grace that dwells in the city of good confidence, they betook themselves to their heels, and left this good man to shift for himself. Now after a while Little Faith came to himself, and getting up, made shift to scramble on his way. This was the story. But did they take from him all that he ever had? No, the place where his jewels were they never ransacked, so those he kept still. But, as I was told, the good man was much afflicted for his loss, for the thieves got most of his spending money. That which they got not, as I said, were jewels. Also he had a little odd money left, but scarce enough to bring him to his journey's end. 
Nay, if I was not misinformed, he was forced to beg as he went to keep himself alive, for his jewels he might not sell. But beg and do what he could, he went, as we say, often with a hungry stomach the most part of the rest of the way. But is it not a wonder they got not from him his certificate, by which he was to receive admission at the celestial gate? It is a wonder, but they got not that, though they missed it, not through any cunning of his, for he, being dismayed by their coming upon him, had neither power nor skill to hide anything. So it was more by good providence than by his endeavour that they missed that good thing. But it must needs be a comfort to him that they got not his jewels from him. It might have been great comfort to him had he used it as he should, but they that told me the story said that he made but little use of it all the rest of the way, and that because of the alarm that he had in their taking away his money, indeed he forgot it a great part of the rest of his journey, and besides, when at any time it came into his mind, and he began to be comforted therewith, then would fresh thoughts of his loss come again upon him, and those thoughts would swallow up all. Alas, poor man, this could not but be a great grief unto him. Grief, ay, a grief indeed. Would it not have been so to any of us had we been used as he, to be robbed and wounded too, and that in a strange place as he was? It is a wonder he did not die with grief, poor heart. I was told that he scattered almost all the rest of the way with nothing but doleful and bitter complaints, telling also to all that overtook him, or that he overtook in the way as he went, where he was robbed and how, who they were that did it and what he had lost, how he was wounded, and that he hardly escaped with his life. But it is a wonder that his necessities did not put him upon selling or pawning some of his jewels, that he might have wherewith to relieve himself in his journey. Thou talkest like one whose head is thick to this very day. For what should he pawn them, or to whom should he sell them? In all that country where he was robbed, his jewels were not accounted of, nor did he want that relief which could from thence be administered to him. Besides, had his jewels been missing at the gate of the celestial city, he had, and that he knew well enough, been shut out from an inheritance there, and that would have been worse to him than the coming and villainy of ten thousand thieves. But, Christian, these three fellows, I am persuaded in my heart, are but a company of cowards. Would they have run else, think you, as they did at the noise of one that was coming on the road? Why did not little faith pluck up a greater heart? He might, methinks, have stood one brush with them, and have yielded when there had been no remedy. That they are cowards, many have said, but few have found it so in the time of trial. As for a great heart, little faith had none. And I perceive by thee, my brother, hadst thou been the man concerned, thou art but for a brush, and then to yield. And verily, since this is the height of thy courage, now that they are a distance from us, should they appear to thee as they did to him, they might put thee to second thoughts. But consider again, they are but journeymen thieves. They serve under the king of the bottomless pit, who, if need be, will come into their aid himself, and his voice is as the roaring of a lion. I myself have been engaged as this little faith was, and I found it a terrible thing. These three villains set upon me, and I, beginning like a Christian to resist, they gave but a call, and in came their master. I would, as the saying is, have given my life for a penny, but that as God would have it I was clothed with the armour of proof. I, and yet though I was so protected, I found it hard work to quit myself like a man. No man can tell what in the combat attends us, but he that hath been in the battle himself. Well, but they ran, you see, when they did but suppose that one great grace was in the way. True, they have often fled, both they and their master, when great grace hath but appeared, and no marvel, for he is the king's champion. But I trow you will put some difference between little faith and the king's champion. All the king's subjects are not his champions, nor can they, when tried, do such feats of war as he. Is it meet to think that a little child should handle Goliath as David did? Or that there should be the strength of an ox and a wren? Some are strong, some are weak. Some have great faith, some have little. This man was one of the weak, and therefore he went to the wall. I would it had been great grace for their sakes. If it had been he, he might have had his hands full. For I must tell you that though great grace is excellent good at his weapons, and has and can so long as he keeps them at sword's point do well enough with them, yet if they get within them, even faint heart, mistrust or the other, it shall go hard, but they will throw up his heels. And when a man is down, you know, what can he do? Whoso looks well upon great grace's face will see those scars and cuts there that shall easily give proof of what I say. Yea, once I heard that he should say, and that when he was in the combat, we despaired even of life. How did these sturdy rogues and their fellows make David groan, mourn, and roar? Yea, He-Man and Hezekiah too, though champions in their days, were forced to bestir when by these attacked. And yet notwithstanding, they had their coats soundly brushed by them. 
Peter, upon a time, would go try what he could do, but though some do say of him that he is the prince of apostles, they handled him so that they made him at the last afraid of a sorry girl. Besides, their king is at their whistle, he is never out of hearing, and if at any time they be put to the worst, he, if possible, comes in to help them. And of him it is said, The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold, the spear, the dart, nor the virgin. He esteemeth iron as straw, and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee, sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble, he laugheth at the shaking of a spear. What can a man do in this case? It is true, if a man could at every turn have Job's horse, and had skill and courage to ride him, he might do notable things, for his neck is clothed with thunder. He will not be afraid as the grasshopper. The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He poureth in the valley, and rejoiceth in his strength. He goeth on to meet the armed men. He mocketh at fear, and is not affrighted, neither turneth he his back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him, the glittering spear and the shield. He swalloweth the ground with fierceness and rage, neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. He saith among the trumpets, Ha ha! And he smelleth the battle afar off, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. But for such footmen as thee and I are, let us never desire to meet with an enemy, nor vaunt as if we could do better when we hear of others that have been foiled, nor be tickled at the thoughts of our manhood, for such commonly come by the worst when tried. Witness Peter, of whom I made mention before, he would swagger, eh, he would, he would, as his vain mind prompted him to say, do better and stand more for his master than all men. But who so foiled and run down by those villains as he? Then the Christian sang, Poor little faith has been among the thieves, was robbed, remember this. Whoso believes and gets more faith shall then a victor be over ten thousand, else scarce over three. So they went on, and ignorance followed. They went then till they came to a place where they saw a way put itself into their way, and seemed withal to lie as straight as the way which they should go. And here they knew not which of the two to take, for both seemed straight before them. Therefore here they stood still to consider. And as they were thinking about the way, behold, a man, black of flesh, but covered with a very light robe, came to them, and asked them why they stood there. They answered they were going to the celestial city, but knew not which of these ways to take. Follow me, said the man. It is thither that I am going. So they followed him to the way that but now came into the road, which by degrees turned and turned them so from the city that they desired to go to, that in a little time their faces were turned away from it. Yet they followed him. But by and by, before they were aware, he led them both within the folds of a net, in which they were both so entangled that they knew not what to do. And with that the white robe fell off the black man's back. Then they saw where they were. Wherefore, there they lay crying some time, for they could not get themselves out. Then said Christian to his fellow, Now do I see myself in an error. Did not the shepherds bid us beware of flatterers? As is the saying of the wise man, so we have found it this day. A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net at his feet. They also gave us a note of directions about the way, for our more sure finding thereof. But therein we have also forgotten to read, and have not kept ourselves from the paths of the destroyer. Thus they lay bewailing themselves in the net. At last they espied a shining one coming towards them with a whip of small cord in his hand. When he was come to the place where they were, he asked them whence they came and what they did there. They told him that they were poor pilgrims going to Zion, but were led out of their way by a black man clothed in white. Who bid us? said they. Follow him, for he was going thither too. Then said he with the whip, It is a flatterer, a false prophet that hath changed himself into an angel of light. So he rent the nets and let the men out. Then said he to them, Follow me, that I may set you in your way again. So he led them back to the way which they had left to follow the flatterer. Then he asked them, saying, Where did you lie last night? They said, With the shepherds upon the delectable mountains. He asked them then if they had not of those shepherds a noted direction for the way. They answered, Yes. But you did not, said he, when you were at a stand, 
pluck out and read your note? They answered, No. no. He asked them, Why? They said they forgot. He asked them, moreover, if the shepherds did not bid them beware of the flatterer. They answered, Yes, but we did not imagine, said they, that this fine-spoken man had been he. Then I saw in my dream that he commanded them to lie down, which, when they did, he whipped them sore, to teach them the good way wherein they should walk. And as he whipped them, he said, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. This done, he bid them go on their way, and take good heed to the other directions of the shepherds. So they thanked him for all his kindness, and went softly along the right way, singing, Come hither, you that walk along the way, see how the pilgrims fare that go astray. They catch it are in an entangling net, cause they good counsel lightly did forget. Tis true they rescued were, but yet you see, their scourge to boot, let this your caution be. Now, after a while, they perceived afar off, one coming softly and alone, all along the highway, to meet them. Then said Christian to his fellow, Yonder is a man with his back toward Zion, and he is coming to meet us. I see him. Let us take heed to ourselves, lest he should prove a flatterer also. So he drew nearer and nearer, and at last came up to them. His name was Atheist, and he asked them whither they were going. We are going to Mount Zion. Then Atheist fell into a very great laughter. <laughs> what is the meaning of your laughter? I laugh to see what ignorant persons you are to take upon yourself so tedious a journey, and yet are like to have nothing but your travel for your pains. Why, man, do you think we shall not be received? Received? There is no such place as you dream of in all this world. But there is in the world to come. When I was at home in mine own country, I heard, as you now affirm, and from that hearing went out to sea, and have been seeking this city these twenty years, but find no more of it than I did the first day I set out. We have both heard and believed that there is such a place to be found. Had not I, when at home, believed, I had not come thus far to seek, but finding none, and yet I should had there been such a place to be found, for I have gone to seek it farther than you. I am going back again, and will seek to refresh myself with the things that I then cast away for hopes of that which I now see is not. <laughs> Then said Christian to Hopeful, his fellow, Is it true what this man hath said? Take heed, he is one of the flatterers. Remember what it hath cost us once already for hearkening to such kind of fellows. What? No Mount Zion? Did we not see from the delectable mountains the gate of the city? Also, are we not now to walk by faith? Let us go on, lest the man with the whip overtake us again. I say, my brother, cease to hear him, and let us believe to the saving of the soul. My brother, I did not put the question to thee for that I doubted the truth of our belief myself, but to prove thee, and to fetch from thee a fruit of the honesty of thy heart. As for this man, I know that he is blinded. Let thee and me go on, knowing that we have belief of the truth, and no lie is of the truth. Now do I rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So they turned away from the man, and he, laughing at them, went his way. I then saw in my dream that they went till they came into a certain country, whose air naturally tended to make one drowsy if he came a stranger into it. And here Hopeful began to be very dull and heavy of sleep, wherefore he said unto Christian, I do now begin to grow so drowsy that I can scarcely hold up mine eyes. Let us lie down here and take one nap. By no means, said the other, lest sleeping we never awake more. Why, my brother, sleep is sweet to the laboring man. We may be refreshed if we take a nap. Do you not remember that one of the shepherds bid us beware of the enchanted ground? He meant by that that we should beware of sleeping. Wherefore, let us not sleep as others, but let us watch and be sober. I acknowledge myself in fault, 
and had I been here alone I had by sleeping run the danger of death. I see it is true that the wise man saith, Two are better than one. Hitherto hast thy company been my help, and thou shalt have a good reward for thy labor. Now then, said Christian, to prevent drowsiness in this place, let us talk about something profitable. With all my heart. Where shall we begin? Where God began with us. But do you begin, if you please. I will sing you first this song. When saints do sleepy grow, let them come hither, and hear how these two pilgrims talk together. Yea, let them learn of them in any wise, thus to keep ope their drowsy slumbering eyes. Saints' fellowship, if it be managed well, keeps them awake, and that in spite of hell. Then Christian began, and said, I will ask you a question. How came you to think at first of doing as you do now? Do you mean, how came I at first to look after the good of my soul? Yes, that is my meaning. I continued a great while in the delight of those things which were seen and sold at our fair, things which I believe now would have, had I continued in them still, drowned me in ruin and destruction. What things were they? All the treasures and riches of the world. Also I delighted much in rioting, reveling, drinking, swearing, lying, uncleanness, sabbath-breaking, and what not, that tended to destroy the soul. But I found at last, by hearing and considering of things that are holy, which indeed I heard of you, as also of beloved faithful, that was put to death for his faith, and good living in Vanity Fair, that the end of these things is death, and that, for these things' sake, the wrath of God cometh upon those who disobey him. And did you presently fall under the power of this feeling? No, I was not willing presently to know the evil of sin, nor the destruction that follows upon the doing of it, but tried, when my mind at first began to be shaken with the word, to shut mine eyes against the light thereof. But what was the cause of your waiting so long? Well, the causes were, firstly, I was ignorant that this was the work of God upon me. Secondly, sin was yet very sweet to my flesh, and I was loath to leave it. Thirdly, I could not tell how to part with mine old companions. Their presence and actions were so desirable unto me. Fourthly, the hours in which these feelings were upon me were such troublesome and such heart-affrighting hours that I could not bear, no, not so much as the remembrance of them upon mine heart. Then, as it seems, sometimes you got rid of your trouble. Yes, verily, but it would come into my mind again, and then I should be as bad, nay, worse than I was before. Why, what was it that brought your sins to mind again? Well, many things, as if I did but meet a good man in the streets, or if I have heard any read in the Bible, or if mine head did begin to ache, or if I were told that some of my neighbors were sick, or if I heard the bell toll for some that were dead, or if I thought of dying myself, or if I heard that sudden death happened to others, but especially when I thought of myself that I must quickly come to judgment. And could you at any time with ease get off the guilt of sin, when by any of these ways it came upon you? No, not I for then they got faster hold of my conscience, and then, if I did but think of going back to sin, though my mind was turned against it, it would be double torment to me. And how did you do then? I thought I must endeavor to mend my life, for else, thought I, I am sure to be lost forever. And did you endeavor to mend? Yes, and fled from not only my sins, but sinful company too, and betook me to religious duties, as praying, reading, weeping for sin, speaking truth to my neighbors, etc. These things did I, with many others, too much here to tell. And did you think yourself well then? Yes, for a while, but at the last my trouble came tumbling upon me again, and that over the neck of all my trying to do right. How came that about, since you were now doing right, as far as you knew? There were several things brought it upon me, especially such sayings as these, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. By the works of the law shall no flesh be made righteous. When ye shall have done all these things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable, with many more such like. From whence I begin to reason with myself thus, If all my righteousness are filthy rags, if by the deeds of the law no man can be made righteous, and if when we have done all we are yet unprofitable, then it is but a folly to think of heaven by the law. I further thought thus, if a man runs a hundred pounds into the shopkeeper's debt, and after that shall pay for all that he shall buy, 
yet his old debt stands still in the book uncrossed, for the which the shopkeeper may sue him, and cast him into prison till he shall pay the debt. Well, and how did you apply this to yourself? Why, I thought thus with myself. I have by my sins run a great way into God's book, and my now reforming will not pay off that score. Therefore I should think still under all my present trying. But how shall I be freed from that punishment that I have brought myself in danger of by my former sins? A very good application, but pray go on. Another thing that hath troubled me ever since my late turning from sin is, that if I look narrowly into the best of what I do now, I still see sin, new sin, mixing itself with the best of that I do. So that now I am forced to conclude that, notwithstanding my former fond opinion of myself and duties, I have committed sin enough in one duty to send me to hell, though my former life had been faultless. And what did you do then? Do? I could not tell what to do, till I break my mind to faithful, for he and I were well acquainted. And he told me that unless I could obtain the righteousness of a man that had never sinned, neither mine own nor in all the righteousness of the world could save me. And did you think he spake true? Had he told me so when I was pleased and satisfied with mine own trying, I had called him fool for his pains. But now, since I see mine own weakness and the sin which cleaves to my best performance, I have been forced to be of his opinion. But did you think, when at first he suggested it to you, that there was such a man to be found, of whom it might justly be said that he never committed sin? I must confess the words at first sounded strangely, but after a little more talk and company with him I had a full certainty about it. And did you ask him what man this was, and how you must be made righteous by him? Yes, and he told me it was the Lord Jesus that dwelleth on the right hand of the Most High. And thus, said he, you must be made right by him, even by trusting what he hath done by himself in the days of his flesh, and suffered when he did hang on the tree. I asked him further, how that man's righteousness could be of that power to help another before God? And he told me he was the mighty God, and did what he did, and died the death also, not for himself, but for me, to whom his doings and the worthiness of them should be given, if I believed on him. And what did you do then? I made my objections against my believing, for that I thought he was not willing to save me. And what said faithful to you then? He bid me go to him and see. Then I said it was too much for me to ask for. But he said no, for I was invited to come. Then he gave me a book of Jesus' own writing, to encourage me the more freely to come. And he said concerning that book, that every word and letter thereof stood firmer than heaven and earth. Then I asked him what I must do when I came, and he told me I must entreat on my knees with all my heart and soul the Father to reveal him to me. Then I asked him further how I must make my prayer to him, and he said, Go, and thou shalt find him upon a mercy seat where he sits all the year long to give pardon and forgiveness to them that come. I told him that I knew not what to say when I came, and he bid me say to this effect, God be merciful to me a sinner, and make me to know and believe in Jesus Christ. For I see that if his righteousness had not been, or I have not faith in that righteousness, I am utterly cast away. Lord, I have heard that thou art a merciful God, and hast given that thy son Jesus Christ should be the Savior of the world and moreover, that thou art willing to bestow him upon such a poor sinner as I am, and I am a sinner indeed. Lord, take therefore this opportunity, and show thy grace in the salvation of my soul, through thy Son Jesus Christ. Amen. And did you do as you were bidden? Oh, yes, over and over and over. And did the Father show his Son to you? Not at the first, nor second, nor third, nor fourth nor fifth, no, nor at the sixth time neither. What did you do then? What? Why, I could not tell what to do. Had you no thoughts of leaving off praying? Oh, yes, a hundred times, twice told. And what was the reason you did not? I believed that that was true which had been told to me, to wit, that without the righteousness of this Christ, all the world could not save me. And therefore, thought I with myself, if I leave off, I die, and I can but die at the throne of grace. And withal, this came into my mind. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. So I continued praying until the Father showed me his Son. And how was he shown unto you? 
I did not see him with my bodily eyes, but with the eyes of my heart, and thus it was. One day I was very sad, I think sadder than at any one time in my life, and this sadness was through a fresh sight of the greatness and vileness of my sins. And, as I was then looking for nothing but hell and the everlasting loss of my soul, suddenly, as I thought, I saw the Lord Jesus look down from heaven upon me, and saying, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But I replied, Lord, I am a great, a very great sinner. And he answered, My grace is sufficient for thee. Then I said, But Lord, what is believing? And then I saw from that saying, He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst, that believing and coming was all one, and that he that came, that is, ran out in his heart and desire after salvation by Christ, he indeed believed in Christ. Then the water stood in mine eyes, and I asked further, But Lord, may such a great sinner as I am be indeed accepted of thee, and be saved by thee? And I heard him say, And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Then said I, But how, Lord, must I consider of thee in my coming to thee, that my faith may be placed aright upon thee? Then he said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. He died for our sins and rose again for our righteousness. He loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He is mediator between God and us. He ever liveth to plead for us. From all which I gathered that I must look for righteousness in his person and for satisfaction for my sins by his blood that what he did in obedience to his father's law, and in submitting to the penalty thereof, was not for himself, but for him that will accept it for his salvation, and be thankful. And now was my heart full of joy, mine eyes full of tears, and mine affections running over with love to the name, people, and ways of Jesus Christ. This was a revelation of Christ to your soul indeed, but tell me particularly what effect this had upon your spirit. It may be seen that all the world, notwithstanding all the righteousness thereof, is in a state of condemnation. It made me see that God the Father, though he be just, can justly forgive the coming sinner. It made me greatly ashamed of the vileness of my former life, and confounded me with the sense of my own ignorance. For there never came thought into my heart before now that showed me so the beauty of Jesus Christ. It made me love a holy life, and longed to do something for the honor and glory of the name of the Lord Jesus. Yea, I thought that, had I now a thousand gallons of blood in my body, I could spill it all for the sake of the Lord Jesus. End of Part 1, Chapter 9《The Pilgrim's Progress, Part 1, Chapter 10. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, Part 1, Chapter 10. I saw then in my dream that Hopeful looked back and saw Ignorance, whom they had left behind, coming after. Look, said he to Christian, how far yonder youngster loitereth behind. Ay, ay, I see him. He careth not for our company. But I think it would not have hurt him had he kept pace with us hitherto. That is true. But I warrant you, he thinks otherwise. That I think he doth. But, however, let us tarry for him. Then the Christian said to him, Come away, man. Why do you stay so behind? I take my pleasure in walking alone even more a great deal than in company, unless I like it the better. Then said Christian to Hopeful, but softly, Did I not tell you he cared not for our company? But, however, said he, Come up and let us talk away the time in this solitary place. Then, directing his speech to ignorance, he said, Come, how do you? How stands it between God and your soul now? I hope well, for I am always full of good thoughts that come into my mind to comfort me as I walk. What good motions? Pray tell us. Why, I think of God and heaven. So do the devils and lost souls. But I think of them and desire them. 
so do many that are never like to come there. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing. But I think of them and leave all for them. That I doubt, for leaving of all is a very hard matter, yea, a harder matter than many are aware of. But why, or by what, art thou persuaded that thou hast left all for God in heaven? My heart tells me so. The wise man says, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. This is spoken of an evil heart, but mine is a good one. But how dost thou prove that? It comforts me in the hopes of heaven. That may be through its deceitfulness, for a man's heart may minister comfort to him in the hopes of that thing for which he has yet no ground to hope. But my heart and life agree together, and therefore my hope is well grounded. Who told thee that thy heart and life agree together? My heart tells me so. Ask my fellow if I be a thief. Thy heart tells thee so, except the word of God telleth thee in this matter, other testimony is of no value. But is it not a good heart that hath good thoughts? And is not that a good life that is according to God's commandments? Yes, that is a good heart that hath good thoughts, and that is a good life that is according to God's commandments. But it is one thing indeed to have these, and another thing only to think so. Pray, what count you good thoughts, and a life according to God's commandments? There are good thoughts of many kinds, some respecting ourselves, some God, some Christ, and some other things. You go so fast, I cannot keep pace with you. Do you go on before, I must stay a while behind. Then they said, Well, ignorance, wilt thou yet foolish be, to slight good counsel ten times given thee? And if thou yet refuse it, thou shalt know, ere long, the evil of thy doing so. Remember man in time, stoop, do not fear. Good counsel taken well, saves, therefore hear. But if thou yet shalt slight it, thou wilt be the loser ignorance, I'll warrant thee. Then a Christian addressed himself thus to his fellow. Well, come, my good friend Hopeful, I perceive that thou and I must walk by ourselves again. So I saw in my dream that they went on a pace before, and ignorance he came hobbling after. Then said Christian to his companion, it pities me much for this poor man. It will certainly go ill with him at last. Alas, there are abundance in our town in his condition. Whole families, yea, whole streets, and that of pilgrims too. And if there be so many in our parts, how many think you must there be in the place where he was born? Indeed, the word saith, He hath blinded their eyes, lest they should see. Well said. I believe you have said the truth. Are we now almost got past the enchanted ground? Why, art thou weary of our talking? <laughs> no, verily, but that I would know where we are. We have now not above two miles further to go thereon. Well, we will leave at this time our neighbour ignorance by himself, and fall upon another subject. With all my heart, but you shall still begin. Well then, did you not know about ten years ago, one temporary in your parts, who was a forward man in religion then? Well, know him, yes. He dwelt in Graceless, a town about two miles off of Honesty, and he dwelt next door to one Turnback. Right, he dwelt under the same roof with him. Well, that man was much awakened once. I believe that then he had some sight of his sins and of the punishment that was due thereto. I am of your mind, for, my house not being above three miles from him, he would oft times come to me, and that with many tears. Truly I pitied the man, and was not altogether without hope of him. But, one may see, it is not everyone that cries, Lord, Lord. He told me once that he was resolved to go on pilgrimage, as we do now, but all of a sudden he grew acquainted with one save self, and then he became a stranger to me, for at that time he gave up going on pilgrimage. End of Part 1, Chapter 10《The Pilgrim's Progress》Part 1, Chapter 11 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan Part 1, Chapter 11 
Now I saw in my dream that by this time the pilgrims were got over the enchanted ground, and entering into the country of Beulah, whose air was very sweet and pleasant. The way lying directly through it, they enjoyed themselves there for a season. Yea, here they heard continually the singing of birds, and saw every day the flowers appear on the earth, and heard the voice of the turtle in the land. In this country the sun shineth night and day, wherefore this was beyond the valley of the shadow of death, and also out of the reach of giant despair. Neither could they from this place so much as see Doubting Castle. Here they were within sight of the city they were going to. Also here met them some of the inhabitants thereof, for in this land the shining ones commonly walked, because it was upon the borders of heaven. Here they had no want of corn or wine, for in this place they met with abundance of what they had sought for in all their pilgrimage. Here they heard voices from out of the city, loud voices, saying, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh, behold, his reward is with him. Here all the inhabitants of the country called them the holy people, and redeemed of the Lord, sought out, etc. Now, as they walked in this land, they had more rejoicing than in parts more remote from the kingdom to which they were bound, and drawing near to the city, they had yet a more perfect view thereof. It was built of pearls and precious stones, also the streets thereof were paved with gold, so that by reason of the natural glory of the city and the reflection of the sunbeams upon it, Christian with desire fell sick. Hopeful also had a fit or two of the same disease. Wherefore, here they lay by it a while, crying out because of their pangs, If you see my beloved, tell him that I am sick of love. But being a little strengthened, and better able to bear their sickness, they walked on their way, and came yet nearer and nearer, where were orchards, vineyards, and gardens, and their gates opened into the highway. Now, as they came up to these places, Behold, the gardener stood in the way, to whom the pilgrims said, Whose goodly vineyards and gardens are these? He answered, They are the king's, and are planted here for his own delight, and also for the solace of pilgrims. So the gardener had them into the vineyards, and bid them refresh themselves with the dainties. He also showed them there the king's walks, and the arbors where he delighted to be, and here they tarried and slept. Now I beheld in my dream that they talked more in their sleep at this time than ever they did in all their journey, and being in thought thereabout, the gardener said even to me, Wherefore dost thou meditate at the matter? It is the nature of the fruit of the grapes of these vineyards to go down so sweetly as to cause the lips of them that are asleep to speak. So I saw, when they awoke, they undertook to go up to the city. But, as I said, the reflection of the sun upon the city, for the city was pure gold, was so extremely glorious that they could not as yet with open face behold it, but through a glass made for that purpose. So I saw that, as they went on, there met them two men in raiment that shone like gold, also their faces shone as the light. These men asked the pilgrims whence they came, and they told them. They also asked them where they had lodged, what difficulties and dangers, what comforts and pleasures they had met in the way, and they told them. Then said the men that met them, You have but two difficulties more to meet, and then you are in the city. Christian then and his companion asked the man to go along with them, so they told them that they would. But, said they, you must obtain it by your own faith. So I saw in my dream that they went on together, till they came in sight of the gate. Now I further saw that betwixt them and the gate was a river, but there was no bridge to go over, and the river was very deep. At the sight, therefore, of this river, the pilgrims were much stunned, but the men that went with them said, You must go through, or you cannot come at the gate. The pilgrims then began to inquire if there was no other way to the gate, to which they answered, Yes, but there hath not any save two, to wit Enoch and Elijah, 
been permitted to tread that path since the foundation of the world, nor shall until the last trumpet shall sound. The pilgrims then, especially Christian, began to be anxious in his mind, and looked this way and that, but no way could be found by them by which they might escape the river. Then they asked the men if the waters were of a depth. They said, No. Yet they could not help them in that case. For, said they, You shall find it deeper or shallower, as you believe in the king of the place. They then addressed themselves to the water, and entering, Christian began to sink, and crying out to his good friend, Hopeful, he said, I sink in deep waters, the billows go over my head, all his waves go over me. Then said the other, Be of good cheer, my brother, I feel the bottom, and it is good. Then said Christian, Ah, my friend, the sorrows of death have compassed me about. I shall not see the land that flows with milk and honey. And with that a great darkness and horror fell upon Christian, so that he could not see before him, nor orderly talk of any of those sweet refreshments that he had met with in the way of his pilgrimage. But all the words that he spake still tended to show that he had horror of mind, and heart fears that he should die in that river and never obtain entrance in at the gate. Here also, as they that stood by perceived, he was much in the troublesome thoughts of the sins that he had committed, both since and before he began to be a pilgrim. It was also observed that he was troubled with the sight of demons and evil spirits, for ever and anon he would intimate so much by words. Hopeful, therefore, had had much ado to keep his brother's head above water. Yea, Sometimes he would be quite gone down, and then, ere a while, he would rise up again, half dead. Hopeful would also endeavor to comfort him, saying, Brother, I see the gate, and men standing by to receive us. But Christian would answer, It is you, it is you they wait for. You have been hopeful ever since I knew you. And so have you, said he to Christian. Ah, brother, said he, Surely, if I were right, he would now arise to help me, but for my sins he hath brought me into this snare, and hath left me. Then said Hopeful, My brother, these troubles and distresses that you go through in these waters are no sign that God hath forsaken you, but are sent to try you, whether you recall to mind that which hitherto you have received of his goodness, and live upon him in your distresses. Then I saw in my dream that Christian was in thought a while to whom also Hopeful added these words. Be of good cheer. Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. And with that Christian break out with a loud voice. Oh, I see him again, and he tells me, When thou passest through the waters I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. Then they both took courage, and the enemy was after that as still as a stone, until they were gone over. Christian, therefore, presently found ground to stand upon, and so it followed that the rest of the river was but shallow. Thus they got over. Now, upon the bank of the river, on the other side, they saw the two shining men again, who there waited for them. Wherefore, being come out of the river, they saluted them, saying, We are heavenly spirits. Send forth to help those who shall be heirs of salvation. Thus they went along towards the gates. Now you must note that the city stood upon a mighty hill, but the pilgrims went up that hill with ease, because they had these two men to lead them up by the arms. Also they had left their mortal garments behind them in the river, for though they went in with them, they came out without them. They therefore went up here with much activity and speed, though the foundation upon which the city was framed was higher than the clouds. They therefore went up through the regions of the air, sweetly talking as they went, being comforted because they had safely got over the river, and had such glorious companions to attend them. The talk they had with the Shining Ones was about the glory of the place, who told them that the beauty and glory of it were such as could not be put into words. There, said they, is the Mount Zion, 
the heavenly Jerusalem, the innumerable company of angels, and the spirits of good men made perfect. You are going now, said they, to the paradise of God, wherein you shall see the tree of life, and eat of the never-fading fruit thereof. And when you come there, you shall have white robes given you, and your walk and talk shall be every day with the king, even all the days of an eternal life. There you shall not see again such things as you saw when you were in the lower region upon the earth, to wit, sorrow, sickness, affliction, and death, for the former things are passed away. You are going now to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to the prophets, men that God hath taken away from the evil to come, and that are now resting upon their beds, each one walking in his righteousness. The man then asked, What, what must, must we, we do, do in, in the, the holy, holy place? place? To whom it was answered, You must there receive the comfort of all your toil, and have joy for all your sorrow. You must reap what you have sown, even the fruit of all your prayers, and tears, and sufferings for the king by the way. In that place you must wear crowns of gold, and enjoy the perpetual sight and visions of the Holy One, for there you shall see him as he is. There also you shall serve him continually with praise, with shouting and thanksgiving, whom you desire to serve in the world, though with much difficulty, because of the weakness of your bodies. There your eyes shall be delighted with seeing, and your ears with hearing the pleasant voice of the Mighty One. There you shall enjoy your friends again that are gone thither before you. And there you shall with joy receive even every one that follows into the holy place after you. There also you shall be clothed with glory and majesty, and put into a state fit to ride out with the King of Glory, when he shall come with sound of trumpet in the clouds. As upon the wings of the wind, you shall come with him. And when he shall sit upon the throne of judgment, you shall sit by him. Yea, and when he shall pass sentence upon all the workers of evil, let them be angels or men, you also shall have a voice in that judgment, because they were his and your enemies. Also, when he shall again return to the city, you shall go too, with sound of trumpet, and be ever with him. Now, while they were thus drawing towards the gate, behold, a company of the heavenly host came out to meet them, to whom it was said by the other two shining ones, These are the men that have loved our Lord when in the world, and that have left all for his holy name. And he hath sent us to fetch them, and we have brought them thus far on their desired journey, that they may go in and look their Redeemer in the face with joy. Then the heavenly host gave a great shout, saying, Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There came out also at this time to meet them several of the king's trumpeters, clothed in white and shining raiment, who, with melodious noises and loud, made even the heavens to echo with their sound. These trumpeters saluted Christian and his fellow with ten thousand welcomes from the world, and this they did with shouting and sound of trumpet. This done, they compassed them round on every side. Some went before, some behind, and some on the right hand, some on the left, as it were to guard them through the upper regions, continually sounding as they went with melodious noise in notes on high, so that the very sight was to them that could behold it as if heaven itself was come down to meet them. Thus, therefore, they walked on together, and as they walked, ever and anon these trumpeters, even with joyful sound, would, by mixing their music with looks and gestures, still signify to Christian and his brother how welcome they were into their company, and with what gladness they came to meet them. And now were these two men, as it were, in heaven before they came at it, being swallowed up with the sight of angels, and with hearing of their melodious notes. Here also they had the city itself in view, and thought they heard all the bells therein to ring, and welcomed them thereto. But above all, the warm and joyful thoughts that they had about their own dwelling there with such company, 
and that for ever and ever. Oh, by what tongue or pen can their glorious joy be expressed? And thus they came up to the gate. Now when they were come up to the gate, there was written over it in letters of gold, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Then I saw in my dream that the shining men bid them call at the gate, the which, when they did, some from above looked over the gate, such as Enoch, Moses, and Elijah, and others, to whom it was said, These pilgrims are come from the city of destruction for the love that they bear to the king of this place. And then the pilgrims gave in unto them each man his certificate, which they had received in the beginning. Those, therefore, were carried into the king, who, when he had read them, said, Where are the men? To whom it was answered, They are standing without the gate. The king then commanded to open the gate. That the righteous nation, said he, which keepeth the truth, may enter in. Now I saw in my dream that these two men went in at the gate, and lo, as they entered, their looks were changed, so that their faces became bright, and they had garments put on that shone like gold. There were also that met them with harps and crowns, and gave them to them, the harps to praise withal, and the crowns in token of honor. Then I heard in my dream that all the bells in the city rang again for joy, and that it was said unto them, Enter ye into the joy of the Lord. I also heard the men themselves, that they sang with a loud voice, saying, Blessing and, and honor and, and glory and, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and, and unto the, the Lamb, for ever and ever. Now, just as the gates were opened to let in the men, I looked in after them, and behold, the city shone like the sun, the streets also were paved with gold, and in them walked many men with crowns on their heads, palms in their hands, and golden harps to sing praises withal. There were also of them that had wings, and they answered one another without ceasing, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And after that they shut up the gates, which, when I had seen, I wished myself among them. Now, while I was gazing upon all these things, I turned my head to look back, and saw ignorance come up to the riverside. But he soon got over and that without half the difficulty which the other two men met with. For it happened that there was then in the place one vain hope, a ferryman, that with his boat helped him over. So he, as the others, I saw, did ascend the hill to come up to the gate. Only he came alone, neither did any man meet him with the least encouragement. When he was come up to the gate, he looked up to the riding that was above, and then began to knock, supposing that entrance should have been quickly given to him. But he was asked by the men that looked over the top of the gate, Whence came you, and what would you have? He answered, I have eaten and drunk in the presence of the king, and he has taught in our streets. Then they asked him for his certificate, that they might go in and show it to the king. So he fumbled in his bosom for one, and found none. Then said they, Have you none? But the man answered never a word. So they told the king. But he would not come down to see him, but he commanded the two shining ones that conducted Christian and Hopeful to the city to go out and take ignorance and bind him hand and foot, and have him away. Then they took him up and carried him through the air to the door that I saw in the side of the hill, and put him in there. Then I saw that there was a way to hell even from the gates of heaven, as well as from the city of destruction. So I awoke, and behold, it was a dream. End of chapter 11 End of part 1 of The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan
The Pilgrim's Progress, Part Two, Chapter One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, Part Two, Chapter One. Courteous Companions. Some time since, to tell you my dream that I had of Christian the Pilgrim and of his dangerous journey towards the celestial country, was pleasant to me and profitable to you. I told you then also what I saw concerning his wife and children, and how unwilling they were to go with him on pilgrimage, insomuch that he was forced to go on his progress without them, for he durst not run the danger of that destruction which he feared would come by staying with them in the city of destruction. Wherefore, as I then showed you, he left them and departed. Now it hath so happened, through the abundance of business, that I have been much hindered and kept back from my wonted travels into those parts whence he went, and so could not, till now, obtain an opportunity to make further inquiry after those whom he left behind, that I might give you an account of them. But having had some concerns that way of late, I went down again thitherward. Now, having taken up my lodgings in a wood about a mile off the place, as I slept, I dreamed again. And as I was in my dream, behold, an aged gentleman came by where I lay, and, because he was to go some part of the way that I was travelling, methought I got up and went with him. So, as we walked, and as travellers usually do, I was as if we fell into discourse, and our talk happened to be about Christian and his travels, for thus I began with the old man. Sir, said I, what town is that there below that lieth on the left hand of our way? Then said Mr. Sagacity, for that was his name, It is the city of destruction, a populous place, but possessed with a very ill-conditioned and idle sort of people. I thought that was the city, quoth I. I went once myself through that town, and therefore know that this report you give of it is true. Too true. I wish I could speak truth in speaking better of them that dwell therein. Well, sir, quoth I, then I perceive you to be a well-meaning man, and so one that takes pleasure to hear and tell of that which is good. Pray, did you never hear what happened to a man some time ago of this town, whose name was Christian, that went on pilgrimage up toward the higher regions? Hear of him? Aye, and I also heard of the difficulties. Troubles, wars, captivities, cries, groans, frights, and fears that he met with, and had in his journey. Besides, I must tell you all our country rings of him. But there are few houses that have heard of him and his doings, but have sought after and got the record of his pilgrimage. Yea, I think I may say that his hazardous journey has got many well-wishers to his ways, for though, when he was here, he was a fool in every man's mouth, yet now he is gone, he is highly commended of all, for it is said he lives bravely where he is, yea, many of them that are resolved never to run his risks, yet have their mouths water at his gains. They may, quoth I, well think, if they think anything that is true, that he liveth well where he is. For he now lives at and in the fountain of life, and has what he has without labor and sorrow, for there is no grief mixed therewith. But pray, what talk have the people about him? Talk? The people talk strangely about him. Some say that he now walks in white that he has a chain of gold about his neck, that he has a crown of gold beset with pearls upon his head. Others say that the shining ones, that sometimes showed themselves unto him in his journey, are become his companions, and that he is as familiar with them in the place where he is, as here one neighbor is with another. Besides, it is confidently spoken concerning him that the king of the place where he is has bestowed upon him already a very rich and pleasant dwelling at court, and that he every day eateth and drinketh and walketh with him, and receiveth of the smiles and favours of him that is judge of all there. 
Moreover, it is expected of some that his prince, the lord of that country, will shortly come into these parts, and will know the reason, if they can give any, why his neighbours set so little by him, and had him so much in derision, when they perceived that he would be a pilgrim. For they say, Now he is so in the affections of his prince, and that his sovereign is so much concerned with the wrongs that were cast upon Christian when he became a pilgrim, that he will look upon all as if done unto himself. And no marvel, for it was the love that he had to his prince that he ventured as he did. I dare say, quoth I, I am glad on it. I am glad for the poor man's sake, for that he now has rest from his labour, and for that he reapeth the benefit of his tears with joy, and for that he has got beyond gunshot of his enemies, and is out of reach of them that hate him. I also am glad for that a rumour of these things is noised abroad in this country. Who can tell but that it may work some good benefit on some that are left behind? But pray, sir, while it is fresh in my mind, do you hear anything of his wife and children? Poor hearts! I wonder in my mind what they do. Who? Christiana and her sons. They are like to do as well as did Christian himself. For though when they all played the fool at first, and would by no means be persuaded by either the tears or entreaties of Christian, yet second thoughts wrought wonderfully with them, so they have packed up, and are also gone after him. Better and better, quoth I. But what, wife and children and all? It is true. I can give you an account of the matter, for I was upon the spot at the instant, and was thoroughly acquainted with the whole affair. Then, said I, a man, it seems, may report it for a truth. You need not fear to declare it. I mean that they are all gone on pilgrimage, both the good woman and her four boys, and, since we are, as I perceive, going some considerable way together, I will give you an account of the whole matter. This Christiana, for that was her name from the day that she, with her children, betook themselves to a pilgrim's life, after her husband had gone over the river, and she could hear of him no more, her thoughts began to work in her mind. First, for that she had lost her husband, and of that the loving bond of that relation was utterly broken betwixt them. For you know, said he to me, it is only natural that the living should have many sad thoughts in the remembrance of the loss of loving relations. This, therefore, of her husband did cost her many a tear. But this was not all, for Christiana did also begin to consider with herself whether unbecoming behaviour towards her husband was not one cause that she saw him no more, and that in such sort he was taken away from her. And upon this came into her mind, by swarms, all her unkind, unnatural, and ungodly treatment of her dear friend, which also troubled her conscience, and did load her with guilt. She was, moreover, much broken with recalling to remembrance the restless groans, brinish tears, and self-bemoanings of her husband, and how she did harden her heart against all his entreaties and loving persuasions of her and her sons to go with him. Yea, there was not anything that Christian either said to her or did before her all the while that his burden did hang on his back, but it returned upon her like a flash of lightning, and rent her heart in sunder. Especially that bitter outcry of his, What shall I do to be saved? did ring in her ears most dolefully. Then she said to her children, Sons, we are all undone. I have sinned away your father, and he is gone. He would have had us with him, but I would not go myself. I also have hindered you of life. With that the boys fell all into tears, and cried out to go after their father. Oh, said Christiana, that it had been but our lot to go with him. Then had it fared well with us, beyond what it is like to do now. For though I formerly foolishly imagined, concerning the troubles of your father, 
that they came from a foolish fancy that he had, or for that he was overrun with melancholy humours. Yet now it will not out of my mind, but that they sprang from another cause, and it was this, that the light of life was given him, by the help of which, as I perceive, he has escaped the snares of death. Then they all wept again, and cried out, Oh, woe worth the day! The next night Christiana had a dream, and behold, she saw as if a bright parchment were opened before her, in which were recorded the sum of her ways, and the times, as she thought, looked very black upon her. Then she cried out aloud in her sleep, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner! And the little children heard her. After this, she thought she saw two very ill-favoured ones standing by her bedside, and saying, What shall we do with this woman? For she cries out for mercy, waking and sleeping. If she be suffered to go on, as she begins, we shall lose her, as we have lost her husband. Wherefore we must, by one way or other, seek to take her off from the thoughts of what shall be hereafter. Else, oh, the world cannot help, but she will become a pilgrim. Now she awoke in a great sweat. Also a trembling was upon her, but after a while she fell to sleeping again. And then she thought she saw Christian, her husband, in a place of bliss, among many immortals, with a harp in his hand standing and playing upon it before one that sat upon a throne, with a rainbow about his head. She saw also, as if he bowed his head with his face to the paved work that was under the prince's feet, saying, I heartily thank my lord and king for bringing of me into this place. Then shouted a company of them that stood round about, and harped with their harps but no man living could tell what they said, but Christian and his companions. Next morning, when she was up and had prayed to God and talked with her children a while, one knocked hard at the door, to whom she spake out, saying, If thou comest in God's name, come in. So he said, Amen. And opened the door, and saluted her with, Peace be to this house. The which, when he had done, he said, Christiana, knowest there wherefore I come? Then she blushed and trembled. Also her heart began to wax warm with desires to know from whence he came, and what was his errand to her. So he said unto her, My name is Secret. I dwell with those that are on high. It is talked of where I dwell as if thou hadst a desire to go thither. Also there is a report that thou art aware of the evil thou hast formerly done to thy husband, in hardening thy heart against his way, and in keeping of these thy babes in their ignorance. Christiana, the merciful one, has sent me to tell thee that he is a God ready to forgive, that he taketh delight to pardon offenses. He also will have thee know that he invited thee to come into his presence, to his table, and that he will feed thee with the fat of his house, and with the heritage of Jacob thy father. There is Christian thy husband, that was, with legions more, his companions. Ever behold that face that doth minister life to beholders, and they will be glad when they shall hear the sound of thy feet step over thy father's threshold. Christiana, at this, was greatly abashed in herself, and bowed her head to the ground. This visitor proceeded and said, Christiana, here is also a letter for thee which I have brought from thy husband's king. So she took it and opened it, but it smelt after the manner of the best perfume. Also it was written in letters of gold. The contents of the letter were these, that the king would have her do as Christian her husband, for that was the way to come to his city and to dwell in his presence with joy for ever. At this the good woman was quite overcome, so she cried out to her visitor, Sir, will you carry me and my children with you, that we also may worship this king? Then said the visitor, Christiana, the bitter is before the sweet. Thou must through troubles, as did he that went before thee, enter the celestial city. 
Wherefore I advise thee to do as did Christian thy husband, go to the wicket gate yonder over the plain, for that stands in the head of the way up which you must go, and I will wish thee all good speed. Also I advise that you put this letter in thy bosom, that thou read therein to thyself and to thy children, until you have got it by rote of heart, for it is one of the songs that thou must sing while thou art in this house of thy pilgrimage. Also this thou must deliver in at the farther gate. Now, I saw in my dream that this old gentleman, as he told me the story, did himself seem to be greatly affected therewith. He moreover went on, and said, So Christiana called her sons together, and began thus to address herself unto them. My sons, I have, as you may perceive, been of late under much trouble in my soul about the death of your father. Not for that I doubt at all of his happiness, for I am satisfied now that he is well. I have also been much affected with the thoughts of mine own state, and yours, which I verily believe is by nature miserable. My treatment also of your father in his distress is a great load to my conscience, for I hardened both mine own heart and yours against him, and refused to go with him on pilgrimage. The thoughts of these things would now kill me outright, but for a dream which I had last night, and but for the encouragement that this stranger has given me this morning. Come, my children, let us pack up and be gone to the gate that leads to the celestial country, that we may see your father, and be with him and his companions in peace according to the laws of that land. Then did her children burst out into tears, for joy that the heart of their mother was so inclined. So their visitor bade them farewell, and they began to prepare to set out for their journey. But while they were thus about to be gone, two of the women that were Christiana's neighbors came up to the house and knocked at the door, to whom she said as before, If you come in God's name, come in. At this the women were stunned, for this kind of language they used not to hear, or to perceive to drop from the lips of Christiana. Yet they came in, but behold, they found the good woman preparing to be gone from her house. So they began and said, Neighbor, pray what is your meaning by this? Christiana answered and said to the eldest of them, whose name was Mrs. Timorous, I am preparing for a journey. This Timorous was daughter to him that met Christian upon the hill difficulty, and would have had him go back for fear of the lions. For what journey, I pray you? Even to go after my good husband. And with that she fell a-weeping. I hope not so, good neighbor. Pray, for your poor children's sake, do not so unwomanly cast away yourself. Nay, my children shall go with me. Not one of them is willing to stay behind. I wonder in my very heart what or who has brought you into this mind. O oh, neighbour, knew you but as much as I do, I doubt not but that you would go with me. Prithee, what new knowledge hast thou got, that so worketh off thy mind from thy friends, and that tempteth thee to go nobody knows where? Then Christiana replied, I have been sorely afflicted since my husband's departure from me, but especially since he went over the river, but that which troubleth me most is my unkind treatment of him when he was under his distress. Besides, I am now as he was then. Nothing will serve me but going on pilgrimage. I was a-dreaming last night that I saw him. Oh, that my soul was with him! He dwelleth in the presence of the king of the country. He sits and eats with him at his table. He has become a companion of immortals, and has a house now given him to dwell in, to which the best palaces on earth, if compared, seem to me but as a dunghill. The prince of the place has also sent for me with promises of entertainment, if I shall come to him. His messenger was here even now, and has brought me a letter which invites me to come. And with that she plucked out the letter, and read it, and said to them, What now will you say to this? O oh, the madness that hath possessed thee and thy husband, to run yourselves upon such difficulties! You have heard, I am sure, what your husband did meet with, even a manner at the first step that he took on his way, as our neighbour obstinate can yet testify, for he went along with them, yea, and pliable too, until they like wise men were afraid to go on any farther. 
We also heard over and above how he met with the lions, the polion, the shadow of death, and many other things. Nor is the danger he meant with it vanity fair to be forgotten by thee. For if he, though a man, was so hard put to it, what canst thou, being but a poor woman, do? Consider also that these four sweet babes are thy children, thy flesh and thy bones. Wherefore, though thou shouldest be so rash as to cast away thyself, yet for the sake of thy children keep thou at home. But Christiana said unto her, Tempt me not, my neighbour. I have now a price put into my hands to get gain, and I should be a fool of the greatest size if I should have no heart to strike in with the opportunity. And for that you tell me of all these troubles which I am like to meet with in the way. They are so far off from being to me a discouragement that they show I am in the right. The bitter must come before the sweet, and that also will make the sweet the sweeter. Wherefore, since you came not to my house, in God's name, as I said, I pray you to be gone, and not to disquiet me further. Then Timorous reviled her, and said to her fellow, Come, neighbour Mercy, let us leave her in her own hands, since she scorns our counsel and company. But Mercy was at a stand, and could not so readily comply with her neighbour, and that for a twofold reason. One, her heart yearned over Christiana, so she said within herself, If my neighbour will needs be gone, I will go a little way with her and help her. Two, her heart yearned over her own soul, for what Christiana had said had taken hold upon her mind. Wherefore she said within herself again, I will yet have more talk with this Christiana, and if I find truth and life in what she shall say, myself with my heart shall also go with her. Wherefore, Mercy began thus to reply to her neighbour Timorous. Neighbour, I did indeed come with you to see Christiana this morning, and, since she is, as you see, taking her last farewell of her country, I think to walk this sunshiny morning a little with her, to help her on her way. But she told her not of the second reason, but kept that to herself. Well, I see you have a mind to go a-fooling too, but take heed in time and be wise. While we are out of danger, we are out, but when we are in, we are in. So Mrs. Timorous returned to her house, and Christiana betook herself to her journey. But when Timorous was got home to her house, she sends for some of her neighbours, to wit, Mrs. Bat-Eyes, Mrs. Inconsiderate, Mrs. Light-Mind, and Mrs. Know-Nothing. So when they were come to her house, she falls to telling of the story of Christiana and of her intended journey, and thus she began her tale. Neighbours, having had little to do this morning, I went to give Christiana a visit, and when I came at the door I knocked, as you know it is our custom, and she answered, If you come in God's name, come in. So in I went, thinking all was well. But when I came in, I found her preparing to herself to depart the town, she and also her children. So I asked her what was her meaning by that, and she told me, in short, that she was now of a mind to go on a pilgrimage, as did her husband. She told me also a dream that she had had, and how the king of the country where her husband was had sent her an inviting letter to come thither. Then said Mrs. Know-Nothing, And what? Do you think she will go? I go she will, whatever comes on it, and methinks I know it by this, for that which was my great reason persuading her to stay at home— uh, that is, the trouble she was like to meet with in the way, is one great reason with her to put her forward on her journey, for she told me in so many words, The bitter goes before the sweet, yea, and forasmuch as it so doth, it makes the sweet the sweeter. Mrs. Bat-Eyes Oh, this blind and foolish woman, said she, will she not take warning by his husband's trials? For my part, I see, if he were here again, he would rest him content in a whole skin, and never run so many dangers for nothing. Mrs. Inconsiderate also replied, saying, Away with such fantastical fools from the town. A good riddance, for my part, I say of her. Should she stay where she dwells, and retain this her mind, who could live quietly by her? For she will either be dumpish, or unneighbourly, Talk of such matters as no wise body can abide. Wherefore, for my part, I shall never be sorry for her departure. Let her go, and let better come in her room. It was never a good world since these whimsical fools dwelt in it. 
Then Mrs. Lightmind added, as followeth, Come, put this kind of talk away. I was yesterday at Madame Wanton's, where we were as merry as a mate. For who do you think should be there? But I and Mrs. Love the Flesh, and three or four more, with Mr. Lettery, Mrs. Filth, and some others. So there we had music and dancing, and what else was meet to fill up the pleasure? And, I dare say, my lady herself is an admirable, well-bred gentlewoman, and Mr. Lettery is as pretty a fellow. End of Part 2, Chapter 1「The Pilgrim's Progress, Part 2, Chapter 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, Part 2, Chapter 2. The Wicket Gate. By this time Christiana was got on her way, and Mercy went along with her. So as they went, her children being there also, Christiana began to discourse. And mercy, said Christiana, I take this as an unexpected favour, that thou shouldst set forth out of doors with me, to accompany me a little in my way. Then said young Mercy, for she was but young, If I thought it would be a good purpose to go with you, I would never go near the town any more. Well, Mercy, said Christiana, Cast in thy lot with me. I well know what will be the end of our pilgrimage. My husband is where he would not be but for all the gold in the Spanish mines, nor shalt thou be turned away, though thou goest but upon my invitation. The king who hath sent for me and my children is one that delighteth in mercy. Besides, if thou wilt, I will hire thee, and thou shalt go along with me as my servant, yet we will have all things in common betwixt thee and me, only go along with me. But how shall I be sure that I also shall be welcomed? Had I this hope, but from one that can tell, I would have no hesitation at all, but would go, being helped by him that can help, though the way be never so tedious. Well, loving mercy, I will tell thee what thou shalt do. Go with me to the wicket gate, and there I will further inquire for thee, and if there thou dost not meet with encouragement, I will be content that thou shalt return to thy place. I also will pay thee for thy kindness, which thou showest to me and my children, in the accompanying of us in our way as thou dost. Then I will go thither, and will take what shall follow, and the Lord grant that my lot may there fall, even as the King of Heaven shall have his heart upon me. Christiana was then glad at her heart, not only that she had a companion, but also for that she had prevailed with this poor maid to fall in love with her own salvation. So they went on together, and Mercy began to weep. Then said Christiana, Wherefore weepeth my sister so? Alas, said she, Who can but lament, that shall but rightly consider what a state and condition my poor relations are in, that yet remain in our sinful town? And that which makes my grief the more heavy is, because they have no one to teach them, nor to tell them what is to come. Tenderness becometh pilgrims and thou dost for thy friends as my good Christian did for me when he left me. He mourned for that I would not heed nor regard him, but his Lord and ours did gather up his tears and put them into his bottle, and now both I and thou, and these my sweet babes, are reaping the fruit in benefit of them, I hope, mercy, that these tears of thine will not be lost, for the truth hath said that they that sow in tears shall reap in joy, in singing, and he that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Then said Mercy, Let the most blessed be my guide, if it be his blessed will, unto his gate, into his fold, up to his holy hill. And never let him suffer me to swerve or turn aside from his free grace and holy ways, whate'er shall me betide. And let him gather them of mine that I have left behind. Lord, make them pray that they may be thine, with all their heart and mind. Now my old friend proceeded, and said, But when Christiana came to the slough of despond, she began to be at a stand. For, said she, This is the place in which my dear husband had like to have been smothered with mud. She perceived also that, notwithstanding the command of the king to make this place for pilgrims good, yet it was rather worse than formerly. So I asked if that was true. Yes, said the old gentleman. Too true, for many there be that pretend to be the king's laborers, and say they are for mending the king's highway, that bring dirt and dung instead of stones, 
and so mar instead of mending. Here Christiana, therefore, with her boys, did make a stand, but said mercy, Come, let us venture, only let us be wary. Then they looked well to their steps, and made shift to get staggeringly over. Yet Christiana had to have been in, and that not once nor twice. Now they had no sooner got over, but they thought they heard words that said unto them, Blessed is she that believeth, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Then they went on again, and said mercy to Christiana, Had I as good ground to hope for a loving reception at the wicket gate as you, I think no slough of despond would discourage me. Well, said the other, You know your trouble, and I know mine. And, good friend, we shall have enough evil before we come at our journey's end, for can it be imagined that the people that design to attain such excellent glories as we do, and that are so envied that happiness as we are, but that we shall meet with what fears, with what troubles and afflictions they can possibly assault us with, that hate us? And now Mr. Sagacity left me to dream out my dream by myself. Wherefore, methought I saw Christiana and Mercy and the boys go all of them up to the gate, to which, when they were come, they betook themselves to a short debate about how they must manage their calling at the gate, and what should be said unto him that did open unto them. So it was concluded, since Christiana was the eldest, that she should knock for entrance, and that she should speak to him that did open for the rest. So Christiana began to knock, and, as her poor husband did, she knocked and knocked again. But instead of any that answered, they all thought that they heard as if a dog came barking upon them, a dog, and a great one, too, and this made the women and the children afraid. Nor durst they for a while to knock any more, for fear the mastiff should fly upon them. Now, therefore, they were greatly tumbled up and down in their minds, and knew not what to do. Knock they durst not, for fear the dog. Go back they durst not, for fear the keeper of the gate should espy them as they so went and should be offended with them. At last they thought of knocking again, and not more loudly than they did at first. Then said the keeper of the gate, Who is there? So the dog left off to bark, and he opened unto them. Then Christiana made low obeisance, and said, Let not our lord be offended with his handmaidens, for that we have knocked at his princely gate. Then said the keeper, Whence come ye, and what is it that you would have? Christiana answered, We are come from whence Christian did come, and upon the same errand as he, to wit, to be, if it shall please you, graciously admitted by this gate, into the way that leads to the celestial city. And I answer, my lord, in the next place, that I am Christiana, once the wife of Christian, that now is gotten above. With that the keeper of the gate did marvel, saying, What? Is she now become a pilgrim, that, but a while ago, hated that life? Then she bowed her head, and said, Yes, and so are these my sweet babes also. Then he took her by the hand, and led her in, and said also, Suffer the little children to come unto me. And with that he shut up the gate. This done, he called to a trumpeter that was above, over the gate, to entertain Christiana with shouting and the sound of trumpet for joy. So he obeyed and sounded, and filled the air with his melodious notes. Now all this while poor Mercy did stand without trembling and crying, for fear that she was rejected. But when Christiana had got admittance for herself and her boys, then she began to make intercession for Mercy. My lord, I have a companion of mine that stands yet without, that is come hither upon the same account as myself, one that is much troubled in her mind for that she comes, as she thinks, without sending for, whereas I was sent to by my husband's king to come. Now Mercy began to be very impatient, for each minute was as long to her as an hour. Wherefore she prevented Christiana from asking for her more fully by knocking at the gate herself. And she knocked then so loud that she made Christiana to start. Then said the keeper of the gate, Who is there? And said Christiana, It is my friend. So he opened the gate and looked out, 
but Mercy was fallen down without in a swoon, for she fainted, and was afraid that no gate would be opened to her. Then he took her by the hand, and said, Maiden, I bid thee arise. Oh, sir, said she, I am faint, there is scarce life left in me. But he answered that, One once said, When my soul fainted within me, I remember the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. Fear not, but stand upon thy feet, and tell me wherefore thou art come. I am come for that unto which I was never invited, as my friend Christiana was. Hers was from the king, and mine was but from her. Wherefore I fear, I presume. Did she desire thee to come with her to this place? Yes, and as my lord sees, I am come, and if there is any grace and forgiveness of sins to spare, I beseech that I, thy poor handmaiden, may be partaker thereof. Then he took her again by the hand, and led her gently in, and said, I pray for all them that believe on me, by what means soever they come unto me. Then said he to those that stood by, Fetch something, and give it to Mercy to smell on, thereby to stay her fainting. So they fetched her a bundle of myrrh, and a while after she was revived. And now was Christiana and her boys and Mercy received of the Lord at the head of the way, and spoke kindly unto by him. Then said they yet further unto him, We are sorry for our sins, and beg of our Lord his pardon, and further information what we must do. I grant pardon, said he. By word and deed, by word, in the promise of forgiveness, by deed, in the way I obtained it. Take the first from my lips with a kiss, and the other as it shall be revealed. Now I saw in my dream that he spake many good words unto them, whereby they were greatly gladded. He also had them up to the top of the gate, and showed them by what deed they were saved and told them withal that that sight they would have again as they went along the way, to their comfort. So he left them a while in the summer parlour below, where they entered into a talk by themselves, and thus Christiana began. O oh Lord, how glad am I that we are gotten hither! So you well may, but I of all have cause to leap for joy. I thought one to as I stood at the gate, because I knocked, and none did answer that all our labour had been lost, especially when that ugly cur made such a heavy barking against us. But my worst fear was after I saw that you were taken into his favour, and that all was left behind. Now I thought, it is fulfilled which is written. Two women shall be grinding in the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. I had much ado to forbear crying out, Undone! Undone! And afraid I was to knock any more. But... When I looked up to see what was written over the gate, I took courage. I also thought that I must either knock again or die, so I knocked, but I cannot tell how, for my spirit now struggled betwixt life and death. Can you not tell how you knocked? I am sure your knocks were so earnest that the very sound of them made me start. I thought I never heard such knocking in all my life. I thought she would come in by violent hands, or take the kingdom by storm. Alas, to be in my case, who that so was could but have done so— you saw that the door was shut upon me, and that there was a most cruel dog thereabout. Who, I say, that was so faint-hearted as I, would not have knocked with all their might? But pray, what said my lord to my rudeness? Was he not angry with me? When he heard your lumbering noise, he gave a wonderful innocent smile. I believe what you did pleased him well enough, for he showed no sign to the contrary. But I marvel in my heart why he keeps such a dog. Had I known that afore, I should not have had heart enough to have ventured myself in this manner. But now we are in, we are in, and I am glad with all my heart. I will ask, if you please, next time he comes down, why he keeps such a filthy cur in his yard. I hope he will not take it amiss. I do, said the children. And persuade him, him to hang him, him for we are afraid he will bite us, us when we go hence. Him. So at last he came down to them again, and Mercy fell to the ground on her face before him, and worshipped, and said, Let my lord accept the offering of praise which I now offer unto him with my lips. So he said unto her, Peace be to thee, stand up. 
But she continued upon her face, and said, Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore dost thou keep so cruel a dog in thy yard, at the sight of which such women and children as we are ready to fly from the gate with fear? He answered, and said, That dog has another owner. He also is kept close in another man's ground. Only my pilgrims hear his barking. He belongs to the castle, which you can see there at the distance, but can come up to the walls of this place. He has frightened many an honest pilgrim from worse to better, by the great voice of his roaring. Indeed, he that owneth him doth not keep him out of any good will, to me or mine, but with intent to keep the pilgrims from coming to me, and that they may be afraid to come and knock at this gate for entrance. Sometimes also he is broken out, and has worried some that I love. But I take all that present patiently. I also give my pilgrims timely help, so that they are not delivered up to his power to do with them what his doggish nature would prompt him to. But what, my beloved one, I should suppose, hadst thou known even so much beforehand, thou wouldst not have been afraid of a dog. The beggars that go from door to door will, rather than loose as opposed arms, Run the danger of the bawling, barking, and biting too of a dog. And shall a dog in another man's yard, a dog whose barking I turn to the prophet of pilgrims, keep any one from coming to me? I deliver them from the lions, their darling, from the power of the dog. Then said Mercy, I confess my ignorance, I spake what I understood not. I acknowledge that thou doest all things well. Then Christiana began to talk of their journey, and to inquire after the way. So he fed them, and washed their feet, and set them in the way of his steps, according as he had dealt with her husband before. So I saw in my dream that they walked on in their way, and had the weather very comfortable to them. Then Christiana began to sing, Blessed be the day that I began a pilgrim for to be. And blessed also be the man that there to move it me. Tis true, twas long ere I began to seek to live for ever, but now I run fast as I can. Tis better late than never. Our tears to joy, our fears to faith are turned as we see. Thus our beginning, as one saith, shows what our end will be. Now there was, on the other side of the wall that fenced in the way up which Christiana and her companions were to go, a garden, and that garden belonged to him whose was that barking dog of whom mention was made before. And some of the fruit trees that grew in the garden shot their branches over the wall, and being mellow, they that found them did gather them up, and oft eat of them, to their hurt. So Christiana's boys, as boys are apt to do, being pleased with the trees and the fruit that did hang thereon, did bend the branches down and pluck the fruit and begin to eat. Their mother did also chide them for so doing, but still the boys went on. Well, said she, my sons, you do wrong, for that fruit is none of ours. But she did not know that it did belong to the enemy. I'll warrant you, if she had, she would have been ready to die for fear. But that passed, and they went on their way. Now, by that they were gone about two bowshots from the place that led them unto the way, they espied two very ill-favored ones coming down apace to meet them. With that, Christiana and Mercy, her friend, covered themselves with their veils, and so kept on their journey. The children also went on before, so that at last they met together. Then they that came down to meet them came just up to the women, as if they would embrace them. But Christiana said, Stand back, or go peaceably by, as you should. Yet these two, as men that are deaf, regarded not Christiana's words, but began to lay hands upon them. At that Christiana, waxing very wroth, spurned at them with her feet. Mercy also, as well as she could, did what she could to shift them. Christiana again said to them, Stand back and be gone, for we have no money to lose, being pilgrims, as you see, and such too as live upon the charity of our friends. 
Then said one of the two men, We make no assault upon you for money, but I come out to tell you that, if you will grant one small request which we shall ask, we will make women of you for ever. Now, Christiana, imagining what they should mean, made answer again. We will neither hear, nor regard, nor yield to what you shall ask. We are in haste, and cannot stay. Our business is a business of life or death. So, again, she and her companions made a fresh attempt to go past them, and they lettered them in their way, and they said, We intend no hurt to your lives. It is another thing we would have. I, quoth Christiana, you would have us body and soul, for I know it is for that you are come, but we will die rather upon the spot than to suffer ourselves to be brought into such snares as shall risk the loss of our well-being hereafter. And with that they both shrieked out and cried, Murder! 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 And so put themselves under those laws that are provided for the protection of women. But the men still made their approach upon them, with design to prevail against them. They therefore cried out again. Now, they being, as I said, far from the gate in at which they came, their voices were heard from where they were thither. Wherefore some of the house came out, and knowing it was Christiana's tongue, they made haste to her relief. But by the time they were got within sight of them, the women were in a very great terror. The children also stood crying by. Then did he that came in for their relief call out to the ruffians, saying, What is that thing you do? Would you make my lord's people to do wrong? He also attempted to take them, but they did make their escape over the wall into the garden of the man to whom the great dog belonged. So the dog became their protector. This reliever then came up to the women and asked them how they did. So they answered, we thank thy prince pretty well, only we have been somewhat affrighted. We thank thee also for that thou camest in to our help, otherwise we had been overcome. So after a few more words, this reliever said as followeth, I marveled much when you were entertained at the gate above, being ye knew that ye were but weak women, that you asked not the Lord for a conductor. Then might you have avoided these troubles and dangers, for he would have granted you one. Alas! said Christiana. We were taken so with our present blessing, that dangers to come were forgotten by us. Besides, who could have thought, that so near the king's palace, there could have lurked such naughty ones? Indeed, it had been well for us had we asked our lord for one, but since our lord knew it would be for our profit, I wonder he sent not one along with us. It is not always necessary to grant things not asked for, lest, by doing so, they become of little value. But when the want of a thing is felt, but he who needs it feels its preciousness, and so when it is given it will be used. Had my lord granted you a conductor, you would not either have so bewailed that oversight of yours, in not asking for one, as now you have occasion to do. So all things work for good, and tend to make you more wary. Shall we go back again to my lord, and confess our folly, and ask for one? Your confession of your folly I will present him with. To go back again you need not, for in all places where you shall come, you will find no want at all. For, in every one of my lord's lodgings, which he has prepared for the care of his pilgrims, there is sufficient to furnish them against all attempts whatsoever. But, as I said, he will be asked of by them to do it for them. And tis a poor thing that is not worth asking for. When he had thus said, he went back to his place, and the pilgrims went on their way. Then said Mercy, What a sudden blank is here! I made account we had been past all danger, and that we should never see sorrow more. Thy innocence, my sister, said Christiana to Mercy, may excuse thee much, but as for me, fault is so much the greater, for that I saw the danger before I came out of the doors, and yet did not provide for it when provision might have been had. I am therefore much to be blamed. Then said Mercy, How knew you this before you came from home? Pray open to me this riddle. Why, I will tell you. Before I set foot out of doors one night, as I lay in my bed, I had a dream about this for methought I saw two men, as like these as ever any in the world could look, stand at my bed's feet, plotting how they might prevent my salvation. I will tell you their very words. They said, it was when I was in my troubles. 
What shall we do with this woman? For she cries out, waking and sleeping, for forgiveness. If she be suffered to go on as she begins, we shall lose her as we have lost her husband. This you know might have made me take heed, and have provided when provision might have been had. Well, said Mercy, as by this neglect we have been made to behold our own imperfections, so our Lord has taken occasion thereby to make manifest the riches of his grace, for he, as we see, has followed us with unasked kindness, and has delivered us from their hands that were stronger than we, of his near good pleasure. End of Part 2, Chapter 2《The Pilgrim's Progress》Part Two, Chapter Three. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Pilgrim's Progress》by John Bunyan, Part Two, Chapter Three. The Interpreter's House. Thus, now, when they had talked away a little more time, they drew near to a house which stood in the way, which house was built for the relief of pilgrims. As you will find more fully related in the first part of these records of the Pilgrim's Progress, so they drew on towards the house, the house of the interpreter. And when they came to the door, they heard a great talk in the house. Then they gave ear and heard, as they thought, Christiana mentioned by name. For you must know that there went along, even before her, a talk of her and her children's going on pilgrimage. And this was the more pleasing to them, because they had heard she was Christian's wife, that woman who was some time ago so unwilling to hear of going on pilgrimage. Thus, therefore, they stood still, and heard the good people within commending her, who, they little thought, stood at the door. At last Christiana knocked, as she had done at the gate before. Now when she had knocked, there came to the door a young maiden, and opened the door and looked. And behold, two women were there. Then said the maid to them, With whom would you speak in this place? Christiana answered, We understand that this is a place prepared for those that are become pilgrims, and we now at this door are such, wherefore we pray that we may be partakers of that for which we at this time are come. But the day, as thou seest, is very far spent, and we are loth tonight to go any farther. Pray, what may I call your name, that I may tell it to my lord within? My name is Christiana. I was the wife of that pilgrim that some years ago did travel this way, and these be his four children. This young woman is my companion, and is going on pilgrimage too. Then Innocent ran in, for that was her name, and said to those within, Can you think who is at the door? There are Christiana and her children, and her companion, all waiting for entertainment here. Then they leaped for joy, and went and told their master. So he came to the door, and looking upon her, he said, Art thou that Christiana, whom Christian the good man left behind, when he betook himself to a pilgrim's life? I am that woman that was so hard-hearted as to spite my husband's troubles, and then left him to go on his journey alone, and these are his four children. But now also I am come, for I am convinced that no way is right but this. Then is fulfilled that which is written of the man that said to his son, Go, work today in my vineyard. And he said to his father, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. Then said Christiana, So be it. Amen. God made it a true saying upon me, and grant that I may be found at the last of him in peace, without spot and blameless. But why standest thou thus at the door? Come in, thou blessed one. We were talking of thee but now, for tidings have come to us before how thou art become a pilgrim. Come, children, come in, come, maiden, come in. So he had them all into the house. So when they were within, they were bidden to sit down and rest them. The which, when they had done, those that attended upon the pilgrims in the house came into the room to see them. And one smiled, and another smiled and they all smiled for joy that Christiana was become a pilgrim. They also looked upon the boys. They struck them over the faces with the hand, in token of their kind reception of them. They also carried it lovingly to mercy, and bid them all welcome into their master's house.
After a while, because supper was not ready, the interpreter took them into his significant rooms and showed them what Christian, Christiana's husband, had seen some time before. Here, therefore, they saw the man in the cage, the man and his dream, the man that cut his way through his enemies, and the picture of the biggest of them all, together with the rest of those things that were then so profitable to Christian. This done, and after those things had been seen and thought of by Christiana and her company, the interpreter takes them apart again, and has them first into a room where was a man that could look no way but downwards, with a muck-rake in his hand. There stood also one over his head, with a celestial crown in his hand, and proffered to give him that crown for his muck-rake. But the man did neither look up nor regard, but raked to himself the straws, the small sticks, and the dust of the floor. Then said Christiana, I persuade myself that I know somewhat the meaning of this, for this is a figure of a man of this world. Is it not good, sir? Thou hast said the right, said he, and his muckrake doth show his worldly mind. And whereas thou seest him rather give heed to rake up straws and sticks and the dust off the floor, than to do what he says that calls to him from above with the celestial crown in his hand, it is to show that heaven is but a fable to some, and that things here are counted the only things substantial. Now, whereas it was also showed thee that the man could look no way but downwards, it is to let thee know that earthly things, when they are with power upon men's minds, quite carry their hearts away from God. Then said Christiana, O oh, deliver me from this muckrake! That prayer, said the interpreter, has lain by till it is almost rusty. Give me not riches, is scarce the prayer of one of ten thousand. Straws and sticks and dust, with most, are the great things now looked after. With that, Mercy and Christiana wept, and said, It is, alas, too true. When the interpreter had showed them this, he had them into the very best room in the house, a very brave room it was. So he bid them look round about, and see if they could find anything there. Then they looked round and round, for there was nothing to be seen but a very great spider on the wall, and that they overlooked. Then said Mercy, Sir, I see nothing. But Christiana held her peace. But, said the interpreter, Look again. She therefore looked again, and said, Here is not anything but an ugly spider who hangs by her hands upon the wall. Then said he, Is there but one spider in all this spacious room? Then the water stood in Christiana's eyes, for she was a woman quick of mind, and she said, Yes, my lord, there is here more than one, yea, and spiders whose venom is far more destructive than that which is in her. The interpreter then looked pleasantly upon her, and said, Thou hast said the truth. This made Mercy blush, and the boys to cover their faces, for they all began now to understand the riddle. Then said the interpreter again, the spider taketh hold with her hands, as you see, and is in king's palaces. And wherefore is this recorded but to show you that, how full of venom of sin soever you be, yet you may, by the hand of faith, lay hold of and dwell in the best room that belongs to the king's house above. I thought, said Christiana, of something of this, but I could not imagine it all. I thought that we were like spiders, and that we looked like ugly creatures, in what fine rooms soever we were, but that by this spider, this venomous and ill-favoured creature, we were to learn how to act faith that came not into my mind, and yet she has taken hold with her hands, and, as I see, dwelleth in the best room in the house. God has made nothing in vain. Then they seemed all to be glad, but the water stood in their eyes. Yet they looked one upon the other, and also bowed before the interpreter. He had them then into another room, where were a hen and chickens, and bid them observe a while. So one of the chickens went to the trough to drink, and every time she drank she lifted up her head and her eyes toward heaven. See, said he, what this little chick doth, and learn of her to acknowledge whence your mercies come 
by receiving them with looking up. Yet again, said he, observe and look. So they gave heed, and perceived that the hen did walk in a fourfold method towards her chickens. First she had a common call, and that she hath all day long. Secondly, she had a special call, and that she had but sometimes. Thirdly, she had a brooding note, and fourthly, she had an outcry. Now, said he, compare this hen to your king, and these chickens to his obedient ones. For, answerable to her, he himself hath his methods which he walketh in towards his people. By his common call he gives nothing. By his special call he always has something to give. He also has a brooding voice for them that are under his wing, and he hath an outcry to give him the alarm when he seeth the enemy come. I chose, my darlings, to lead you into the room where such things are, because you are women, and they are easy for you. And, sir, said Christiana, pray let us see some more. So he had them into the slaughterhouse, where the butcher was killing a sheep, and, behold, the sheep was quiet, and took her death patiently. Then said the interpreter, You must learn of this sheep to suffer, and to put up with wrongs without murmurings and complaints. Behold how quietly she takes her death, and, without objecting, she suffereth her skin to be pulled over her ears. Your king doth call you his sheep. After this he led them into his garden, where was great variety of flowers, and he said, Do you see all these? So Christiana said, Yes. Then said he again, Behold, the flowers are diverse in stature, in quality, in color, in smell, in virtue, and some are better than others. Also, where the gardener has set them, there they stand, and quarrel not with one another. Again he held them into his field, which he had sowed with wheat and corn. But when they beheld, the tops of all were cut off, and only the straw remained. He said again, This ground was made rich, and was ploughed and sowed, but what shall we do with the crop? Then said Christiana, Burn some, and make muck of the rest. Then said the interpreter again, Fruit, you see, is that thing you look for, and for want of that you send it to the fire, and to be trodden under foot of men. Beware that in this you condemn not yourselves. Then, as they were coming in from abroad, they espied a little robin with a great spider in his mouth. So the interpreter said, Look here. So they looked, and mercy wondered. But Christiana said, What a disparagement is it to such a pretty little bird as the robin redbreast is, he being also a bird above many, that loveth to maintain a kind of sociableness with man, I had thought they had lived upon crumbs of bread, or upon other such harmless matter. I like him worse than I did. The interpreter then replied, This robin is an emblem very apt to set forth some people by. For to sight they are as this robin, pretty of note, color, and conduct. They seem also to have a very great love for those that are sincere followers of Christ, and above all other to desire to associate with them, and to be in their company as if they could live upon the good man's crumbs. They pretend also that therefore it is that they frequent the house of the godly and the appointments of the Lord. But when they are by themselves, as the robin, they can catch and gobble up spiders, they can change their diet, drink wickedness, and swallow down sin like water. So when they were come again into the house, because supper as yet was not ready, Christiana again desired that the interpreter would either show or tell of some other things that were profitable. Then the interpreter began, and said, The fatter the sow is, the more she desires the mire. The fatter the ox is, the more thoughtlessly he goes to the slaughter. And the more healthy the lusty man is, the more prone he is unto evil. There is a desire in women to go neat and fine, and it is a comely thing to be adorned with that which in God's sight is of great price. Tis easier watching a night or two than to sit up a whole year together. So tis easier for one to begin to profess well than to hold out as he should to the end. Every shipmaster 
when in a storm, will willingly cast that overboard which is of the smallest value in the vessel. But who will throw the best out first? None but he that feareth not God. One leak will sink a ship, and one sin will destroy a sinner. He that forgets his friend is ungrateful unto him, but he that forgets his Savior is unmerciful to himself. He that lives in sin and looks for happiness hereafter is like him that soweth weeds, and thinks to fill his barn with wheat and barley. If a man would live well, let him bring before him his last day, and make it always his company keeper. Whispering and change of thoughts prove that sin is in the world. If the world, which God sets light by, is counted a thing of that worth with men, what is heaven that God commendeth? If the life that is attended with so many troubles is so loath to be let go by us, what is the life above? Everybody will cry up the goodness of men, but who is there that is, as he should be, affected with the goodness of God? When the interpreter had done, he takes them out into the garden again, and had them to a tree, whose inside was all rotten and gone, and yet it grew and had leaves. Then said Mercy, What means this? This tree, said he, whose outside is fair, and whose inside is rotten is that to which many may be compared that are in the garden of God, who with their mouths speak high in behalf of God, but indeed will do nothing for him, whose leaves are fair, but their heart good for nothing but to be tinder for the devil's tinderbox. Now supper was ready, the table spread, and all things set on the board. So they sat down and did eat when one had given thanks. And the interpreter did usually entertain those that lodged with him with music at meals. So the minstrels played. There was also one that did sing, and a very fine voice he had. His song was this, The Lord is only my support, and he that doth me feed. How can I then want anything whereof I stand in need? When the song and music were ended, the interpreter asked Christian what it was that first did move her to betake herself to a pilgrim's life. Christiana answered, First, the loss of my husband came into my mind, at which I was heartily grieved, but all that was but natural affection. Then after that came the troubles and pilgrimages of my husband into my mind, and also how unkindly I had behaved to him as to that. So guilt took hold of my mind, and would have drawn me into the pond, to drown myself, but that, just at the right time, I had a dream of the well-being of my husband, and a letter sent by the king of that country, where my husband dwells, to come to him. The dream and the letter together so wrought upon my mind that they forced me to this way. But met you with no opposition afore you set out of doors? Yes, a neighbor of mine, one Mrs. Timorous. She was akin to him that would have persuaded my husband to go back for fear of the lions. She ought to be fooled me, for as she called it, my intended desperate adventure, she also urged what she could to dishearten me from it, the hardship and troubles that my husband met with in the way, but all this I got over pretty well, but a dream that I had of two ill-looked ones, that I thought did plot how to make me fail in my journey, that hath troubled me much, yea, it still runs in my mind, and makes me afraid of every one that I meet, lest they should meet me to do me a mischief, and to turn me out of my way, yea, I may tell my lord, though I would not have everybody know it that between this and the gate by which we got into the way, we were both so sorely attacked that we were made to cry out murder, and the two that made this attack upon us were like the two that I saw in my dream. Then said the interpreter, Thy beginning is good, thy latter end shall greatly increase. So he addressed himself to mercy, and said unto her, And what moved thee to come hither, sweetheart? Then mercy blushed and trembled, and for a while continued silent. Then said he, Be not afraid, only believe, and speak thy mind. So she began, and said, Truly, sir, my lack of knowledge is that which makes me wish to be in silence, and that also fills me with fears of coming short at last. I cannot tell of visions and dreams, as my friend Christiana can, nor know I what it is to mourn for my refusing the advice of those that were good relations. What was it then, dear heart, that hath prevailed thee to do as thou hast done? Why, when our friend here was packing up to be gone from our town, I and another went accidentally to see her. So we knocked at the door and we went in. When we were within, 
and seeing what she was doing, we asked her what was her meaning. She said she was sent for to go with her husband, and then she up and told us how she had seen him in a dream, dwelling in a wonderful place among immortals, wearing a crown, playing upon a harp, eating and drinking at his prince's table, and singing praises to him for bringing him thither, and so on. Now, methought while she was telling these things unto us, my heart burned within me, and I said in my heart, If this be true, I will leave my father and my mother and the land of my birth, and will, if I may, go along with Christiana. So I asked her further of the truth of these things, and if she would let me go with her, for I saw now that there was no dwelling, but with the danger of ruin any longer in our town. But yet I came away with a heavy heart, not for that I was unwilling to come away, but for that so many of my relations were left behind. And I am come with the desire of my heart, and will go, if I may, with Christiana, unto her husband and his king. Thy setting out is good, for thou hast given credit to the truth. Thou art a Ruth, who did, for the love she bare to Naomi, and to the Lord her God, leave father and mother and the land of her birth, to come out and go with a people that she knew not heretofore. The Lord bless thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Now supper was ended, and preparation was made for bed. The women were laid singly alone, and the boys by themselves. Now, when Mercy was in bed, she could not sleep for joy. For that now her doubts of missing at last were removed farther from her than ever they were before. So she lay blessing and praising God, who had such favor for her. In the morning they arose with the sun, and prepared themselves for their departure. But the interpreter would have them tarry a while. For, said he, you must orderly go from hence. Then said he to the maid that first opened to them, Take them, and have them into the garden, to the bath, and there wash them, and make them clean from the soil which they have gathered by traveling. Then Innocent the maid took them, and had them into the garden, and brought them to the bath. So she told them they must wash and be clean, for so her master would have the women to do that called at his house as they were going on pilgrimage. Then they went in and washed, yea, they and the boys and all and they came out of the bath not only sweet and clean, but also much enlivened and strengthened in their joints. So when they came in, they looked fairer a deal than when they went out to the washing. When they were returned out of the garden from the bath, the interpreter took them, and looked upon them, and said unto them, Fair as the moon. Then he called for a seal, wherewith they used to be sealed that were washed in this bath. So the seal was brought, and he set his mark upon them, that they might be known in the places whither they were yet to go, and the mark was set between their eyes. This seal added greatly to their beauty, for it was an ornament to their faces. It also added to their glory, and made their countenances more like those of angels. Then said the interpreter again to the maid that waited upon these women, Go into the vestry, and fetch out garments for these people. So she went, and fetched out white raiment, and laid it down before him. So he commanded them to put it on. It was fine linen, white and clean. When the women were thus adorned, they seemed to be afraid one of the other, for that they could not see that glory each one had in herself, which they could see in each other. Now, therefore, they began to esteem each other better than themselves, for— You are fairer than I am said one, and, You are more beautiful than I am, said another. The children also stood amazed to see into what fashion they were brought. The interpreter then called for a manservant of his, one great heart, and bid him take sword and helmet and shield, and, Take these my daughters, said he, and conduct them to the house called Beautiful, at which place they will rest next. So he took his weapons and went before them, and the interpreter said, Godspeed. Those also that belonged to the family sent them away with many a good wish. So they went on their way and sang. This place hath been our second stage. Here we have heard and seen. 
those good things that from age to age to others hid have been. The dunghill raker, spider, hen, the chicken too, to me, have taught a lesson. Let me then conformed to it be. The butcher garden and the field, the robin and his bait, also the rotten tree, doth yield me argument of weight, to move me for to watch and pray, to strive to be sincere, to take my cross up day by day, and serve the Lord with fear. End of Part 2, Chapter 3《The Pilgrim's Progress》Part 2 Chapter 4 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan Part 2 Chapter 4 The Cross and the Consequences Now I saw in my dream that they went on, and great heart before them. So they went, and came to a place where Christian's burden fell off his back, and tumbled into a sepulchre. Here, then, they made a pause, and here also they blessed God. Now, said Christiana, comes to my mind what was said to us at the gate, to wit, that we should have pardon by word and deed, by word, that is, by the promise, by deed, that is, in the way it was obtained. What the promise is, of that I know something, but what it is to have pardon by deed, or in the way that it was obtained, Mr. Greatheart, I suppose you know. Wherefore, if you please, let us hear you speak thereof. Pardon by the deed done is pardon obtained by some one for another that hath need thereof, not by the person pardoned, but in the way, saith another, in which I have obtained it. So then, to speak to the question at large, the pardon that you and Mercy and these boys have obtained was obtained by another, to wit, by him that let you in at the gate and he hath obtained it in this double way, he has shown righteousness to cover you, and spilt his blood to wash you in. This is brave. Now I see that there was something to be learnt by our being pardoned by word and deed. Good mercy, let us labour to keep this in mind, and my children, do you remember it also? But, sir, was not this it that made my good Christian's burdens fall from off his shoulders, and that made him give three leaps for joy? Yes, it was the belief of this that cut off those strings that could not be cut by other means, and it was to give him proof of the virtue of this that he was suffered to carry his burden to the cross. I thought so, for though my heart was lightsome and joyous before, yet it is ten times more lightsome and joyous now, and I am persuaded by what I have felt, though I have felt but little as yet, that if the most burdened man in the world was here, and did see and believe as I now do, it would make his heart merry and blithe. There is not only comfort and the ease of a burden brought to us by the sight and consideration of these, but an endeared love born in us by it, for who can, if he doth but once think that pardon comes, not only by promise, but thus, but be affected with the way and means of his redemption, and so love the man that hath wrought it for him? True. Methinks it makes my heart bleed, to think that he should bleed for me. O oh, thou loving one, O oh, thou blessed one, thou deservest to have me, thou hast bought me, thou deservest to have me all, thou hast paid for me ten thousand times more than I am worth. No marvel that this made the water stand in my husband's eyes, and that it made him trudge so nimbly on. I am persuaded he wished me with him, but vile wretch that I was, I let him come all alone. O oh, mercy! that thy father and mother were here, yea, and Mrs. Timorous also. Nay, I wish now with all my heart that here was Madame Wanton too. Surely, surely their hearts would be affected, nor could the fear of the one, nor the powerful passions of the other, prevail with them to go home again, and refuse to become good pilgrims. You speak now in the warmth of your affections. Will it, think you, be always thus with you? Besides, this is not given to every one nor to every one that did see your Jesus bleed. There were that stood by, and that saw the blood run from his heart to the ground, and yet were so far off this, that instead of lamenting, they laughed at him, and instead of becoming his disciples, did harden their hearts against him. So that all that you have, my daughters, you have by a peculiar feeling, made by a thinking upon what I have spoken to you. This you have, therefore, by a special grace. 
Now I saw still in my dream that they went on till they were come to a place that simple and sloth and presumption lay and slept in, when Christian went by on pilgrimage. And, behold, they were hanged up in irons a little way off on the other side. Then said Mercy to him that was their guide and conductor, What are those three men, and for what are they hanged there? These three men were men of very bad qualities. They had no mind to be pilgrims themselves, and whomsoever they could they hindered. They were for sloth and folly themselves, and whomsoever they could persuade with, they made so too, and withal taught them to presume that they should do well at last. They were asleep when Christian went by, and now you go by, they are hanged. But could they persuade any to be of their opinion? Yes, they turned several out of the way. There was slow pace that they persuaded to do as they. They also pervaded with one short wind, with one no heart, with one linger after lust, and with one sleepy head, and with a young woman, her name was dull, to turn out of the way and become as they. Besides, they brought up an ill report of your Lord, persuading others that he was a hard taskmaster. They also brought up an evil report of the good land, saying it was not half so good as some pretended it was. They also began to speak falsely about his servants, and to count the very best of them meddlesome, troublesome busybodies. Further, they would call the bread of God husks, the comforts of his children fancies, the travel labour of pilgrims things to no purpose. Nay, said Christiana, if they were such, they never shall be bewailed by me. They have but what they deserve, and I think it is well that they hang so near the highway, that others may see and take warning. But had it not been well if their crimes had been engraven on some plate of iron or brass, and left here where they did their mischiefs, for a caution to other bad men? So it is, as you well may perceive, if you will go a little to the wall. No, no, let them hang, and their names rot, and their crimes live for ever against them. I think it a high favour that they were hanged before we came hither, who knows, else what they might have done to such poor women as we are. Then she turned it into a song, saying, Now then you three hang there, and be a sign to all that shall against the truth combine. And let him that comes after fear this end, if unto pilgrims he is not a friend. And thou, my soul, of all such men, beware that unto holiness opposers are. Thus they went on till they came at the foot of the hill Difficulty, where again their good friend Mr. Greatheart took an occasion to tell them of what happened there when Christian himself went by. So he had them first to the spring. Lo, saith he, this is the spring that Christian drank of before he went up this hill and then it was clear and good. But now it is dirty with the feet of some that are not desirous that pilgrims here should quench their thirst. Thereat Mercy said, And why are they so envious, I wonder? But said their guide, It will do if taken up and put into a vessel that is sweet and good, for then the dirt will sink to the bottom, and the water come out by itself more clear. Thus, therefore, Christiana and her companions were compelled to do. They took it up, and put it into an earthen pot, and so let it stand till the dirt was gone to the bottom, and then they drank thereof. Next he showed them the two byways that were at the foot of the hill, where formality and hypocrisy lost themselves, and said he, These are dangerous paths. Two were here cast away when Christian came by, and although, as you see, these ways are since stopped up with chains, posts, and a ditch, yet there are that will choose to adventure here, rather than take the pains to go up this hill. The way of transgressors is hard. It is a wonder that they can get into those ways without danger of breaking their necks. They will venture, yea, if at any time any of the king's servants doth happen to see them, and doth call unto them, and tell them that they are in the wrong ways, and do bid them beware the danger, then they will railingly return them answer, and say, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the king, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth. 
Nay, if you look a little farther, you shall see that these ways are warned against enough, not only by these posts and ditch and chain, but also by being hedged up, yet they will choose to go there. They are idle, they love not to take pains, uphill way is unpleasant to them, so it is fulfilled unto them as it is written, the way of the slothful man is a hedge of thorns, yea, they will rather choose to walk upon a snare than go up this hill and the rest of this way to the city. Then they set forward, and began to go up the hill, and up the hill they went. But before they got to the top, Christiana began to pant, and said, I dare say this is a breathing hill. No marvel if they that love their ease more than their souls choose to themselves a smoother way. Then said Mercy, I must sit down. Also the least of the children began to cry. Come, come, said Great Heart. Sit not down here, for a little above is the prince's arbor. Then took he the little boy by the hand, and led him up there too. When they were come to the arbor, they were very willing to sit down, for they were all in a pelting heat. Then said Mercy, How sweet is rest to them, that labor, and how good is the prince of pilgrims to provide such resting places for them. Of this arbor I have heard much, but I never saw it before. But here let us beware of sleeping, for, as I have heard, for that cost poor Christian dear. Then said Greatheart to the little ones, Come, my pretty boys, how do you do? What think you now of going on pilgrimage? Sir, said the least, I was almost beat out of heart, but I thank you for lending me a hand at my need. And I remember now what my mother has told me, namely, that the way to heaven is as up a ladder, and the way to hell is as down a hill. But I rather go up a ladder to life than the hill to death. Then said Mercy, But the proverb is, to go down the hill is easy. But James said, for that was his name, The day is coming when, in my opinion, going down hill will be the hardest of all. That's a good boy, said his master. Thou hast given her a right answer. Then Mercy smiled, but the little boy did blush. Come, said Christiana. Will you eat a bit, a little to sweeten your mouths, while you sit here to rest your legs? For I have here a piece of pomegranate, which Mr. Interpreter put in my hand, just when I came out of his doors. He gave me also a piece of a honeycomb, and a little bottle of spirits. I thought he gave you something, said Mercy because he called you aside. Yes, so he did, said the other. But, Mercy, it shall still be as I said it should, when at first we came from home. Thou shalt be a sharer in all the good that I have, because thou so willingly didst become my companion. Then she gave to them, and they did eat, both Mercy and the boys, and said Christiana to Mr. Greatheart, Sir, will you do as we, and take some refreshment? But he answered, You are going on pilgrimage, and presently I shall return. Much good may have do to you. At home I eat the same every day. Now, when they had eaten and drunk, and had chatted a little longer, their guide said to them, The day wears away. If you think good, let us prepare to be going. So they got up to go, and the little boys went before. But Christiana forgot to take her bottle of spirits with her, so she sent her little boy back to fetch it. Then said Mercy, I think this is a losing place. Here Christian lost his roll, and here Christiana left her bottle behind her. Sir, what is the cause of this? So their guide made answer, and said, The cause is sleep or forgetfulness. Some sleep when they should keep awake, and some forget when they should remember. And this is the very cause why often at the resting places some pilgrims in some things come off losers. Pilgrims should watch and remember what they have already received under their greatest enjoyments. But for want of doing so, oft times their rejoicing ends in tears and their sunshine in a cloud. Witness the story of Christian at this place. When they were come to the place where mistrust and timorous met Christian to persuade him to go back for fear of the lions, they perceived, as it were, a stage, 
and before it, towards the road, a broad plate, with a copy of verses written thereon, and underneath the reason of the raising up of that stage in that place rendered. The verses were these. Let him that sees this stage take heed unto his heart and tongue, lest, if he do not, hear he speed as some have long agone. This stage was built to punish such upon who, through timorousness or mistrust, shall be afraid to go farther on pilgrimage. Also, on this stage, both mistrust and timorous were burned through the tongue with a hot iron, for endeavoring to hinder Christian in his journey. Then said Mercy, This is much like the saying of the Beloved, What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. So they went on, till they came within sight of the lions. Now Mr. Greatheart was a strong man, so he was not afraid of a lion. But yet, when they were come up to the place where the lions were, the boys that went before were glad to cringe behind, for they were afraid of the lions, so they stepped back and went behind. At this their guide smiled and said, How now, my boys! Do you love to go before when no danger doth approach, and love to come behind so soon as the lions appear? Now, as they went up, Mr. Greatheart drew his sword, with intent to make a way for the pilgrims in spite of the lions. Then there appeared one that, it seems, had taken upon him to back the lions, and he said to the pilgrim's guide, What is the cause of you coming hither? Now the name of that man was Grim, or Bloody Man, because of his slaying of pilgrims, and he was of the race of the giants. Then said the pilgrim's guide, These women and children are going on pilgrimage, and this is the way they must go, and go it they shall, in spite of thee and the lions. This is not thy way, neither shall they go therein. I am come forth to withstand them, and to that end will back the lions. Now, to say truth, by reason of the fierceness of the lions, and of the grim carriage of him that did back them, this way had of late lain much unoccupied, and was almost all grown over with grass. Then said Christiana, Though the highways had been unoccupied heretofore, and though the travellers had been made in times past to walk through by-paths, it must not be so now I am risen. Now I am risen a mother in Israel. Then he swore by the lions, But it should, and therefore bid them turn aside, for they should not passage there. But Greatheart their guide made first his approach unto Grim, and laid so heavily at him with his sword, that he forced him to a retreat. Then said he that attempted to back the lions, Will you slay me upon mine own ground? It is the king's highway that we are in, and in his way it is that thou hast placed thy lions. But these women, and these children, though weak, shall hold on their way in spite of thy lions. And with that he gave him again a downright blow, and brought him upon his knees. With this blow he also broke his helmet, and with the next he cut off an arm. Then did the giant roar so hideously that his voice frighted the women and yet they were glad to see him lie sprawling upon the ground. Now the lions were chained, and so of themselves could do nothing. Wherefore, when old Grim, that intended to back them, was dead, Mr. Greatheart said to the pilgrims, Come now, and follow me, and no hurt shall happen to you from the lions. They therefore went on, but the women trembled as they passed by them. The boys also looked as if they would die but they all got by without further hurt. End of Part 2, Chapter 4《The Pilgrim's Progress, Part 2, Chapter 5 》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, Part 2, Chapter 5 》The Palace Beautiful now, then, they were within sight of the porter's lodge, and they soon came up unto it. But they made the more haste after this to go thither, because it is dangerous travelling there in the night. So when they were come to the gate, the guide knocked, and the porter cried, 
Who is there? But as soon as the guide had said, It is I, he knew his voice and came down, for the guide had oft before that come thither as a conductor of pilgrims. When he was come down he opened the gate, and seeing the guide stand just before it, for he saw not the women, for they were behind him, he said unto him, How now, Mr. Greatheart, what is your business here so late to-night? I have brought, said he, some pilgrims hither, where, by my lord's commandment, they must lodge. I had been here some time ago, had I not been opposed by the giant that did use to back the lions. But I, after a long and tedious combat with him, have cut him off, and have brought the pilgrims hither in safety. Will you not go in and stay till morning? No, I will return to my lord to-night. Oh, sir, I know not how to be willing you should leave us in our pilgrimage. You have been so faithful and so loving to us. You have fought so stoutly for us. You have been so hearty in counselling of us, that I shall never forget your favour towards us. Then said Mercy, Oh, that we might have thy company to our journey's end. How can such poor women as we hold out in a way so full of troubles as this way is, without a friend and defender? Then said James, the youngest of the boys, Pray, sir, be persuaded to go with us and help us, because we are so weak, and the way so dangerous as it is. I am at my lord's commandment. If he shall allot me to be your guide quite through, I will willingly wait upon you. But here you failed at first, for when he bid me come thus far with you, then you should have begged me of him to have gone quite through with you, and he would have granted your request. However, at present I must withdraw, and so, good Christiana, mercy, and my brave children, adieu. Then the porter, Mr. Watchful, asked Christiana of her country and of her kindred, and she said, I come from the city of destruction. I am a widow woman, and my husband is dead. His name was Christian, the pilgrim. How? said the porter. Was he your husband? Yes, said she. And these are his children, and this, pointing to mercy, is one of my townswomen. Then the porter rang his bell, as at such times he was wont, and there came to the door one of the maids, whose name was Humble Mind, and to her the porter said, Go, tell it within that Christiana, the wife of Christian, and her children, are come hither on pilgrimage. She went in, therefore, and told it. But, oh, what a noise for gladness was there within when the maid did but drop that word out of her mouth. So they came with haste to the porter, for Christiana stood still at the door. Then some of those within said unto her, Come in, Christiana, come in, thou wife of that good man. Come in, thou blessed woman, come in, with all that are with thee. So she went in, and they followed her that were her children and her companions. Now when they were gone in, they were had into a very large room, where they were bidden to sit down. So they sat down, and the chief of the house were called to see and welcome the guests. Then they came in, and understanding who they were, did salute each other with a kiss, and said, Welcome, ye that bear the grace of God. Welcome to us, your friends. Now, because it was somewhat late, and because the pilgrims were weary with their journey, and also made faint with the sight of the fight and of the terrible lions, Therefore they desired as soon as might be to prepare to go to rest. Nay, said those of the family, refresh yourselves first with a morsel of meat. For they had prepared for them a lamb with the accustomed sauce belonging thereto, for the porter had heard before of their coming, and had told it to them within. So when they had supped and ended their prayer with a psalm, they desired they might go to rest. But let us, said Christiana, if we may be so bold as to choose, be in that chamber that was my husband's when he was here. So they had them up thither, and they lay all in a room. When they were at rest, Christiana and Mercy entered into discourse about things that were convenient. Little did I think once, when my husband went on pilgrimage, that I should ever have followed. And you as little thought of lying in his bed, and in his chamber to rest, as you do now. And much less did I ever think of seeing his face with comfort, and of worshipping the Lord the King with him, and yet now I believe I shall. Hark! Don't you hear a noise? 
Yes, it is, as I believe, a noise of music, but joy that we are here. Wonderful! Music in the house, music in the heart, and music also in heaven, for joy that we are here. Thus they talked a while, and then betook themselves to sleep. So in the morning, when they were awake, Christiana said to Mercy, What was the matter, that you did laugh in your sleep tonight? I suppose you were in a dream. So I was, and a sweet dream it was. But are you sure I laughed? Yes, you laughed heartily. But prithee, Mercy, tell me thy dream. I was dreaming that I sat all alone in a solitary place, and was bemoaning of the hardness of my heart. Now I had not sat there long, but methought many were gathered about me to see me, and to hear what it was that I said. So they hearkened, and I went on bemoaning the hardness of my heart. At this some of them laughed at me, some called me fool, and some thrust me about. With that methought I looked up, and saw one coming with wings towards me. So he came directly to me and said, Mercy! What aileth thee? Now, when he had heard me make my complaint, he said, Peace be to thee. He also wiped mine eyes with his handkerchief, and clad me in silver and gold. He put a chain about my neck, and earrings in mine ears, and a beautiful crown on my head. Then he took me by the hand and said, Mercy, come after me. So he went up, and I followed, till we came to a golden gate. Then he knocked. And when they within opened, the man went in, and I followed him up to a throne upon which one sat, and he said to me, Welcome, daughter. The place looked bright and twinkling, like the stars, or rather, like the sun, and I thought I saw your husband there. So I awoke from my dream. But did I laugh? Laugh, ay, and well you might, to see yourself so well. For you must give me leave to tell you that I believe it was a good dream, and that as you have begun to find the first part true, so you shall find the second at last. God speaks once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed. We need not, when a bed, to lie awake to talk with God. He can visit us while we sleep, and cause us then to hear his voice. Our heart oftentimes wakes when we sleep, and God can speak to that, either by words, by proverbs, or by signs and similitudes, as well as if one was awake. Well, I am glad of my dream, for I hope ere long to see it fulfilled, to the making of me laugh again. I think it is now high time to rise, and to know what we must do. Pray, if they invite us to stay a while, let us willingly accept of the proffer. I am the willinger to stay here, to grow better acquainted with these maids. Methinks prudence, piety, and charity have very lovely and sober countenances. We shall see what they will do. So when they were up and ready, they came down, and they asked to one another of their rest, and if it was comfortable or not. Very good, said Mercy. It was one of the best night's lodging that ever I had in my life. If you will be persuaded... To stay here a while, you shall have what the house will afford. Aye, and that with a very good will, said Charity. So they consented, and stayed there about a month or above, and became very profitable one to another. Now, by that these pilgrims had been at this place a week, Mercy had a visitor that pretended some good will unto her, and his name was Mr. Brisk a man of some breeding, and that pretended to religion, but a man that stuck very close to the world. So he came once or twice or more to Mercy, and offered love unto her. Now Mercy was a fair countenance, and therefore the more alluring. Her mind also was to be always busying of herself in doing, for when she had nothing to do for herself, she would be making of hose and garments for others, and would bestow them upon them that had need. And Mr. Brisk, not knowing where or how she disposed of what she made, seemed to be greatly taken, for that he found her never idle. I will warrant her a good housewife, quoth he to himself. Mercy then told the matter to the maidens that were of the house, and inquired of them concerning him, for they did know him better than she. So they told her that he was a very busy young man, 
and one who pretended to serve the Lord, but was, as they feared, a stranger to the power of that which is good. Nay, then, said Mercy, I will look no more on him, for I purpose never to have a clog to my soul. Prudence then replied that, There needed no great matter of discouragement to be given to him. Her continuing so as she had begun to do for the poor would quickly cool his courage. So the next time he comes, he finds her at her old work, a-making things for the poor. Then said he, What? Always at it? Yes, said she, either for myself or for others. And what canst thou earn a day? Quoth he. I do these things, said she, that I may be rich in good works, laying up in store for myself a good foundation against the time to come, that I may lay hold on eternal life. Why, prithee, what does a thou with them? said he. Clothe the naked, said she. With that his countenance fell. So he forbore to come at her again, and when he was asked the reason why, he said that Mercy was a pretty lass, but troubled with too much working for others. When he had left her, Prudence said, Did I not tell thee that Mr. Brisk would soon forsake thee? Ye, who will raise up an ill report of thee, for notwithstanding his pretense to serve bad, and his seeming love to Mercy, Yet mercy and he are of tempers so different that I believe they will never come together. I might have had husbands afore now, though I spake not of it to any. But they were such as did not like my ways, though never did any of them find fault with my person, so they and I could not agree. Mercy in our days is little set by, any further than to its name, the practice which is set forth by their works, there are but few that can abide. Well, said Mercy, if nobody will have me, I will die a maid, or my works shall be to me as a husband, for I cannot change my nature, and to have one that lies cross to me in this, that I purpose never to admit of as long as I live. I had a sister named Bountiful, that was married to one of these selfish people, but he and she could never agree, but... Because my sister was resolved to do as she had begun, that is, to show kindness to the poor, therefore her husband first cried her down in public, and then turned her out of his doors. And yet he was a church member, I warrant you? Yes, such a one as he was, and of such as he the world is now full, but I am for none of them at all. Now Matthew, the eldest son of Christiana, fell sick and his sickness was sore upon him, for he was much pained in his bowels, so that he was with it at times pulled, as it were, both ends together. There dwelt also not far from thence one Mr. Skill, an ancient and well-approved physician. So Christiana desired it, and they sent for him, and he came. When he was entered the room, and had a little observed the boy, he concluded that he was sick with the gripes. Then he said to his mother, What diet has Matthew of late fed upon? Diet, said Christiana. Nothing but that which is wholesome. The physician answered, This boy hath been tampering with something that lies in his stomach, undigested, and that will not away without means. And I tell you, he must be perched, or else he will die. Then said Samuel, Mother, what was that which my brother did gather up and eat, so soon after we had come from the gate that is at the head of this way? You know that there was an orchard on the left hand, on the other side of the wall, and some of the trees hung over the wall, and my brother did pull down the branches and did eat. True, my child, said Christiana. He did take thereof and did eat, not a boy as he was. I did chide him, and yet he would eat thereof. I knew he had eaten something that was not wholesome food, and that food, to wit, that fruit, is even the most hurtful of all. It is the fruit of Beelzebub's orchard. I do marvel that none did warn you of it. Many have died thereof. Then Christiana began to cry, and she said, O oh, naughty boy, and O oh, careless mother, what shall I do for my son? Come, do not be too much dejected. The boy may do well again, but he must purge and vomit. Pray, sir, try the utmost of your skill with him, whatever it costs. Nay, I hope I shall be reasonable. 
So he made him a purge, but it was too weak. It was said it was made of the blood of a goat, the 